just a bloke in a bar. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Bloke in a Bar. Very special episode because it is the yearly transfer episode. That is right. We go over each team's transfers in and out. Now, it's different to squad review and preview. So we're not going to go over the whole squad and go strengths, weaknesses like we usually do. We do that closer to the season. This will be focused on basically big recruits. Who can they bring in? Who can they, you know, where, where do they really need to bolster? Who do they keep that was really good? Who could they maybe, who's on massive coin that they could maybe look to move on? All that stuff. So it is a 2023 slash 24 transfer show brought to you by Bloke Beer. As summer is here. I mean, it is here. You can smell it. You can taste it. I could smell it in winter. <laughs> you could smell it any time, huh? <laughs> year, It's summer all year round for me. Nothing's getting past that. Oh, I years. could almost smell winter already. <laughs> uh, <laughs> brought to you by Bloke Beer. Get in your local. Grab a case of the beer of Australian sport. It's a beer for blokes that turn up for your family, mates, and good times. Also, do not forget DMP shirts. They're back on sale on Thursday. Once this batch is gone, there's no more restocking. We restocked them this time because they sold out in less than 24 hours. So we thought that's a bit unfair to the community. So we thought, you know what? Let's get behind. Let's get speaking to the warehouse. Let's get the, the numbers back up and uh, get them get some blanks printed. Get them back up Thursday 6 p.m. So it's Thursday 6 p.m. Be there. Set your alarms. Once these gone, you will not get this design ever again. And already, if you go and look at the post last night that I made about uh, the fact that the shirts will be coming back. There's multiple comments saying best shirts that I've got uh, from blokes. So make sure to be there Thursday, 6 p.m. Guru, mate, how you going, brother? Going well, mate. I want to give a little shout out to someone I saw on the weekend. Uh, you know, I'm a super coach guy. Mm. I saw a uh, super coach league out there that the guy that lost was forced to run a car wash. Oh, I saw that. He did in his bloke budgie. So mm. shout out to them. Love to see it. Uh, he faced the music. That's what he, he did. He certainly did. He faced the friggin' music. So we respect that. We respect that. Hammy, how are we? Good to be here, boys. Uh, what a week. I did see that clip as well. Mm. Uh, good to see the budgies out there in full swing. Yep. Took my black and white ones out for a little uh, spin yesterday as well. So uh, really loving the budgie work. Getting into my budgie work now. It's budgie season. Oh, it's budgie so, season. Yeah. It's budgie season. Yeah. Have you got a mic, Matty? Yeah. How's your weekend, mate? That's funny you say that. I actually debuted my bloke budgies yesterday at, at Red Leaf as well. So yeah, they are they're really good. Really good. <laughs> well, there you go. There you bloody go, hey? We produce good products and you boys use them. Yep. That's, that's fucking good stuff. Great stuff. Great way to start. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, let's get into... I mean, this is... Well, the segment's not brought to you by Sports Bet because we don't, we're don't. we sad. But Alex Volkanovsky, he's a sports bet man. He is a sports bet man through and through. Let's talk about it. Yep. Alex Volkanovsky goes down to Islam Makashev. First round, essentially KO by a head kick, but ground and pound after the head kick. I mean, this is what you risk. This is what he risked. Mm. And I think it's like a lot of people, uh, not a lot of people, I saw some people kind of coming out and saying, oh, you know, where's all the Aussies talking crap now and that? It's like, uh, I don't think anyone was talking crap and I don't think anyone was sitting there going, he's a favourite to win. The whole chat before it was, this is insane. If he gets it done, he is one of the greatest of all time. And that's like, that. that look, it sucks for... If you're just a casual fan looking in and you're just watching Alex Volkanovsky's career, the safe option would have been, don't do it, mate. Keep, you know, you're already considered the greatest 145er all time. You know, you're in this crazy space in your life where everyone loves you. You know, you're just dominating your division. Some say you won the last fight, but at the end of the day, you're in just such a good spot. So just keep it. Just keep that spot. Keep, keep comfortable. Alex Volkanovsky, he risked it. It didn't work out. But that's what makes him great is the fact that he is willing to put it all on the line, all on the line against arguably the pound for pound best fighter in the comp, uh, in the UFC. Islam Makhachev, if he's not pound for pound number one, he's definitely in the top five. He's an absolute beast. So massive props to Volks, um, you know, for getting in there. And, you know, as I said, the smart, safe career decision would have been like 12 days notice, 11 days notice, way too soon dropping too much weight, but this is like why he's great because he dares to be great. Uh, and I, I'm sure you boys probably watched it too, the, the post um, fight press conference. Mm. You know, ironically, you, you, you have to wonder that post match, post fight press conference, that's gonna have arguably as much positive impact, especially on men in this country, <clears throat> as his uh, UFC reign has, you know, like had on men in this country because 
to see a guy as tough as he has, like the pinnacle of toughness, literally one of the toughest men in the world, most dangerous men in the world, openly speak about sometimes struggling, uh, well, for, for the first time struggling with his mental health. Geez, that's got to give a lot of people that are wondering like, why am I struggling or what's going on here to see him? If he's is struggling as well, I'm not alone in this. I can, you know, push through it. So all in all, very obviously Volks is going to be disappointed, but geez, he did not let the nation down. You mentioned casual fan there, and I am the mascot for casual fans of UFC. Mm. Uh, I don't, you know, I very much so like the footy fan that thinks everyone's offside. I don't really know what I'm watching, but mm. <laughs> the fact that he just got in there on 12 days' notice, mm. like that, yeah. I, I think it was your post you put up, what did he lose, 11 kilos? 12 it? kilos in 11 days. Oh, that's unbelievable. Craziness. It's it's wild, and, you know, our, our slogan here is turn up. Mm. My God. Oh, mate. <laughs> Bloody oath, he turns up. Yeah. He personifies there, and also, look – the armchair critics, and now look, I'm sure there were some people saying before the fight, this was stupid, don't do it. There definitely were was people saying that. But the people coming out after the fight going, oh, it was stupid, it was this, it was that. Like, you're only saying that because he failed. Like, he dared to be great. Yes, it was a risk. Yes, he understood cutting all that weight in that period of time. It's not the best preparation. But he still, this is what makes him great. You, ca you can't... You can't throw the baby out with a barbed water. You know, the reason why he was such a dominant, he is such a dominant champion in 145 is because he takes risk. It's because he turns up constantly. He's always in the gym. Um, and so he made the decision. There's no excuses. A lot of people will, uh, like, I'd, I'm not of the mind of, oh, Islam Makachev, it was only, he only won because Vox was on 11 days notice. Yes, it is a fact that it wasn't the best preparation, but it's like in footy. If you have a, a fucked shoulder, a fucked ankle, once you cross that striped line, there is no excuse. And that's also what Volk said after the fight. He said, I made the decision. So that 11, 12 days is almost irrelevant. Hammy, what do you think of the fight? Yeah, he's mate? a gun. I love Volk. I'm standing with Volk today. Got my Volk shirt on. Stand with, we stand with Volk, baby. Great, great friend of sports. I'll tell you what, we've actually, we've actually done a fair bit of work with Volk over the last couple of years. Done a bit of content with him as well. And he's just one of the nicest, most yeah. down-to-earth blokes. And, like, you know, you see a lot of kind of UFC fighters and <laughs> they've got a bit of ego, uh, look like they'd be very tough to have a beer with. Absolutely not the case with Volk. We pitched one of the stupidest ideas to him ever a year or two ago. Mm. Uh, we did a video called Volk v Volk, where it was basically a promo video for Volk was going to take on a Volkswagen Beetle car. <laughs> we, had, we had two days with Volk to yep. do it. Yep. <laughs> Went down to Windang, shot it. Not once did he complain. Mm. Uh, he, he'd get through his lines, do all that, and then he'd go, we'd be like, sweet, we got that. But he goes, I can do it a bit better for you. I'll, I'll give you a couple more goes. And, like, just the amount of time that he just gives back to people, never says no to a photo, all yep. that sort of stuff. Like, uh, massive, massive respect. And getting in there, yeah, basically saving the card. Like, what mm. would they have done if he didn't step up and take that fight? Oh, yeah. um, it would have just been a disaster. So... He's, as he said after the fight yesterday, his work now in that weight division is done. Mm. Hopefully he gets maybe another crack down the track with a full prep under his belt mm. and we get to see another fight because that one in uh, in Perth earlier this year was just unreal. But yep. um, massive respect to Volk. So uh, I'm sure, yeah, we haven't seen the last of Volk. Yeah, and if you if you do have a chance, and um, go watch the post-fight press, post press conference uh, because it's a really good insight into a guy like Volk, even a guy like Volk, he openly said, I need to stay busy, I need to stay working. And I guess a lot of men out there, one way you can get past, you know, if you're struggling or whatever, is to be disciplined, is to go to work, is to work hard. Um, so yeah, if you, if you get a chance, watch the post vice press conference because as I said, one of the most dangerous men on the planet, if he's struggling with it, you know, there are a lot of people out there struggling with it also. Um, and yeah, we just send our best wishes to Volks. And I know, look, he'll be back. Jeez, he'll be back. I, I had the pleasure of knowing Volks before he got into the UFC. We actually had a little MMA show that we used to do together. Um, and when I say this bloke has not changed, I genuinely mean he is exactly that. The only difference is he's more confident in front of the camera. That's the only difference between Volks, who is not even in the UFC. He's a 20, I think he was like 28 or 29 uh, concreter. Couldn't get a contract. Stuffed over by his manager, was like be basically begging, give me a shot in the UFC. That guy is the same bloke as one of the most famous fighters in the world and one of the most dangerous men in the world and also obviously financially set for the rest of his life. So um, we absolutely back Volk. I mean, incredible bravery. This is what makes, you know, it was a huge risk. There was huge reward. And this is like, this is what separates the great, the great from the good is how they bounce back from these situations. He's had all everything go 
not everything go his way. He's obviously had his challenges, but the last four or five years, he has just ran through his opposition. I know he lost to Islam in the first fight, but it was very close, and he almost left that fight a winner in the fans' eyes. So this is now his moment where he gets to pick himself back up, go back down to 145. Um, he is 35 years old now, so I hope that – I hope he strategically – you know, he fights um, – I'm forgetting his name now, but he's – Tapora or something like that. I hope he fights him not in three months. He said three months. I, I hope Vox doesn't fight him in three months because he's going to be medically suspended for a little bit at least. He wants to fight him in January, so that's that's literally three months. So I, I don't think he'll be able to do a full full camp if he did that. But Vox was already saying, even after a you know a shocking knockout loss on the mic, he's like, I want to go again. Like that's the kind of bloke Vox is. He's going, I want to go in January, but I hope that he maybe they can just extend that out a little bit now. Max Holloway will probably step in to fight. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his name, um, guys. It's Tepora or something like that. He's a he's a scary, scary 145er. Um, but I hope they, the UFC, I hope does the right thing by Volks. Almost protects himself. And and as he said, he needs to be working. And his head was he was doing his own head in by not working. So hopefully the UFC can kind of like step in and give him work in that time to keep him really focused and busy or whatever. So. Uh, anyway, we're always team Volk. Always team Volk. Hey, Dan, do you reckon we'll ever get to the point where we see the, the Volk-McGregor fight? Will that ever happen, do you reckon? McGregor doesn't want that fight. He doesn't want that fight. He, he I, I, I don't think, I think McGregor deep down knows Volk's. There's certain guys that McGregor talks smack to that I think McGregor th thinks his power in the first round or two can take care of him. Mm. But I think that McGregor knows Volk's is such a technician that... He doesn't want to bar that. He yep. doesn't want to bar that. He's been talking shit for how many years now? Um, maybe he tries to weight bully him and says, I'll fight you at 170 or something. Yep. And because Volk's fucking, he's a madman. He'll go, yeah, sweet, no worries. Um, personally, I hope it happens because then Volk gets a massive payday. Yep. It's like, so I don't even care about the result, even though I'd be back in Volk all day. Like, Conor McGregor's cardio is honestly one of the worst. Card. He, Conor McGregor <laughs> is seriously, he could be in his prime. He was, in my opinion, the best two round fighter in the history of the sport. Like his first two rounds was fucking mental. After that second round, he just like falls off a cliff. It's obviously because he's, he's, um, he doesn't conserve energy. Like he's, every shot is precision, timing, perfect. But I, yeah, look. I would love for Volk to get that fight because I would love him to get the payday. Yeah. And also the recognition after he knocks Conor McGregor out. Yeah. And Zuckerberg mask on the undercard as well. Co yep. A co-main yep. co maybe. And maybe Guru Timmy under that. Mm. Maybe. Maddie, who do you want to fight? Who don't Timmy's you Timmy's going to have to come up to my weight division. I <laughs> I'll take on um, Tobler. Okay. Oh, yeah. Nice. There we go. There we go. Um, anyway, just send a massive shout out to Volk and uh, uh, hopefully he, he gets – the things in his life he needs to make him feel, you know, focused and, and everything going really well. Um, I think it's something that we speak about a lot with, like, certain footy players that I respect so much about guys when they are just all chips in. Might yeah. not always go their way, but they are all chips in. You've got to respect that sort well, of attitude. Yeah, like, I'm not sitting here saying I'm, like, bulk or whatever, but having been an athlete since I was, like, four years old, um, I understood where he was coming from. Like, if I am, am not redlining towards something – and having like and i get bored so i achieve something i'll start getting bored my head starts going in i start to just completely losing focus before you know it i'm a few months in and my head's completely off so i totally relate to what he's saying and i think that a lot of men out there the best the best remedy for if you're struggling is discipline and hard work it really is just throw yourself into something um anyway let's get into uh face some music brought to you by sports but face some music Oh yeah, here Let's we go. It. Let's oh, do it. Back over here today. Not in my throne this week. No, not in the throne. Just Timmy's, uh, Timmy's away. So face the music. Um, look, it's it's dancing off season, footy off season, dancing off season. So no one's going to be dancing today. Uh, you can enjoy the off season, um, but you're about to start your pre season. So your dancing coaches, they're going to start flogging you soon. Okay. You're going to have to come up with some new stuff. Yep. Um, but that's okay. You get a, you get a little bit of a reprieve this week, but we're still going to hold you guys uh, to account for your tips from last week. So. I can tell you that everybody got the following uh, tips correct this week, okay? Um, everyone had New Zealand head-to-head -head against Samoa, Fiji head-to-head -head against the Cook Islands, and Australia to beat Sri Lanka in the cricket. So well done, everybody. At the very worst-case scenario, you're going home with three out of 12 points this week. So, <laughs> so good stuff. Uh, everyone also got the following wrong. 
anything to do with Volk. We all went with Volk. Mm-hmm. Um, who got robbed, obviously, in the first round yesterday. <laughs> and then uh, everyone had Fiji 13+. plus. We didn't see that. No. We're going to get to that game soon, but that was a lot closer than everybody thought. Um, so we'll go through. So, Denon, um, you had uh, the following correct. You had New Zealand 13+, plus, Osaka any time, and Taruva any time in the game yesterday. Match winner as well. Does that count for extra? No. Nah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so you got three there. The, you had the following wrong. You had Marnus top run score against Sri Lanka, Cummins top wickets. Yeah, but anyone that knows cricket might, knows that Marnus should have been the one to have the, the ton. Yeah. You, instead of Smith. I mean, instead of Warner. No, but this was against Sri Lanka. So oh, that was actually... Uh, <laughs> that was actually... <laughs> come on, mate. Anyone who knows their cricket knows. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mate, when you watch as much cricket as I do, you just it all blends into one. It all blends into one. Don't, don't make me, hey, you started so well. Don't make me start taking points off. <laughs> right? um, so that's where that happened. So you lost a couple of points there. Guru, um, you had New Zealand 13 plus. So good start there. That was correct. You had the following wrong. Um, you had Joey Manu anytime. Mm-hmm. Should have backed him anytime. Shirt ripper. He might have got a point there. Um, you had Milne uh, anytime. And then you had Smudge and Stark as your run taker and, and wicket taker. So... Not much doing. Not a great deal doing. No. Um, so not not your best there. Thailand Timmy, he had the following. <laughs> <coughs> he had a Hughes any time, Buller any time, Zampa top wicket. So not bad from him. Mm. Three points there. Uh, he had the Kiwis 1-12. to 12. That was very wrong. Um, <laughs> and then he had Marsh top run scorer. He was the closest out of all of us. He, he also got a 50 in that game that Inglis uh, tore it up. Matty, you had the Kiwis 13 plus. <laughs> Fisher Harris, any time try score a bold, which you like, and a nice little price there as well. And uh, you undid did that with a bit of a boring tip, Sevo any time, um, but still correct. So you had Warner top runs and Maxwell top wickets, which were wrong. Then myself, I had the Kiwis 13 plus, Papali'i any time try scorer. Uh, Whippy didn't get a try for me in the Fiji game, which was... was lost to boot though, lost to boot at one point. Lost to boot? Yeah, yeah, they, they, someone ripped his boot and threw it. Did you know he was a front row forward last one? Didn't, but I, I learned that <laughs> quite quickly. <laughs> Lost to boot, did you say? Yeah, he lost to boot. Should give myself a point for that. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Warner and Stark, I had were my cricket selections. Uh, I was closest to pinning the Volk fight. I said it would end in round two, um, but I did have a Volk KO. So, anyway, so the results this week: Denon, Timmy, and Matty. You had six points. So well done, boys. Uh, I had five, and Guru well and truly got the cue in the rack now for the end wow, of the year. Wow, that's a Barry uh, Crocker. Four out of a possible twelve points. Barry Crocker. What he's doing? Yeah. You know Tyler what? Milner was a real bold pick there. That was. Yeah. You know, lock, did you know he was playing lock before? <coughs> I did. Yeah? I did. I think I said it last week too, but uh, it didn't look like scoring, unfortunately. You know what? You had some good picks last week, a couple mm-hmm. of try scores, and you have got carried away. That's what's happened here. I did get carried you away. Did, you got carried away, and we saw that. And sometimes, you know, you've got to, you've got to take a kick to the gut sometimes to bounce back. I think we kind of skimmed over it a little bit, but Matty the Waterboy picking Fisher Harris from the clouds. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. To seal it. To bring it's, almost, 50. it's almost similar to my Anafinal Blake. He couldn't pick, get a bet right, right for whatever. seven weeks during the season. I know. Fish. But, that, but that's why I don't I don't back it because we know it's bullshit. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like it's like if, if Joey Johns picked it, I'd go fuck. But if fucking Matty the office person picks it, yeah. I'm going, <laughs> mate, what a fucking G up. Yeah. What's well, interesting, as soon as the pressure of dancing kind of drops off, Matty's really starting to get in his work with his tipping. Can't handle the pressure. Um, which I've noticed. You also have to forgive Guru today. Uh, he didn't know that there'd be no dancing today. He had a feeling this was coming and he said he didn't sleep very well last night because he thought we were uh, going for round two of the chicken dance. So I had a number prepared for you. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I'll have to put it back in the swag yeah. now. There's, there's one to look forward to for uh, over the off season or a little bit later next season. But that's that's the tip from this week that's the face of music yep. now let's go tips for this week's coming let's do it so i want to get your tips for kangaroos kiwis i want your um market's not up yet but i want your winner your one to tw- uh one to 12 or 13 plus and mm. i want to try scorer um, okay. from all of you so okay and then I've, we've also got the png fiji game we're playing the netherlands the old foe in the cricket on wednesday oh, yeah, as well okay and uh we've got a rugby world cup final just a head to head in that so we'll yeah. start off with the kangaroos kiwis you got kangaroos kiwis one to 12 australia yep Try scorer, Holmes, Valentine Holmes. Yep. If he plays, obviously, hasn't been named, but I'd assume he's playing. Beautiful. You're uh, in. Sorry? That's it. That's that's the... Uh, what's the next one now? PNG, oh, we'll, PNG. I'll come back for the next okay, game. Okay, yep. Yeah. Sweet. Who you got, Guru? Uh, I'm going to go the Kangaroos. I'm going to go 13 plus. Oh. Ooh. And I'm going to go Miso, hoping that he plays. Took him as a top try scorer for the comp, so I'm going to double down on him. Like it. Matty? I'm going to go Australia 13 plus. And I'm going to go Harry Grant to score. Yeah, Harry Grant. Plus. Well, I'm going Australia 1 to 12, but I'm also going the Hammer to score. So okay. that's, that's where I'm <coughs> playing. Uh, PNG versus Fiji. Same again. What do you got? PNG, uh, 
PNG to win, one to twelve, and Alex Johnson to score. Yep. Uh, I'm going to go for Fiji one to twelve. I'm going to go for an upset uh, and give me Sevo anytime try scorer. I'm going to go PNG one to twelve. I'm going to take a Fiji try scorer if that's all right. I'm going to go Tui Kamakamika. Kamakamika. That's absolutely oh, fine. Did you go so far? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. 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 Big I was going. That's absolutely fine with me because I'm actually uh, going for a similar sort of setup, uh, Matty. I'm going PNG one to twelve and uh, Jareem Buller. What a game yesterday. I'll talk more later, but. Wow, I'm going to hit as my okay. try scorer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cricket, so give me a... Uh, I think it's safe to say we all think... And no one's picking a Netherlands upset here, are they? Look, <laughs> I think... Don't underestimate Netherlands. They fucking got a bit about them. They, well, they beat South Africa the other day. There you More go. on that in the cricket segment a bit later, but... Uh, yeah. uh, South put, Africa's held us up. So. Put your clogs out, South African <laughs> cricket fans. Um, what about... Uh, yeah, I want your top run scorer and your top wicket taker for that game. Mr. Mr. Cricket, who you got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, listen... <laughs> First of all, I, I resent that statement because ever since I gave my advice and told Australia how to fucking play a bit of cricket, yep. they haven't lost a game. Yep. So, okay, I've made an error because I watch so much cricket, it all blends together. But <laughs> let's just fucking relax on that. I don't know nothing about cricket. Uh, I didn't say that. <laughs> Check the tape. <laughs> video video review. Uh, could I go? I'm just, I'm backing me boy Manus. I'm just going to say Manus every time because he did a goosey in the ashes one year. And that yep. fucking, I love that shit. Now, hey, I tell you what, Australia I'm, win. Because I'm a good bloke. Australia win 13 plus. Because <laughs> I'm a good bloke, Marnus is under a bit of a, is he going to play, is he not going to play? Oh, okay. So if you've got a little backup there, if, if he doesn't pull up because they're thinking about my man, Travis Head, <coughs> uh, coming back in. Listen, I'm just going to go Warner. Yep. Um, great game. A couple of weeks, couple, about a week ago. You're not wrong. Very and a wicket taker? Uh, Paddy Cummins, it's my boy. PC, this is hey mate. He listened to he listened to the fucking podcast and he's changed his ways. At first, he was aiming <laughs> not at the stumps, and now he's aiming at the stumps. Do we have to draw your diagram, people? <laughs> That's what he did. Um, who you got, Kieran? I'm gonna go Steve Smith. Yep, batting and bowling. I'm gonna go Adam Zampa. Seems to be in good form at the moment. Two four fours in a row, in very nice form. Matty, I reckon Hazelwood for for wickets. Yep, and I can't go past Warner. Against yep. Netherlands, yeah. Yep, I'm going with uh, Travis Head mm. to come back in and just whack him, get himself in a bit of form, and Starkey. I reckon he's just going to be too quick, too good for Netherlands. Uh, strongly disagree, mate. <laughs> <laughs> strongly disagree. Well, the proof will be in the pudding, mate. <laughs> Check in next week. Uh, Rugby World Cup final. Just want a head-to-head here because there's probably not going to be a try scored because it's Rugby Union. Oh. So, um, um, all Blacks. All Blacks all the way. I, look, I, I would love to get your boys' opinion because I... Was, I all Blacks, if Australia aren't in it, All Blacks are my second team. But I've spoken to a lot of Aussies that are fully anti-All Black. I'm like, what about the Izaks? Yeah. What the hell? They're our brothers. I uh, I got the All Blacks about three or four weeks ago at 450 with sports bet. So I'm riding them home yeah. pretty confidently. Well played. Well, is, is All Blacks your second team? Uh, it is my second team yeah, as okay, well, so yeah. Cool, cool. I, yeah. I just don't. Unlike yourself who watches a lot of cricket, I just don't watch <laughs> it, basically any rugby union. Yeah. Um, but I'm with you. I think the Anzac spirit, we've got to get around the boys, haven't we? Anzac spirit. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Like the amount of people like, nah, fuck the All Blacks. I'm like, yeah, I get it. Like they're better than us in union, but like, that's the brothers. But we're not We're not like a threat anymore. Like it's not like they're taking anything away from us. <laughs> like, Absolutely not. Continue to steamroll us. So <laughs> at this point, we might as well just get on board. But also like, you got to respect greatness, don't you? Do. You, you yeah. got to respect greatness. Yeah. I love the All Blacks. Yeah. I, I really, really like the All Blacks. They. I read their book a few years ago, the, the legacy one. It's it's bloody awesome. I have so much respect maybe, for Maybe it. it's because I don't watch much Union, so I'm not pissed off at how much they pump us. Mm. I don't know. I'm past that. Oh, it's about respect now. But I, I just like, I, I've always seen New Zealand as like, yeah, like a healthy rivalry. Almost like New South Wales, Clean, Queensland to a degree. Yep. Um, I, I feel like like early 2010s, late 2000s, mm. I still was pissed off at just how good they were. Yeah. Now it's like, it's been 20 years. Yeah. You just yeah. got to respect how good they are. Like yeah. there's, we'll be, we'll there's families over there better than our countries. At the moment. It's <laughs> unbelievable. We'll probably we'll fire a shot in the in the home one. They'll probably pit, try and pitch a few league players, and we'll we'll go all right for a year or two, and then then we'll go back to stinking it up again. Uh, so you're going All Blacks as well. I'm going All Blacks. What about yeah. New Zealand? They've they've at least made a World Cup final in cricket and rugby. I think two in cricket, two in rugby in the last eight years. For their population, it's outrageous. Wow. Yeah, like actually outrageous. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I'm going for the All Blacks, but there's a bit of a temptation. Can I burgle a point here by going with the Springboks? Because nobody else has. Um, 
I think the Anzac spirit's got to get me over the line. I was going to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's it. That's it. That's Face the Music, baby. Brought to you by Sportsbet. Check the Sportsbet app for the latest odds. As always, guys, gamble responsibly. You win some, but you lose more. Um, how long are we away to the big announcement? Please, do you have any estimate? Well, it can't be far. Um, Surely. I reckon we'll probably get through spring racing is my yep. hunch. And then we'll start to... And, and spring racing, the best the best place to pun is sports bet, guys. So as we said, go and check. Have you got Have you got a cricket? Did you say the other day you showed us a cricket odds that you had? Like a hammy cricket special or something? Yeah, the, uh, the bingo. The bingo? Yeah. Well, yeah. tell the people. Tell yeah, the people. absolutely. Well, so we're still waiting until we get a little bit close to this game. Just okay. for the line-ups Apologies. to get a little bit more solid. But um, we had it for Joel Kane's try score, a bingo. Massive hit through the footy season. Yep. So they've given uh, the madman the keys to the asylum. I've got the Hammy's cricket bingo. We've got a run score of one and a wicket take of one. So the way it works, there'll be five names there. If three of the five score 50 or more, um, you end up winning that bet. And for the wicket takers, there'll be four bowlers there. <laughs> if three of those bowlers at least get two or more wickets, That'll be bingo, which hit. In fact, all four bowlers got a wicket in the Pakistan game. So yeah. it's just a good way to kind of keep you interested right through both innings of the game. Yeah, well. okay, yeah. cool. So when does that go live? That'll be live. Uh, that'll probably come up, uh, if not later today on Monday, that'll probably come up tomorrow. What's, it, what's it called? Hammy's to score a 50 bingo or Hammy's wicket taker bingo. And we spoke about the prime real estate last week, just mm. straight there under the head-to-head. Uh, the -head prime mark. real estate, just chuck a sneaky little fiver on it. Maybe it's just have a little... Little Stewie Diver, nothing silly. Just, um, <laughs> just enjoy it. Um, that's what it's for. A Stewie Diver responsibly. Exactly. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> um, now let's get into... What, what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to be relatively quick, quick with the international games because we've got to get into the transfer chat. Mm -hmm. um, because, like, for example, is there much to say about Samoa? Not really. New Zealand, though. New Zealand defeat Samoa 50 to nil. Uh, wow. Wow. What a resounding win by New Zealand. And we spoke about it uh, in Packer Up Boys last week, how as an Australian that is interested, obviously, in origin, that was an extra layer of Michael Maguire heading into that match. Because mm. if they come out and got beaten by Samoa and then Australia go and do them, the headlines would be absolutely crazy around Michael Maguire, but mate, I tell you what, that's if you're a New South Wales fan, that is music to your ears going 50 nil against Samoa. And also, it wasn't just like they came out and blown off the park. If anything, I thought Samoa started the first probably 10, 15 better than New Zealand. But New Zealand's uh, ability to stay composed and just confident and, and structured, like everything was just, it just worked for them. Um, they had multiple players at different periods of the game dominating the game. I didn't think there was actually a single player that, you know, maybe Hughes, but he's a seven. But I didn't think there was actually a single player that you could go, he dominated the whole 80. I actually thought there were little blocks where you saw like a Joey Manu situation, Dylan Brown situation, you know what I mean? So I, I really, really, um, I think this is great for New Zealand. I tell you what, New Zealand versus Australia, I it's almost 50-50 in regards to the game they play because the difference between New Zealand and Australia versus Samoa is Australia started incredibly well, but what happened? They dropped a bunch of ball, got undisciplined, all that kind of stuff, whereas New Zealand, they were absolutely ruthless to the end. I think sometimes with these internationals, like you see, you know, like the score lines might be a little bit closer than what you expect, or sometimes it's big blowouts and you sort of say, oh, well, that's what they were meant to do. That's what's meant to happen, but... Like, oh, I didn't see this coming at all. A 50 nil drumming. Mm. I, I did not see it at all. And I think you've got to give full credit to the Kiwis for their performance. Uh, I thought the halves <coughs> were tremendous. I know the <coughs> stat sheet, you know, mm. Dill Brown didn't have any tries or anything, but I thought some of his touches were unreal. Right. His run metres, it wasn't like nearly 200 metres or something yeah, like that? absolutely freak. Jerome Hughes was fantastic. Uh, it was just a good all-round game from New Zealand. And uh, uh, we mentioned it with Matty as well. What a captain's knock from James Fish-Harris. Oh, mate. He is... Talk about a guy like late-ish in his career just stamping his authority as, you know, if you ever wanted a player to look at and go, there is so much to, more to rugby league than stats, it's Fisher-Harris. Now, don't get me wrong, his stats are still impressive. But is he in the top tier of front row stat-wise? To be honest, he's not even close. And yet, who's the front rower that gets the win all the time? It's Fisher-Harris. And he steps up outside of his in comfortable environment of the Panthers. He goes to New Zealand for the first time captaining. He's stepping up against a Samoan four-pack that is absolutely frothing at the bit and almost a bit of a chip on their shoulder because there's a, you know, a few people of Samoan heritage in that Kiwi side. Fisher Harris once again steps up to the plate, once again gets his team across the line. And it's so good to see him now you know, as the captain of New Zealand because when he first came into first grade, 
there was worries that he was going to be the next Mark guy. Mm. He was just a loose human. He was a loose human. Who was getting in trouble. He was on, on the, the edge as well. Constantly. Yeah. And I, I remember him doing an interview once where they said, oh, you're a bit like MG. And he was embracing it, just loving yeah. it. To see how he has changed as a footballer, more importantly as a leader, it's been incredible over the last couple of years. Mate, watching that hucker with him at the front was like, oh. uh, no, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. No, thank you. No, was, thank you. I, I, they're just chills watching both both sides with yeah. their, their pre-game um, stuff there was amazing. Uh, and just the, the, I think it was, was it Nass uh, and Lee oh. just like face oh. to face? I was like, no, holy thank you. Heckers. Holy dooly, those two boys. <laughs> yeah, far it'd be a out. Fucking, it'd be an explosion if they fought. Yeah. <laughs> what about Spencer Lino? You see the full quid? He is lost. He's got a screw loose. Yeah, what is he? <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. What do you got there, Matty? Jerome Hughes and Dylan Brown had 45 runs between them. Mate, that's. And, and, I, and one of the key you know discussions going in was if they click and their number nine works, then it could be a big day for them. And we've got to speak about it. Grand Poppy Foz. Mate, I loved him at nine. Yeah. I, I, look, I know there were periods in defence where he got a little bit worked over, but like, oh, forgive the bloke. Forgive the bloke that the huge Samoan forward pack bumped him a couple of times. I thought Foran was a really good steadying hand at number nine. Not, again, Michael Maguire, brilliant. Even us did not see that coming. Even us, we, we live and breathe rugby league. We bloody talk about it all the time. Not for a second was I thinking, oh, Foran's going to start at nine. I thought Brown, for, for all money, was... Once again, a good selection by Michael Maguire. Isn't it just a great reminder? You know, we're always looking for dummy halves in rugby league, the best running game, who's the fastest, you know, running hookers all the time because the game's so fast. And then you get guys like Ben Hunt, Kieran Foran, who jump into hooker, who just understand the game. Yeah. And they just control the ruck the entire time. And it's so good to see. And like to think that they ran for 45 runs each, that's great service. Like for yeah. them to get the ball, to, to be able to look up, have the time to look up, not just be shoveling on straight away. Mate, um, Really, really, really good performance by the Kiwis. Um, I, yeah, fuck. And I, I love Foz at nine. Now, look, could his body handle that week in, week out? Probably not. Probably not. But from a person, look, I have a lot of doubts about Michael Maguire as a coach. Now, I do think that I may have been a little bit harsh when he was at the Tigers. No offence, Hemi. Um, None taken. Because, <laughs> because, because of how bad it's gotten since then, I don't think I was giving enough Michael Maguire enough slack of how poorly that club is run and how much you are dealing with from above. Um, now, look, there's still things that I disagree with with the way he coaches, but as we move further away from his time at the Tigers and then we see performances like this, we see the World Cup where they were a little bit hot and cold, but at the end of the day, they were a try essentially away from beating Australia. They go into that World Cup final, they may beat Samoa and be you know champions. I'm, I'm kind of slowly coming around to Mike Maguire. Like, I'm after the game on the weekend, and look, it's against Samoa, we're going to see the next two weeks will be a really good indication. And they don't need to beat Australia, but if it's a, a high-quality game and it's close, I'm, I'm coming around to, like, maybe he is the exact man that New South Wales need. Christ, I hope so. Like, I, I just... that You can look at key decisions. Like, okay, for example, chance at fullback. He, so he goes to the World Cup, sees Joey Marn at fullback, he wins the golden boot, and then Michael Maguire has the guts to go, you know what? Yes, he can be the fullback in the world, best fullback in the world. Matter of fact, he even said it pre-game. He said, Joey Manu could be the best fullback in the world, but we just went, basically he was saying we need someone that's you know got the runs there week in, week out. Um, because he probably saw what we saw with Joey. Like, he is a gun fullback, but his ball playing sometimes can struggle. And what do you know? Puts Chance back there, but also, first try. What was it? Chance cut out ball. And I reckon it's the best ball of his career. <laughs> like, yeah. And so, again, Michael Maguire decision. Four and at nine. Like, these are key coach decisions that made, that helped, sorry, not made, helped the Kiwi boys play as well as they did. And shout out to Chance. I mean, <clears throat> two or three years ago, I would have put him in the same sort of category as Joey Mano. He's a run-first sort of guy. He's a whole mm. high-volume fullback. I didn't think he had this sort of ball playing in him. But as I just said, I, I thought that pill that he threw was the best of his career. It was, yeah, unbelievable. Who stood up for you? Well, I was just going to say, what a 12-month little window it is for Madge too. Because I'm with you. I think uh, probably unfairly people go, oh, I didn't work at the Tigers. So that maybe just tarnishes his legacy a bit. Obviously, yep. he won a premiership with South. But <coughs> now he gets to, like, let's say he wins uh, the Pacific Cup oh, and then yeah. goes on next year and wins Origin with New South Wales. All of a sudden... His stocks are sky high again. Yeah, so, absolutely. Mate, he, could, he could really turn things around. Um, I just reckon those guys you, you sort of touched on there were, were, were solid for um, for New Zealand. There was, you know, not much to get excited for about the, uh, the Samoans, but I don't know. I thought 
Tommy Talao had some good like little moments there. Mm. Another one the Tigers will let go, <laughs> but he he had some strong runs, did some you know did some good stuff, and then obviously Far Logo as well. I reckon on the on the stroke of half time, um, if that little chip back in um, had it gone a little bit better, like far out, he could have had another all timer on his yeah. highlight reel. Yeah, it, uh, wasn't it? Um, <clears throat> We'll speak about the Samoa side. Actually, we'll start on the Kiwis and then we'll move to the Samoa. Um, but you're right; like that, that was a real pivotal moment because we could <laughs> we could have seen if we had seen that again with Far Longo. It's like what this kid is unbelievable. Um, but just with the Kiwis, uh, who stood out for you in the Kiwi side? It's too bad Timmy's not here to talk about uh, Matty Timoko. I thought he was fantastic. And what I, you know, and look, I'm I don't want to put the boot into to Canberra. I understand that you know. I was really impressed with what they did last year or last season. But what happened the first two times he touched the ball? He was a, bit, a metre behind the play. And I messaged you boys and said it. Isn't that such evidence of, and it's, it's again, it's no disrespect to the, the Raiders players, but I guess it's, everyone can kind of agree, in attacking football, their ball playing isn't top tier, the Canberra Raiders. They're a forward pack first offloads, score tries through that way. And so Timoko being a metre back, that's because he's played the whole season, usually getting the ball quite deep away from the line because their ball playing, attack ball playing isn't deep into the line. As soon as he realised his timing on the top tier Hughes and Brown halves, he exploded because he dropped his first two balls. Mm. And, I, and as I said in the message to you guys, that's a clear example of a guy that is used to... Um, halves that don't usually go deep in the line or you've got a Jackie Whiten who was a ball runner and, and not really a ball player and he absolutely exploded after that. I'll tell you what really stood out for me, he played left centre. Mm. I was expecting them to move the more experienced Manu yep. to play left. And another another shout bit. from Michael Maguire. Yeah, uh, full credit to him and I, like, I just, you know, especially when you look at that Raiders side, <laughs> as you said mate, they don't have all the ball players in the world in my opinion. Jack, he's done well at 5-8 but I think he's a center. Well, Ricky five Stewart eight. literally said yeah. he has been playing number six for the club. He's not a five eight. He said that. Yeah. And the fullback, Seb Chris, another center yeah. playing fullback. Yeah. So uh, it's not an ideal situation down there. But geez, it makes me wonder for the last few years when you had Hudson Young on that edge, you had Jack White, and could it have been the play to put him at left center? Yeah, yeah. I tell you what, if you're Ricky Stewart, you're going, holy shit, get this guy some fucking good early ball. Get him some ball. Yep. He needs some ball. And and uh, you know, and Timmy speaks about it all the time. How, you know, it, one thing that is a real lack for the Canberra Raiders is they're getting good ball and their shape is just nowhere near as good as the top tier. Yep. And, and look, some of that is by design because they're a, a forward pack first kind of mentality. Um, and we'll get to that obviously in the transfers. But yeah, Timoko was 11 tackle breaks. And even for the Raiders, like, it doesn't have to be anything special. Like, even just turning him under and sending him back against the grain. Yeah. He's so hard to handle. Yep. I, uh, yeah, I, I hope that the Raiders and Ricky Stewart watched that closely and sort of sat back and went, fuck, we need to utilise this guy properly Absolutely. next year. And, and I, I just, just reiterating, the first two balls he drops, and it would if you had, didn't have a keen eye on rugby league, you'd be like, Jesus, Tim Walker's having a shocker. But the first thing I thought was, here's a guy that is not used to getting high-quality ball yep. on the front foot. Like, that's literally what's happened. All of a sudden, he's like, oh, shit, I can be a, a metre closer to the line here. I can be a metre ahead. And boom, he starts nailing it. The other guy that stood out for me, and he still might be the most underrated back row in rugby league, Britton Nakara. Oh, man. My God, that line that he ran. Oh. I think the commentators mentioned it, but you want to earn respect off your teammates. Like, you are just asking to be wailed on that run. He's there. the best line runner in the competition right now, yeah. bar none. And it's not him. He's the best line runner since Boyd Cordner. You know, you know what else I really love about him? He does it all the time. It always goes, goes unnoticed. You know, in the grand final, Nate Cleary scored that last try, and everyone lost their mind because mm. Scotty Sorensen addressed it and got himself back. Mm. Britain's been doing that for two years straight. You yeah. watch, he never ever gets pinned <clears throat> for an obstruction or anything like that. His match awareness is incredible. <clears throat> He's such a good back rower. The Sharks yeah. has got a very special one there. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really happy for Britain Nakota because there was a year there where I was starting to go, ooh, is this kid going to really reach his potential or is he going to be kind of like that battler back rower that he keeps his spot because he gets through his work, but he doesn't really wow. Mm. But I mean, this year he is, I mean, he was out... Team of the season, he was our back rower. One yeah. of our back rowers in Fafita, obviously. Isn't he a great example, of, though? The first year, absolutely burst mm. on the scene. Then he was flat for a year or two. People sort of started to jump all over his back, but it, it just takes time. And now mm. he's going to be one of the more consistent back rowers in the game for quite some time. Yep, absolutely. Um, who else are we going to talk about? I, I, I like the Manu switch to the other side because it's almost saying 
listen, everyone knows Manu, he's great in a way, great friend, he can set up tries, we all know that. But basically, it was a, a giveaway of the game plan of like, you know, we're really not going to use you for that. We want you just roaming. So why would we stick you out and keep you out on the that other side? Instead, we put you, we'll put a strike centre of Tomoko, who we want out there to be strike, and we bring you on the other side just to come in and take those hit-ups. I thought Joey Manu, he, he, it was almost perfect how, how he decided to come in sometimes, decided to stay out of the times. He almost did it perfect. And look, they won 50 nil, so maybe in a game where it was a little bit tighter, that, you know, that, that would, wouldn't work as well. Uh, but, yeah, great, great performance. Just, just on Joey Manu, have you ever seen a bloke in less of a hurry to put a new shirt on um, <laughs> after it got ripped off. Uh, two or three, the rest of the set, he was out there running around. Oh, yeah. Almost almost scored with his shirt off. Mate, I tell you what, we give refs a hard time quite often. Yep. I want to give a massive ref, a massive rap to the ref for allowing a hot boy, Joey Marley, yep. just to get through his work. Like, that puts bums on seats. It does put bums on seats. And so, the ref, was it Green Atkins? Who was, who was the ref? Not sure. <clears throat> yeah, here we have. It's a great sign of a good ref, though. Got no yeah, idea. see, I don't even know who the ref was. That's how good it was. Um, but, yeah, no shirt. I mean, I tell you what, there'll be a lot of uh, partners out there going, hey, uh, I might like a bit of rugby league now. We're trying to grow Let's the game. The footy. Exactly. Good for and the that's league. what Joe Marnie was saying. He wasn't thinking, I want everyone to see how sexy I am. He was thinking, I'm just trying to grow the game. Absolutely. And that's what we're going to do at the moment with international football. We've got to put it front and centre. And this is a great way to grow the game. Get a couple of the boys with their rigs out. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to watch that? Oh, I mate. thought it was very impressive. Really, uh, mate, imagine a hucker with no shirt on. Wow. That'll get the blood moving. Yeah. Gerard, Gerard Sutton was the ref. Gerard Sutton. Yep. See, massive rap, Gerard Sutton. He didn't go, oh, you need to put your shirt on, whatever. He said, let the hot boy go. The only thing he could have done better is uh, send it up to the bunker just for some nice uh, slow mo <laughs> uh, with, with the rig out as well. I would like to see if that shirt did actually come off. <laughs> how, <laughs> how about uh, Billy in commentary? I don't know if you heard him. Uh, he got his Joey's mixed up, Joey Tarpity, Joey, and he goes, sorry, I still just got uh, Joey Manu on the mind. And uh, who could blame him? Who could blame um, him? He's still on my mind. Yeah. He's still on my mind it's freaking monday yeah. <laughs> shout out to the hot boy as well joe manu 197 run meters remember the last time we saw him was only a month ago with back-to-back -back hamstring injuries yeah how many of those meters with his shirt <laughs> off does it say there <laughs> i reckon it would have been 40 or something <laughs> <laughs> crack. Uh, nelson of solomona i thought he was uh, outstanding um i mean as a storm fan you gotta like damn where was that last couple of games yeah. but you know we'll get to the storm but it isn't it such a good example of even a guy, a man mountain, a man mountain in Nelson, needs other forwards around him to give him a little bit of momentum to then be his destructive best. Because like that's what we saw on the weekend is that he had these other forwards doing their jobs, Tarpane, Nikora, Papali'i, Leota, Fish Harris. So then Nelson got to do what he does best, was just come on, skill defenders. Um, so yeah, I thought he was outstanding. And that else? pack V the Ruse pack this weekend was oh, going unbelievable. Is what I was thinking, yeah. mate. I uh, yeah, cannot wait for that game. Cannot wait for it. And I want to give a quick shout out to to two players. Leo Thompson, he led the hucker in his first game. He he scored the try. Scored the try. Am I no? He got it. No. Was it disallowed? Disallowed. Disallowed. Yeah. Um, ran for hundred meters in uh, forty nine minutes, and then he made sixteen tackles. Only missed one. Uh, just. Like, I'm not saying that he, you know, blew the world apart with his debut and we're all sitting here going how crazy he was. He was good, solid. But a guy that no one would have said is going to be playing for the Kiwis at the end of this year. I just want to give him a massive rap for not only playing for the Kiwis, but being a part of the Knights resurgence, but also changing positions. No one talks about the fact that he, yep. when he changed into that front row, I'm not saying he was the only reason they changed form, but i tell you what, he had something to do with it. I remember at the start of this season when Jackson Hastings went up to New, uh, up to Newcastle, we had him in here and I said, oh, who's looked good? And the first name he said was Leo Thompson. Yeah, well. He's going to absolutely blow it away this year. So uh, he was impressive from day one up there in Newcastle. Done very well. I believe his brother plays Super Rugby. I think he's oh, sure. for the Highlanders or something Super as well. Rugby still a thing. <laughs> still getting around. Just joking, rugby fans. Oh, just a joke. Can you Google um, that, Matty? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you Google if it's still around? The other guy I want to give a shout out to has been a fantastic journey back, Jermaine Osaka. Mate. Oh, yeah. From, well, seriously, one of the stories of the year. It, like, you, you would, 18 months ago, you were sitting there going, which Q Cup team is he going to be playing for? To scoring 22 points for the Kiwis. Incredible. Mate, 14 months ago, I would have said, what a waste of talent. Yeah. What a, like this guy on his day, 
I remember his first, one of his first years for the Broncos. He was unbelievable. Like we we talked we talked about it all the time off air. Like Jermaine Asako, like he has this incredible game and then he struggles. Incredible game and then he struggles. This year he has just come out being the most consistent winger, essentially at least one of the most consistent wingers. But the his ability to score points is ridiculous this season. Like like we're talking about in a Dolphins side that ran what 14th, 13th, 14th, and then he comes out. Even the try he scored, like that took, he had to bump for Alongo. He had to still get the rip the ball out to score it. 22 points in, in your return match for the Kiwis. It has been the best right foot step in rugby league in 2023. It's, How many tries has he scored? Like so many of his tries aren't just there's no one there and he puts the ball down. He's got so much work to do every single time. You know the right foot's coming, they just can't do anything about it. Mate, you want to go and watch the, the right foot, watch his match winner against the Roosters on mm. Cooper Cronk. Match winner just goes, whoopsie, thanks for coming, baby. Try time. He just leaves. Cooper just falls just over. Just goes, what the yeah. hell just happened? Yeah. Um, yeah, stoked for him. Also, I want to give a shout out my boy, Griffin Neem. The big red white fella in the, the Kiwi jersey. You need a big red in a Kiwi jersey, don't you? You do. I mean, it, look, love seeing, like, geez, he must have applied a lot of sunscreen because he was looking super white. Afternoon, <laughs> afternoon game as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, Natural yeah. enemy of the redhead. So um, kudos <laughs> to him for ripping in. Um, also, really good for Roosters. Um, I saw be happy about this. Very happy. Um, white. White, on the, white as 18th man. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't realise that until the game had started Mid-same. either. Same. I was like, yeah. what the hell? Great experience for him. Really good experience. And, I mean, this guy has all the talent. Like, it's, he's a young, really explosive, could play edge, could play in the front row. Uh, but, yeah, look, great game by the Kiwis. Really, really good game. Jeez. Uh, oh, Dylan Brown might be the most athletic player in the NRL. When you, when you, okay, so if you've got a guy like Reese Walsh, who's lightning quick, but obviously doesn't have the size. Like Dylan Brown is about six foot one, six foot two, 95 kilos or so, fit as a fiddle, like apparently comes close to winning all the fitness in the Eels, super pound for pound strong. Sometimes when he gets the ball, you forget. I, I reckon he's the fastest six in the comp by a substantial margin. Oh, yep, at top speed. Ezra Mann may be over the first 10, but at top speed, I would say Dylan Brown's probably the fastest six in the comp. You know, the, the time where you actually see his pace is when he's chasing down yeah. players because he, he does so much more, more defensive work than any other player. You, you just use, you know, Reese Walsh as an example. <coughs> like, if you force Reese Walsh to make 30 tackles, yeah. I'm going to back him in for eight plus missed tackles, yeah. realistically. You give Dill Brown 30, he does it every <coughs> week. He must, if he misses two, I'm disappointed with him. Yeah, he was just some of the touches and how dangerous he Every time he had the ball, there's nothing on. He looks to his outside, nothing on. The defence is all set, but he just, boom, hits the afterburners. Yeah. And he may not necessarily, necessarily have three line breaks, but what is he doing? He's getting quick play of the balls. And also, the next time he gets the ball, that defender has, mate, I am not sliding off this bloke because he nearly scored the last time I friggin' had to tackle him one-on-one and there was friggin' nothing on. Um, I can't wait for Dylan Brown's career. I mean, he's, what, 21 years old? So young. He's yeah. so young. He's ha- so having young. a half like him in your defensive line, like you see so many of these teams <clears throat> build their attacking structure around isolating halves. Yeah, not. There's no point. No, nah, nah. <laughs> He's 23. He's 23, so young as anything. Like, his defence is essentially as good as a back rower. So you're ba- what you're basically saying, if you want to spot up Dylan Brown, you're asking to run at a back rower. Yeah. Like, well, there are back rowers in this comp you would rather spot defend on yeah. than Dill Brown. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, massive shout out to the, the, the Kiwis. They were outstanding. Um, quickly on, we'll go to Samoa now. I Like, I want to be clear. I am still just excited, just as excited as I was last week for La, for, for Alongo. I'm, I think he's a superstar of the future. I think that, you know, all the things I said last week, I still believe 100% this week. But isn't it just such a good example of even though you're a young superstar, even though you've got all the talent in the world, you still need time to develop and round out your game. You still need time for a club to be patient with you because if Fa'a Longo is at another club, he would have probably debuted last year, maybe even the year before, but we'll just say last year, at the end of last year or something like that, or at the start of this year. But Storm have intentionally been patient for him because when you look at seven tackles, eight misses. That, that's, that's the key area where you go, okay, that's the part of his game he needs to round out. Reese Walsh, he struggled within his first few years. All the great attack, but his defence was a bit of an issue. Now he went to the Broncos, he's worked on a lot, he's gotten much better. And so I thought that this is a really good game to show. I, I actually think it's a good game for Fa'a Longo because it, 
obviously it matters in the grand scheme of things. He's a very proud Samoan, but it's a really good reminder of okay, I just gotta I gotta stick to my processes, get through this, the the hard work, and make sure I take care of all the little things first, and then the big moments will come. Now I'm not sitting here saying he played an absolute Barry Crocker, but what I'm saying is is that those defensive, even though he was super brave and all that stuff. Um, it is a part of his game that he'll have to work on to become the superstar we all know he can be. Yeah, completely agree. And I, uh, you know, I walked away from the last two weeks with <coughs> Samoa, you know, getting beat convincingly in both. But God, I'm excited for what's to come in the future. Mm. They've now got their fullback. They've got their nine. Like I think um, Terrell May getting some experience in the mm. international game as well. Spencer Lenu, like you saw the passion he played with, still quite young. For the first time in a while, I'm looking at Samoa going, okay. Once Jerome Luai is back in there, I know what this team's going to look like for five years. Yep. Whereas previously it's been, fuck, who's going to play this year? How, yep. How's it going to work? So I think they had like guys like uh, Helam Lukey as well, another one yep. that's, you know, he, he, was, he was great when he was on the field. I really like the direction uh, that they're heading in. So I'm sort of, I'm still glass half full with Samoa, very much so. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I tell you what, even though Luai would want them to go out there and win, doesn't his stocks just go up and up every time they struggle without him? Yeah. Um, another bloke. Crit up, had a pretty poor game. But mm. look, it, you can't you can't ex- ever excuse ex- uh, errors and just go, oh, yeah, you know, he's out of position. So I don't think even Critter would be sitting here saying, oh, it's all good, I was out of position. But I, like we have to – the fact of the matter is this bloke was filling in at six because they had two – basically, Arcee and Volkman were the only genuine halves. And even you could argue Arcee's not even a genuine half. And he's also a rookie – so Critter was only put in six because he had experience. Otherwise, you would have had all rookies in your spine. Literally, you would have had um, Chan Kum Tong at nine, but along at one, you would have had Volkman and Asi. It's just with that inexperience, I highly doubt they would have been able to you know, do much. But I guess a really good learning curve for Critter um, that even though it is not fullback, it's not even close to fullback, I think it's actually going to be really good for him in the off-season and the pre-season to go, okay, there's, there's quite a lot of little nuances that I may be able to take out of this game for Samoa and apply them to myself at fullback if I do play fullback for the Doggies. For sure, and isn't it, you know, you look back at that grand final and everyone walked away from that going, what about his kicking game? How good was that? Isn't it just another great example? Like, you look at how he played for Samoa, kicked two out on the full, a left footer on the right-hand side of yeah. the ruck. Yeah. Like, just those little things that I think a lot of fans don't take into consideration yeah. that, you know, most halves get right. Like, I remember, we had Jamie Soward in the studio here and he was a left footer. He used to play on that side of the park and I remember him sitting here saying, oh, it doesn't matter. And I'm going, fuck, when you're one of the best kids yeah, ever, yeah. it probably doesn't matter, yeah. Jamie. But for every other human, it definitely does. And yeah. I think you could really see that with uh, Stephen Crichton on the he weekend. He shouldn't have been kicking long. Yep. Like, I, I don't know why, you know, maybe he was trying to step up and, and kind of um, direct the boys around. But, like, he, he should have only been doing short kicks because he's got a great short kick game. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, look, wasn't a good game from Critter, but if you're a Doggies fan, you're actually probably kind of happy with that performance because you know he's going to be rolling into preseason, going, okay, there's some key areas that, he, and also like some of his passing didn't look that comfortable passing, didn't look that natural to him. So, a bit, of, it could be a little bit of a kick up the backside of like, okay, there's some key things I can work on here. I can, I definitely can get better. I think it'll be, you know, like Stephen Crichton as well. I think we all need to keep in mind, you know, like. That's four years in a row he's made it all the way to a grand final, like oh, a man. World Cup. Like the amount of football he has played, I, I know he didn't run the ball all that much, and I've got a lot of Canterbury fans messaging me saying that means he has to play centre. He's not going to run the oh. ball fullback. Fucking please, just oh my God. okay. Six and one are not fucking yeah. anyway. Um, but the key, the key issue for me for Samoa was the errors from the outside backs. Uh, like a lot of people are blaming the forward pack, mate. When your outside backs make four, three, two, and four errors. And then your forwards make one error. So all of their forwards, all of Samoa's forwards made one error. So like as in, they all made zero. One bloke made one error. Their outside backs, as I said, four, two, three, and four. How are the forwards supposed to build a platform off that? Yep. They're just defending their asses off. They just, like, what are they supposed to do? So I thought that was, um, you know, tough for Samoa. Um, but I agree with you, mate. I think they're building nicely. Devastating loss for sure, but once they get To'o, Tango, Luai, um, you know, plenty of the boys back, I think that they're building, they're, they're, there's a direction there. Whereas, you know, I think if you've just started watching footy over the last couple of years, you might go, wow, dire straits. But I don't think people, people are forgetting, it was only five years ago where 
there was no direction. It was, if you're a proud Samoan, put the jersey on and have a dig. Now it's like, no, we've got a bit of a core here. We've got a bit of core to work with. So, yeah. And, and as you mentioned then, obviously, uh, with the outside backs making errors, if you want another example, the Cook Islands last week, just about every outside <coughs> back made an error last week. This week, didn't make any, and we're yeah. able to stay in the game. I, I don't think it gets – I speak about it obviously all the time on the podcast, but that is something that is – outside backs can – they need to make minimal errors. Now, there's – Errors are not all equal. If you're an outside back like Reese Walsh who was throwing a fucking 50-metre cutout ball to score a try and you, so you tend to make a few errors like that, that's different. But it's the coming out of your own end, the knock-ons that don't need to happen. Um, very Coach hard killers. to back. Coach killers, absolutely. Um, okay, now on to Fiji. Cook Islands really quick. Mate, obviously Fiji won or whatever, but Cook Islands. Mate, how good was that? They were this close, this close to winning. Um I think Carmichael Hunt becoming the head coach is the best thing that's happened to Cook Islands in a very long time. They're, that, like He's the kind of guy that will be able to convince people of Cook Island descent to go, you know what, I want to play for the Cook Islands. I thought they were outstanding. Um, Isar Marstens, obviously he's not a seven, but he was absolutely outstanding. Uh, for the Cook Island side, uh, one of the – I get look, I'm sure he's happy playing over in Super League and, and all that, but, geez. He has all the talent in the world, and he, he probably should have had 10 years in, in the NRL. That's how talented this kid was. He just didn't seem to work out for him. He, I think he won center of the year in his first year for the Tigers. Yep. Hammy, you can he remember did. that? Absolutely, I do. One of my, one of my few uh, positive memories from the last <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> I'm with you. He was, he's not a seven, yeah. but he had some money. He scored a try. A little banana kick back yeah. in to score another try. Silky. But he had a crack, and I'm with you. I reckon um, he's still over there in the Super League, but... Look, I wouldn't put it past the Tigers to get him back on board. Uh, <laughs> you never know. Nice little homecoming. Well, you do need a half. We do. We do. But he was, uh, <laughs> he was, uh, he was unreal. And uh, I think, like, it just goes to show all of us in Face the Music had uh, Fiji 13 plus. Yeah. And Cook Islands really <clears throat> ripped and teared. They, uh, they, they, they surprised a lot of people. Yep. Yeah, for me, uh, I walked in here last Monday and I said to you, what on earth did the Cook Islands do yeah. last week? Yeah. What did they do in the week leading up to that game? It was, it was like they didn't know each other. And then, you know, as tend to be the waves with these internationals and camps and whatnot, the longer you're together, the more it comes together. And I thought the Cook Islands were tremendous. So I, I was actually really, really, as I said, I thought Fiji would win 13 plus, but God, I was disappointed when they conceded that try to um, Taruva at the end because yeah. they didn't defend like that the rest and of the, the game. And the Wonga Blake try as well. Yeah, like there was just that they, I thought their scramble was unreal. The amount of times <coughs> they forced these absolute superstars for Fiji on the wings over the sideline, yeah. their scramble was great. Yeah. And then when Taruva came off his right foot, you could just tell straight away, shit, there's tired yeah. bodies around here. Um, quickly on Fiji. A win's a win, but very disappointing performance. Um, Taruva was great. Uh, Buller was great. Uh, but, yeah, you could tell they rocked up, thought they were just going to play them off the park. Yeah, yeah. That try that Buller scored, he's a freak. He's, fuck, he's so silky. 250 metres, I think he ran. And, uh, yeah, try just in everything. Um, Couple very of nearly a, another assist as well down the, the short side. He was... Um, He's uh, put a bit of lead in my pencil as a Tiger supporter. <laughs> for, uh, well, when he got that offload to score that try, though, like he still had to beat the fullback. Fullback never stood a chance. No. I don't care who it was at fullback, he was <laughs> beating him in that moment. No. And what about his uh, save as well, the try? Yeah. Um, defensively as well. Yep. Just um, does not give up. Uh, now, England defeat Tonga 22 18. Uh, just saw the extended highlights for this one, so it won't be too long. Um, mate, Tonga. Tonga might do them in the next couple of games. I obviously, I, I back Tonga to beat them in this match. Uh, <clears throat> if I'm being honest, I think England, again, look, this is just from extended highlights, guys, so I'm not going to pretend that, you know, I stayed up till fucking 12.30. I can go to life, boys. Come on. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You keep fresh for the cricket, mate. Mate, I wouldn't stay. <laughs> honestly, I'm not staying up till 12.30 to watch Australia versus someone, <laughs> like as in the Kangaroos versus. If the Kangaroos are playing the Kiwis, would you stay up to 12.30 and watch it? You know I would. You know, would you? Yeah. Would you? Oh, it depends on no it way. I'm waking up in the morning and I'm watching it. No, I'm no spoilers, no spoilers. And then I'd be watching it that way. Oh, 12.30. If, look, if it was like a World Cup final, maybe. But, jeez Louise, 12.30. That's a big shift. Big the shift. Rue. I, I can't watch a replay. Like, I I can't watch yeah, sport that's not live. Yeah, I can watch a replay. Rue would watch that twice and then put a podcast out um, <laughs> if it started at 12.30 by the time we got in here. Uh, no, I'd, I'd watch the replay because, like, it throws your whole day out. You're all tired and shitty and grumpy. I don't want to be grumpy, Matty. I don't want to be grumpy. But if I start watching a replay, I'm five minutes in. I'm like, fuck this. Two speed. Then I look at the score. I have, oh, to, really? watch it. I have to watch it live. Otherwise, I'm no, not watching it When I was over in uh, Europe and that, I watched a couple of replays. 
Um, but it was like an hour after um, the, the game. But yeah, I was, wasn't staying up for 12.30 to watch this. <laughs> uh, but as I said, in, uh, extended highlights. From, like, from the vibe that I got, if this wasn't played in England, I think that Tonga probably win. Yep. Um, you know, home ground advantage it is a thing. And I'm actually really excited for Tonga. I'm really excited. Yeah, I uh, I was a bit surprised with the team that Tonga selected uh, when I saw it. Uh, I was like, what the hell? Well, they did the same thing in the World Cup. Remember, after every game, we're going, why is Olukowatu playing for 30 minutes? Don't uh, I it. cannot work it out. Eli Katoa wasn't in the side. Um, Will Hopawade was at fullback over Cola, which I found strange as well. And um, yeah, I you know I, I think he's been fantastic for Tonga for a long time. Uh, but Lola here at 5'8 again. You finally got young halves. Just back him in, I reckon. Back him in, and like, wh- what do you have to lose? Really, like, okay, if you go to England, you get beaten. Like, who does? Is any is anyone that supports Tonga going? Oh, we're done. Yeah. Like, you're going. No, we're building towards the future. Yeah. Like, wh- what's the one thing that Tonga has been crying out for for how long? Finally, have it. Yeah. And I, I get it. You don't want to throw guys in too soon, but at the same time, it's like, look, you throw them in now. In two or three years, that they'll be rivaling Australia. And you know what? Like they're already playing Isaiah Kato there. Yeah. Like just ch- like oh, I thought it was interesting. Obviously, uh, Latu Fine who was in the squad. I thought he'd be the five eight. Then when he wasn't a five eight, I thought okay, he'll play fourteen. They actually went for the young bloke from South Sydney, Dion. Yeah. Do you remember the kid that carved up the trials? He had a trial for South Sydney at the start of the season at five eight. Who who'd you play, Matty? And he was in the, the New Charity South Wales Shield. Cup Grand Final as well at six. Uh, yes. Manly. Yeah, yeah. He he moves well. He moves yeah. well. Yeah. So. He was in front of um, Latu getting into the yeah, squad, which okay. is interesting. Okay. I mean, when you think about it, you go, well, we probably should be because he's playing in a grand final New South Wales mm-hmm. Cup. Um, it's just Latu fan who obviously has the bigger name because of the, the, yep. the articles and that. But, again, that's what's exciting for Tonga. Your forward pack sweet. Your back line sweet. You've got these – some of the – like those – all three of those guys are some of the most sought-after halves in the competition from all clubs. When was the last time you could say that about a Tongan squad where you're going, our halves aren't just good for – for you know, New South Wales Cup or Cougar, whatever. They're the most sought after in the competition by a lot of people. I thought Katoa showed a lot of maturity in the in the highlights that I saw. Um, England, on the other hand, look. What I like about England is the fact that even though they don't play as well as they may shoot, they they you think they could, they just somehow find ways to win, yep. and that's 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 a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Um, I thought, um, yeah. So look. I tell you what, listening to English commentators, oh. <laughs> bro. All I'm all I'm doing is going pl- like, please don't tell me Australian commentators are that bad. Like, please don't tell us. Like, and maybe we are. Maybe we are. Because that's what that's the first thing that goes to mind when I hear the English commentators. I'm like, are we that bi-? like are Australian commentators that biased? I'm like, surely we're not. Like, I listen pretty, mate. They are like, it is crazy how much they are pro England. No, I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I just don't. Not the like, commentators, just there. in sport. I honestly feel like they are uniquely like biased. Like for example, when I listen to the Kiwis game, and you hear the Ki- Kiwi commentary, yeah, they're a little bit biased to the Kiwis, but you're like, yeah, of course, like you know, like it's Kiwis. But like England, it is like red hot bias, <laughs> like crazy. Yeah. I, I think as well, it doesn't hurt that we're not not that we're, but like I think Australians in general constantly are putting the English game down. Yeah, okay. So I think they need to constantly feel like they're yeah, gotta lift it up. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just, I mean, you know, fancy the English commentators are uh, lowering the tone. They do it in every sport, so it's not unique to rugby league. But um, yeah, they are a tough listen. But um, I only watch the extended highlights as well. So the thing is, is like their their calls are good. But their bias is unbearable. Yeah. And I'm not like, do I look Tonga to you? No. <laughs> like, so I'm not sitting there going, oh, fuck, I, I Tonga all day, Tonga to the death. Like, I, I just, yeah, mate, I, fuck, it was tough, real tough. And I was just listening to frigging highlights. <laughs> Could you imagine the whole game? Um, but yeah, the good thing for England, I do think that they've got a really good um, core of a team here. They did without Herbie Farnworth. Uh, like, for how much of a separation there is between the NRL and the Super League, I actually think this English side is is not the separation between this English side and the Australian side isn't as big as the separation between the English and the Super League, uh, the NRL. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Um, Gaps closer. Yeah, yeah, which is which is a really good thing for England. I think they're building something quite nicely over there. I really do. No Dom Young as well. So a couple of players. Yeah, a couple of players out. Come back in. Uh, so I, I'm going to back Tonga to win. But what I can say is, how good is 
how exciting is this series going to be for Tongan and England fans? Because it wasn't a blowout. We're going to see probably close matches, we assume. And uh, yeah, I reckon Tonga win the next one. I hope so, but I would love to see Tonga take a few risks in the selection room. Yeah. Well, look quite on like just what is going on yeah. with that? Yes. Like, so what they started with... Like, if I'm England and I look at that team sheet and I know they're going to play Olokowatu for 30 minutes and they're not picking Eli Katoa, I'm going good as goal. Like, look, I get Tyson Brazil and Keon, I understand, but do you need to play Keon for 80 minutes? I also like, thought, you know, like, I think they picked um, Felice Kafusi at 13. I, I, that's a strange one for me. It's his defensive. Pick Keon at 13, yeah, oh, I yeah. would have gone with, and then get an Olakuatu on the edge or something. I think that's a defensive decision, yeah. like, just to shore up the middle, maybe. But I just think you've got to get Olakuatu on there more. Maybe you rotate him in your front row. Who was their front row on the bench? Like, it's a very good forward pack. Like, yeah, like, as I, I say, oh, you need Eli Katara in there. But you have a look at the pack they picked, and it is very strong. It's hard to leave those guys out. But <clears> just when you've got talented guys like Eli Katawa, Olakuatu, you've got to find minutes for him. Well, especially like Olakuatu, a lot of people had him in Team of the Year. The players had him in yeah. Team of the Year. So you'd think that you could find, like, when, when Keon's playing 80, you know, maybe drop that down to, like, 60 or something mm. to get, get him an extra 20 minutes. Because he got 28 minutes. Where is it? 28 minutes. The Dal- uh, the and they did it throughout the, every every yeah. game after the World Cup. We'd sit here and say the same thing. Why aren't they? Why isn't he Mate, being wh- also like? Why don't they think about playing him through the middle? Mm. Like he's definitely big enough for a front rower. Um, anyway, we'll see how we go. Uh, yeah, and I think probably think about putting Cooler at the back. I, you know, just I, building it towards like the a future. Seems like a no-brainer yeah. to me. Uh, and I, some of the defensive reads, like Lola Hila, there was one of the tries. His defensive read was just like, <laughs> like what the hell just happened? Um, yeah, anyway, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Now time to get into some transfer chat. Um, we won't go Brisbane Broncos first. We will go... What do you boys want to go? Brisbane Broncos? Oh, we'll go Brisbane Broncos first. Fuck it. Um, okay. I, like, just for it, I put this together. So it's just, it's just alphabetical. There's no rhyme or reason to the order. Just, yeah. so, just so everyone knows. Just relax. Relax, guys. <laughs> Relax. Brisbane Broncos is B. So now, obviously, the biggest player that is available to negotiate with um, other clubs is Ezra Mam. I think that you know, you look at Ezra Mam. Uh, he comes off contract 2024. He just come off a you know grand final heroics. Obviously, they didn't win, but we all know what happened there. Dally M six, uh, absolutely vital that they keep him uh, because you only have to go back two or three years. And it seems, honestly, it seems like another dimension where the Broncos didn't have any halves. Yeah. And so it is absolutely instrumental. They keep us from him. The only thing is, is that they're going to play a massive juggling act because if they go all in on Ezra Mam now, they probably lose Reese Walsh. So they're going to have to find a way to go, you know, how do we uh, massage this that we can keep enough for Reese Walsh when he comes off contract? Uh, boys, what do you reckon happens here? Yeah, the old saying, like a week's a long time in rugby league. Like when you guys won your prelim final, as your man was this young guy who we were interested to see how he'd go on the big stage. A week later, he is a Dally M580 of the year. And I don't know, is it fair to say one of the unluckiest guys not to win a Clive Churchill medal yeah. ever? Yeah. Crazy how much it can change. In his first year of fucking. Unbelievable. And even like, even when he got Dally M580 of the year, I sort of went, Okay. Yeah. Then I looked at the stats and went, "Holy fuck!" Yeah. What a season. Yeah, and I, it's it's a bit. I think I think it's the Reese Walsh effect to a degree, and also Adam Reynolds. It's kind of overshadowed him a little bit. But when you actually consider what he's done this year, he's come in as a half, in essentially his first full year of first grade, and taken him to a grand final, won a won a Dally M positional award, and you know, if he isn't playing against. Arguably the greatest seven of all time, and I know he's still got a long way to go, guys, but he may be that. He wins a Clive. But that's what he's done this year. Like that, and where I guess I don't really feel it's getting the appreciation that it deserves. I don't think it is at all. Like it's fucking mental. For a guy to score three tries in a grand final and it'd be spoken about very little, it just shows how much of a unique grand final that was. Yeah. Unbelievable. Any any hope of <clears throat> Uh, kind of for the Broncos are keeping him and Walsh together and then maybe you've got to take a hit on something like a halfback. Obviously, um, Adam Reynolds just got a couple of years to go still, um, getting a little bit older as well. Is there a way you can kind of balance that out, do you reckon? Or? Look, I think you can because they're so young. Yeah. I think that Ezra is a smart enough guy to know. And look, I, I understand that this is coming from a place where I 
obviously love the Broncos and I see all the opportunities the Broncos offer. So if you're a fan of another club, you're going, well, you know, look at the players at my club and look at the opportunities they get. But the way I see it is this, is that Ezra Mim is clearly an incredible player. He's only going to get better. So if he wants that huge contract, it's going to come. But at the moment, he's at the Broncos and you would say they're in a premiership window. Like they're, they're in, at least the next two years while Adam Reynolds is there, they're in a premiership window if everyone stays injury free. You don't want to take the huge contract now say you sign a three or four year deal with a lower tier club that's struggling then all of a sudden in that second and third year your form is not as good you're not you know you're not getting selected for origin because there's a lot of things to factor in for Ezra man like you know is he the next guy to take over from Munster when he retires you know does he need to be at a good club for that to happen or a club that is playing finals footy and I just think with a guy like Ezra the fact that he's he's what 20 years old now Anyway, I, th I think he's 20 years old. So he's 20 years old. <clears throat> Let's say he signs a two-year extension on a little bit less money than he's on right now. He gets to basically time it with Adam Reynolds so he knows what's going to happen in the future for the Broncos. He can time it also, take a little bit less in that two-year period, but he times it with Reese Walsh, and then he can look around and go, okay, Reese, Paddy, is, are we all together? Are we going forward? Um, so... Outside looking in, my advice would be to sign a shorter term deal with the Broncos because I'm so sure that this guy is, we're just scratching the surface. In four or five years, that huge contract will be there, I reckon. I think the biggest thing to your advantage as well as far as keeping these young guys is that you lost that grand final. Mm. Like yeah. that, that hunger is still there. Yeah. And to get, you know, if, I, if, if I'm Ezra Mam and Reese Walsh, I'm sitting there going, fuck, we got within a bee's dick of winning a grand final against arguably the greatest team we've ever seen. Mm. And it was our first finals experience. Yeah. Keeping that squad together, like if, I, if I'm Ezra, I am not even considering leaving there. Yeah, I think it'd be crazy. And, and I just think that there's other side of things like, you know, he, he's a young kid that, that, that he has that kind of it factor. So building your profile at such a big club. I mean, look at the difference of a, a Reese Walsh now. Like, and I understand they, well, you know, funnily enough, Warriors obviously nearly went as far as the Broncos, but look at the superstardom that Reese Walsh has reached. Now, I'm not saying that he couldn't have done that at the Warriors, but you know, being in an Australian-based league, the Broncos being the biggest club in the competition, like, you're building your base up pretty substantially in the early years as a guy like Ezra Man, and he's a highlight real player as well. Yeah, I see people in the comments that sort of, you know, get their back up, up at you for talking about Brisbane as that club, but they fucking are. Oh, mate, it's like, crazy. It's, it's mental. It's ridiculous. And Look at you, every stat. And you know what, Kevin, I reckon there would be a lot of young people, like, younger than me, that, like, maybe... Like Brisbane weren't the same club to them yeah. growing up, but mm. like Brisbane was the Hollywood of rugby league. Mate, it was it was exciting footy. Like they they were basically if you wanted to go and watch exciting, expansive footy and winning, mm. like they, the Brisbane Broncos were it. Now I understand uh, people are a bit younger. We've gone through a period where we haven't won a grand final in so long. So you might be like, "What do you mean powerhouse? Like you've done nothing in like 15, 20 years." But the, like, just look at the numbers. Like, no one comes close to the Broncos fan base, and I get it. We were a one-team state for a very long time, so I'm not saying the reasons for the like. If you put another club there, they wouldn't be big. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that with the environments being created, Broncos are the biggest club in the competition for sure. Like, just, and you, yeah, like like when I was growing up, like the Broncos were the Kangaroos, mate. Hundred percent. Like, if you weren't a rep player in that side, you were a rookie. Yeah. Like it's basically what it was. Like the only way I got a crack was because K. Um, was in origin yep. and we had Darius Boyd on the wing and on my debut like you know so that's that's the kind of level that they were working with and I think that we're not back at that level yet but I'm telling you what they're getting close they're getting close like, what was it I think it was like seven origin players for Penrith and I think like six or seven for the Broncos mm. um, in that grand final so the key is to lock Ezra Mam down but I think as I said I'm assuming the Broncos are going mate five-year deal let's let's get it done but, you know, my advice, and I'm, I love the Broncos, and, and, but as a young player and looking out for him, I would say, mate, take the two-year deal and then, and then uh, you know, assess your options. Yeah, re yeah. reassess in two years' time, see where you're at at Yeah, that because, like, yeah. look, you don't want a player there in three or four years' time, like Ezra Mam, killing it on massive unders and unhappy. I'd rather him, you know, get to that two-year mark and then he can renegotiate with the Broncos and maybe get the upgrade, or maybe he doesn't get the upgrade. You also, if I'm Ezra Ram, in two years' time, I do not want to be sitting watching finals footy, watching the Broncos oh. in a premiership. Couldn't think of anything worse. Oh, mate. Um, so I personally think he will stay. I think it'll be a two- to three-year deal. I don't think the Broncos have the, I guess, the 
they don't have the vision of their salary cap clear enough to be signing a guy like Ezra Mam on massive coin for five years because Reese Walsh is sitting there going like they've got Paddy Carrigan until 2028, Hass till 26, and Walsh till 25. So if he signs a two-year extension, it'll be to 26, the same as Haas. I think that's smart from it's smart from Broncos side as well. I really do um, because then they can reassess their options when uh, Reynolds decides to retire. What do you reckon, Amy? Yeah, well, I just reckon um, there's a couple here that I was going to ask you about, about how you feel about losing a couple of guys as well mm. um, in, in your squad. <coughs> Herbie Farnworth, centre of the year. Um, Flegler, obviously, um, in the Kangaroos squad. And, and Palacia playing test footy as well. Like Some big names out of your pack there. And then, obviously, Farnworth in the centres. <coughs> like, if you've got a couple of guys coming through who you feel can um, replace them, because uh, you obviously haven't gone out and, and bought too many other players. Yeah, so we, I do think the Broncos are pretty close to being back to the stage where they were confident in filling roles again. Yep. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that Herbie won't be missed. He absolutely will be. Yep. Um, but when you've got guys like Dean Mariner, signed until 2027, uh, Deleuze Horder, signed until 2024, uh, you know, Corey Oates on a player option. I think outside back-wise, Dean Mariner, he is, he is fucking special. Is he going to be immediately as good as Herbie Farnworth? Maybe, maybe not. But does he have the ability to be eventually as good as Herbie Farnworth? I do think so. I do think so. Now, does that mean he's going to be? No, not does not mean. But does he have the the physical attributes, all that kind of stuff? I do think he has the potential to be as good as Herbie. I think as well, you know, it's probably not the move I would make, but, you know, just in the guys you have got, like, you could play Sean Cobble at left centre if you wanted absolutely, to. Absolutely, absolutely. So I, I don't see it being – like, I, I, as you said, can be Herbie is going to be a huge loss, but I think the Broncos are in a spot to be able to cover it. I think Flegler will be the yeah. more interesting one. That's a tough one because it goes Flegler and Palacia. Yeah. So you're losing two big boppers that are heading into their best part of their careers. Um, I think also Flegler is a really unique one because he offers such a point of difference. Like, is there a front row that really plays like Flegler? I, I don't think there is that late footwork, that offload, but he also can get through the tough stuff as well. Decent motor. So it's going to be really hard to 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 replace Flegler. But we've got guys like Azeva Willison coming through. Um, we've got guys like, oh, another outside back that I'm not sure if we're going to re-sign him, but Tristan Saylor is also an outside back. We do have some really good young forwards. The, I guess the key will be, are they ready to, to fill the void yet? Mm. Now, they they will be in two to three years, but will they be next year? I don't know. Well, the sure. other thing is when you're filling that role of Tom Flegler, like there's been rumours around that Paddy Carrigan could just turn into a genuine front rower, Kobe Hetherington into the 13 role, uh, which I'm a little <coughs> bit iffy just because I love Pat Carrigan in the 13 so yep. much. But once again, that would solve a lot of those issues if it yeah. does work out. Yeah. It's just that I think it's that big body like that, that was what was so scary about that Broncos pack was like you've got that – it's a three-point of attack of like Haas, um, Carrigan and Flegler coming at you. It's almost like, fuck, how do you stop that? Whereas when you go Paddy and Haas up front, like incredible, arguably best front row comp in the you know, competition behind maybe Fisher and uh, Leota. And then you've got Kobe Hetherington who is a butt, like gets through a bunch of work, quality ball player, but he's a little bit smaller and probably not as intimidating. But I agree with you, that would solve a lot of problems. And, and I agree there, like if you were to start with the, those two boys in the front row, Haas and Carrigan, you know, it's going to be enough to dominate 13 teams in this competition, but it's going to be against the Panthers and these yep. sort of teams where you're going to really feel that loss. Because you go, okay, get to a grand final again, you're up against Leota, Fisher, Yo. And so it's just that. Whereas I think uh, Carrigan, Haas, Flegler, you go, mate, I'll back that against anyone. I know Panthers won, but I'd back them against anyone. Um, the other so one I think that you've got there, mate, that I re- Xavier Willison, there is just something there. I, I love it. I, th- I think he's going to be good. Yeah. I think he's going to be good. I-, I love – it's all the small things I like about Willison. It's the, the little 1% areas. If you watch his game closely, yes, he is a – physical specimen like huge boy very young but the effort areas I, I think he's going to be special the other one too like obviously marty played the vast majority of the season and it was like the back end of the season he just fell off the radar well, he got suspended season. of course yeah right with that jeez he did a job for so long oh absolutely i think, absolutely. I think people are sleeping on how effective he was as yeah. well yeah for sure we've got jensen point. as well so it, it's going to be really interesting to see how that works out um oh another outside back i didn't even talk about jesse arthurs he can play center yeah um Grand final, nearly a grand final bloody hero. Proper grand final hero. He was unbelievable. Uh, We've also got, I I forgot his name, but apparently there is a young front rower that is 
massive and a uh, gun. He was just injured last year. I think that might be Takura. Is that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. But we watched in the trials last year. It was very impressive. He's a mountain. Yeah, huge boy. Like bigger than Payne Haas, and they reckon he's got a fair mode on him too. So, so I do think that the Broncos are in a, a position of filling, refilling the stocks. It's just, will it be this year or will it be next year that they refill the stocks? Is there yep. a scarier sentence than bigger than Payne Haas? Or oh what? my god. Right, and, and that that came to me on when I was at the captain's run. I was speaking to some of the, the Broncos staff, and they're like, "Mate, you should see this guy. He is like seriously special, seriously yeah. special." Um, but yeah, Ezra Mam is the key. To be honest, Ezra Mam and Reese Walsh are the key. If you can sign them now, like re-sign them now, the earlier it gets done, the better that it'll lay our salary cap out for the, the planning of the future. The concern is if you sign Ezra Mem now and Reese Walsh comes out and goes to another level next year, like let's say let's say Reese Walsh this next season comes out, plays exactly the same, but he has way le- like fifty percent of the errors. Errors, then you're going fuck. This guy might be worth fucking one point five million dollars in the new salary cap. Yeah. Um, and like I know that sounds crazy, but you, guys, you got to remember it's a new salary cap, and we're talking about Reese Walsh who puts bums on seats. It's the Kalen Ponger effect. I mean, KP is currently on one point four million dollars in the salary cap. Um, so if you can somehow get that deal done now, because as you said, if you're at the negotiation table and you go, boys, we were this close, if we stick together, we can win a comp, maybe that can get the deal across the line for both players. Um, we, we'll talk about it when it comes, but obviously the Adam Reynolds situation um, is, it needs to be sorted sooner rather than later of what direction do we head in? You know, is he here for 2025 or do we go out and recruit a guy to come through? Um, and just quickly before we move on, saw Tyson Smoothie 2023. Wonder whether they re-sign him or they're going, you know what, Blake Moser is going to be the guy next year at 14 or 9, either one. Yeah, I... Because I thought he was great towards the end of the year. I thought it may. And when they first picked him, I said on the show, I couldn't believe they were picking him. Yeah. I just couldn't see the sense in it. But he was great towards the back end of the season. Uh, but I do still think Moser could be generational. Sort of yeah, guy. I just th- there's just something about the way he moves out of hooker that he just has that bit of class, and it's not you're not sitting there going, oh, that's the next Harry Grant, very different player, but he just has this time about him. He almost like the way that he moves out of hooker, he almost he almost doesn't look like a hooker sometimes. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's almost like a, it's, it's like a big five eight. Yes, I yeah. saw him at the captain's run. I was like, Jesus Christ, you're tall. I didn't say that, but and like when you see him in highlights and everything, and he's not scooting from dummy half, and he's just in free play. I don't think you'd ever pick he's a hooker. Yeah, no way, no way. Um, but yeah, he's he's a quite a big hooker. Which is if he can play, which is like scary when you think about it, because you go when he feels out, if he can play substantial minutes, he could be snapping blokes in the middle because he's not a small a little fella. Um, but I guess that's the, the trade-off we've always had. To be a hooker, you've got to be a, a little fella because you've got to get through the work. But that's where, like, it could end up really good for you guys that if Moser comes into his own in two years' time, you could have a star hooker on your hands for unders and then go into the market for a halfback mm. who wants to play with Reese Walsh. Yeah. Like, you, it's yeah, exciting. I, I reckon it's all going to line up really nicely mm. for you. And I, look, and look, let's say Moser does come out and kill it. I think Walters is the perfect 14. Yeah. Like, you couldn't ask for a better 14. Uh, so, yeah, I think, okay, let's say Ezra Mam, does he stay how many years? Oh, I think he will sign a three-year contract. Well, you sold me on the <laughs> two, basically. Okay. But um, he's, he'll stay. Yep. Matty? Yeah, he'll stay for sure. How much? Now? Yeah. Uh, for two? Yeah. Eight fifty. Yeah, I reckon eights. Yeah, I was gonna say probably seven fifty. Okay, I reckon he stays two year deal, probably six fifty. Six. Oh, I reckon he'll do a, the club a favour. Yeah, yeah, I reckon he'll do the club a favour. I think so. I think he'll sign for unders. They'll get him some. Well, he'll get some third party deals, um, and yeah, like I mean, he's so marketable. He's so marketable as a young kid. And this is like, guys, I don't have any inside information. I don't know what the fuck's going on with the Broncos, but my my opinion would be. You sit down with Ezra Mam and Reese Walsh and you go, basically, you, you negotiate whatever and then you say to their managers, mate, go out and find them a deal. Because, like, those two together as a package deal would sell fucking squillions of whatever you need to sell. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's so obvious. Um, sure, surely he, he's a guy too. That he must have his eyes on that Queensland number 14 jersey. Like ben Hunt's not going to play forever. Harry Grant will be the starting nine. I'd, he'd be my tip to me. Mate, I can... 
fuck, I can see it in my mind's eye in four or five years, that six jersey on his back for Queensland, it just feels right. It feels right. Um, yeah, so I reckon he stays for about 600, 650, two-year extension. So that will see him till 26, which will be the same time as Haas coming off. And, and obviously, I hope his manager gets him some uh, good third parties because right now he's like one of the hottest properties in the, the game. Before we move on them, um, Fletcher Baker, what are your thoughts? I tell you what, I am really interested because Fletcher Baker kind of struggled at the Roosters. Yep. He's coming to the Broncos, and this will be a really good, I guess, litmus test of litmus test of not not have the Roosters lost their magic. I'm not saying that at all. More of the argument have the Broncos found their magic again, because he's a guy that's not you know didn't really go that well at the Roosters. He went okay, went solid. Whereas the last few years, the Broncos almost lost their magic a bit. They had players that were underperforming at the Broncos, where it was the, always the opposite. You go to the Broncos, you friggin' play Origin. That used to be the deal. And so that's what I'm really interested to see with Fletcher Baker. I don't know. I don't even know if he's sealing his origin. I'm just saying, does Fletcher Baker go and kill it? And that will be a really good sign. And again, it's not. I'm not saying Roosters have lost their magic. What I'm saying is, is have Broncos refound their magic, where they can take a guy from another club that wasn't going as well as we would, put him in this superstar system, and they go really well. I'm really interested to see how he goes because they went hard to get him. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I don't think the Roosters would have been too keen to lose him. Like. Mm. He's got a lot of potential. Young forward, they need for, like they need middles because Hargrew is going to be gone eventually. Lindsay Collins obviously plays for Queensland. Like, I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't have been that happy letting him go. I, I guess the only thing that you could say in the Roosters' favour would be that they've got Terrell May, Spencer Lenu, mm. a number of other guys there. But yeah, I, I think he's going to be a really interesting guy to watch because Brisbane went hard to get him. Yep. Uh, yeah, can't wait. Now on to the Bulldogs. A bit here. <laughs> Holy heckers. Okay. <laughs> okay. So basically, they've lost Avrilo, Flanagan, Alamotti, Thompson, Brown, Ockenbaugh, Reynolds, Clark, Davey, and Pele. Gaines, obviously, Critter, Salmon, Taff, Zeri. Um, in regards to recruitment, unfortunately, they're still down a seven. Yep. Unfortunately, they are desperate for a seven. Uh, and when you look in the market, she's not heavy on sevens. She's not heavy on sevens. I do think Stephen Critter's, um, his class will be really helpful, um, but I still don't see them next year playing for honest footy. Uh, and obviously we'll go deep dive into the previews, but they're desperate for a seven, and I think that they need to begin to either move heaven and earth to bring one to the club, or go into juniors and get a seven. Like, for example, even the, um, oh my God, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. Even a guy like Oluapu. Almost a bit of a strange signing now that you look at it, because you go, yeah, he can be the 13, but they moved heaven and earth to get him out of his Broncos contract, tried him at seven, put him back in reserve grade. Now it's you're hearing whispers that he's a 13. The Bulldogs, and I'm sure there is a plan, but outside looking in, they need to make a decision with this halves situation in their spine and go forward. They can't afford to go into this new year going, who might be our seven, he might not be our seven, he's a 13. They need to make, like look what happened to the Knights. Like it can stuff your recruitment up for years. I think that around the seven role is where they need to make a really hard and firm decision. It has stuffed their recruitment. We're having this conversation about Avarillo two yeah. years ago. Yeah. It's exactly what is played out again. Uh, and look, halfbacks aren't easy to get, and I understand that, but you can have as good a forward pack, as good as back line as you want. Have a look at these competition teams that have won comps over the last few years, teams that have been relevant over the last few years, teams that have come from nowhere to be relevant. Mm. What have they all got in common? Yeah. Good halfbacks. Yeah. Yep. You have to get it sorted. Mm. Yep. And at the moment, I look at their squad and I'm not seeing it. And you know what? Like, I I look at their um, losses. I said it a few weeks ago. There is not a single player on that list of losses that I think Canberra are going to get the best out of next year anyway. Yeah. Realistically. Yeah, yeah true. And, and when you look at their recruits, like, you know, Critter obviously stands out as a huge, huge recruit. Um, but outside of that, are they, are they the recruit, recruits they brought in, are they bring you into a top eight kind of recruits? No. No. At the moment. Now, if Bronzeri come, Bronson Zeri comes out and kills it and, you know, Taff or Salmon, yeah, fair enough. But at the moment, I just... 
my concern is is that that number seven role has just been haunting them for what five years you reckon yeah and the rest yeah and it's just got to get sorted yeah got to get sorted so uh, yeah i look at this canterbury side you know it's a good pack it's good outside backs but without the halfback it's like the old you know they've got a lot of icing they don't have the cake though mm. yeah you need to go get your cake well, they're all outside backs basically apart from salmon that they've gone and got so mm. i don't know that wasn't really probably an issue for him um yeah it's been a seven sexton is the guy that will roll out sexton's a decent player yeah there's something there for sure yeah um but yeah interesting to see now a couple like obviously quite a few losses there out of the, the squad um Serraldo, probably first year that he's able to make a few calls and start to put the squad together that he wants to see so i've had sort of hopes always kind of eyes light up when you see the price for dogs to make the eight at the start of the season you go well they've got a few good few good ins every year but maybe uh with his first chance to put a bit of a stamp on it and his own spin on it maybe um you know Serraldo, well, they'll certainly be hoping the doggies fans will be hoping that this is the year they can get in there. I don't know that it is, though, well, to be honest. Yeah, the concern is, is like Sexton, and I, I agree, I, we all spoke about Sexton of yeah. underrated, absolutely can do a job, but he's off contract next year. Yeah. So, again, that's that idea of, is Sexton really their man? Yeah. Is he the guy they've gone, you know, because what if Sexton comes out and kills it, and they've got no salary cap space, and Sexton goes, see ya. Um, and that, that's what I guess is, look, Seraldo and Gus Gould, they're, they're rebuilding a roster right now. So they're, they, this has inherited this really unbalanced, I guess, almost directionless roster. And you just have to go back to Avrilo playing seven. And we're all huge fans of Avrilo, but it's almost put the club back. Fucking, it's like we're still seeing the knock-on effect of forcing Avrilo to play seven instead of going, this guy is not a seven, he's an outside back, I need to go into the market. And, and Sexton obviously will start there. Uh, but you've got Oluwap, who is signed until 2026, and we're still unsure as to what his position is. So that's that's a conflicting vibe I get in this this roster. Is like, so this young, incredible superstar initially was signed as the seven or six. I, I mean, I never thought he was a seven. I thought he was a six. Um, you've got Matty Burton, also a six, definitely not a seven. I mean, some would even argue centre, but I just think he just had a quiet year or a not, a, not a great year. Um and so this, yeah, this seven direction, it just, it feels like it's going to haunt them for a while until it's un- like just sorted. Yeah. And I mean, there are a number of positions like, I mean, I go back to the preseason this season. Mate, every, everyone under the sun that had anything to do with Canterbury was telling you how good Hayes Perrin was going to be. Mate, you, you, if you suggest him as a potential fullback next year, people laugh at you now. Mm. I mean, we never, we critter. never, we never saw it. Yeah. I, I don't, but I don't know. I just, it just seemed like a bit of a, um, just a club lacking direction at the moment. Well, I think they're, they're a club that's clearly, you know, I think Gus Gould has identified, look, we cannot band-aid these problems anymore. We need to just fully reset. And it looks like they're fully resetting because like, even their forward pack, massive raps are getting pressed until 2027. I thought that's a great 100%. re-signing. Yep. And you probably got him for less than what he's worth because <clears throat> I'd be shocked if he doesn't win a Dallium back row of the year at some stage over the next few years. But you look at their... You know, where's the experience in the forward pack? You know, just like a real hard-nosed kind of fringe of at least origin kind of forward. I, I don't really see it. I, yeah. And that's where, you know, the the Bulldogs would obviously point out that, you know, TPJ didn't work out, Luke Thompson hasn't worked out, and I think they're better without those two guys. But they need to find a real <coughs> alpha in that pack. I mean, it wasn't that long ago Raymond Fatale Mariner was made captain of the club. And he seemingly couldn't get into the side. Yeah, he signed till 25 as well. And there's, you know, clearly been issues well, there. If we were sitting here and news broke that he'd join another club, it wouldn't shock me. No, nah, not at all. Um, just quickly as well, Kiraz, great re-signing, I think, as well. Huge. Yeah. Huge re-signing. So, look, in regards to transfers and that, Critter is the main, the main guy that we're talking about. Um, I guess the worry I have with Critter coming in there is we've, saw, we've seen Burton go there. We've seen Kikau go there. Adokar, to an extent, he did actually play some quite good footy when he arrived. But, you know, even Reed Marnie, all these top-tier players that have gone there have not played to their ability. And I guess that's the, the worry you have with a guy like Critter is that he arrives there, the environment's not as good. Now, Soraldo gets another year, so obviously it be a bit better. But that is a little bit of the concern, that the top-tier players aren't even playing well. Yeah, and the, the tough thing is with Stephen Crichton that, you know, 
reality is he could have an eight out of ten year. People are still going to bag him because it's not going to be hitting oh, the ceilings yeah. that he has the last yeah. few years. So that's yeah. what makes it really, <clears throat> really hard with Stephen Crichton. Um, but that's you know the reality of the situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's going to cop it no matter no matter what happens there, in my opinion. Uh, but I think it's such a good get for them. Oh, mate. Could you imagine them heading into the issue without, without Greer? Him? Like, what, what are we talking yeah. about? Yeah, <laughs> and that's like all these people are like, oh, he's a centre, he's a centre. And like, guys, okay, in the Penrith Panthers or the top four sides or top six sides or whatever, he's a centre. We're dealing with a Canary Bulldogs that are desperate for a top tier, elite level player. And we're talking origin, international, in their spine that's going to like... A game breaker. Going to do something. Yeah. Um, and so... It is the jury's still out as to whether he, he will win that fullback position. I mean, I, I think they'll start him there no matter what, but whether he'll thrive there. But at least like going into the off season, he can have a full preseason training there. Yeah. And I think he'll he is the kind of athlete that if you give him long enough, he'll find a way to make that position his own. And I, you know, I, I have a lot of Canary fans who message me saying, "Oh, you know, we need a Stephen Crichton. We need him in defence on that edge." And, it's a fair argument, but you don't spend this much money getting oh. a superstar to shore up an edge in defence. No, you do not. <laughs> no. You go out and fucking, you buy David Stagg. You shore up an edge in defence, you'll go from 15th to 13th. You get Staggy out there. David Stagg, the great Staggy. Uh, Battlers like that. <laughs> um, yeah, you don't, this guy, he is a top tier signing. And I got a bit of pushback when I said that he does have the potential to be a real charismatic star of the game. Um, and uh, yeah, people are like, oh no, he's really quiet in that. Go look at some of those Samoa fan days. Doing, dancing on stage in that. <laughs> he loved it, didn't he? He loved that it. It was great. Yeah. Um, Get him in here for face the music. Yeah, mate, Critter, come in, mate. Yeah. Bit of face the music. Um, yeah, look, the, the key is is just this spine. In it. So it's the seven role, which I hope Sexton ends up being that guy. And it's a grizzled front rower that I think they really need to sort out. Yeah. No, I think. Um Seeing Bronson return, God, I'm so intrigued. Kind of be interesting. <laughs> I, I think, like, you know, he, he, he's done his crimes, served his time and all that. But, like, I think people forget that yeah, when he fell out of the game, he was on his way to play for the Kangaroos, in my opinion. He, he, there was chat around Origin. Yeah. There was chat, like, only chat, but there was still chat. There was still chat. Um, I, I, he's, he is quite bulky right now. Mm. I do think he's going to have to – Drop a, few, a bit of muscle mass. I also, I, I've watched him um, train a few times. I, I don't think he's as big when you see him in person as he looks in some of those photos. Okay. Oh, think, you reckon he's a bit, a bit of Yeah, a bit of airbrushing. Oh, I just think they're, you know. Angled, angled well. They're, yeah. they're, they're using their best picks for those articles. You know what else? He's also, he's lost his beak. He changed the beak. He doesn't have the beak anymore. Ah. Really? Yeah, he's good looking now. <laughs> Shit. Not enough muscle mass in there. Hey, well, you no, know no. what? For all the big beaks out there, I'm staying strong, baby. I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it. In a, in a nutshell, uh, message for Doggies fans, Denon. Look, a bit of zen this year. A bit of zen. Uh, a bit of meditation might help you. <laughs> maybe if you have anxiety, maybe yep. just take some magnesium. Yep. Or you can stay patient. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above. All of the above. Yeah. yeah. Look, it's this club is in a clear rebuild. They need to be in a rebuild. Um, they, I think you're going to see the results, not this coming year, maybe not even the next year after that, but I think the year after that, you may start to see some, um, like, look, next year I don't think they make the eight. The year after that, they might squeeze into the eight, but I think the year after that, because didn't their Jersey flag side win Guru? Uh, yeah, they did win. They beat the Roosters in the grand final. And so what does that remind you of? The Penrith Panthers, yeah. you know. Yeah, the New South Wales Cup team also led for the first half of the competition. They fall off a cliff in the back end. I'm not sure what happened there, but <coughs> I think I think uh, in the New South Wales Rugby League, they give out an award for like the most consistent club throughout all the grades. I mm. think Canterbury won that. So, yeah. yeah. So it's like I understand frustration as um, Bulldogs fans. Look, you don't need to take it out on me. I'm I'm not the fucking CEO. I'm not the coach. You don't need to get angry at me that your club's not going well. But I understand the frustration. All jokes aside, I understand the frustrations. And I would also understand the frustrations if we were telling you to stay patient when there was no evidence that it's going to get better. Yeah. But at the moment, with the information that we have, which is was leading the New South Wales Cup for most of the year or a lot of the year, winning jersey flag, we're in the most consistent club. There is evidence to suggest that in two to three years, we will see a competitive top eight side. Look at the Sharks. Like, you don't even need to use the Panthers. If, if you want to sit here and say, the Panthers are an exception to the rule, what they've done. Look at the Sharks. 
two years before they went on their run or they you know came second go and look at that Newtown grand final yeah it's pretty much that whole like it's honestly whole squad. it's yeah. pretty much the whole squad yeah um so there is evidence to suggest that not next year but the year after they may start to those young guys will be coming through becoming first graders and then the year after that boom and if you are looking for something to get excited about canary fans go and watch that jersey fleet grand final because uh Oluwapu was a step above what, what position did he play six or seven six i think it was six yeah but some of the stuff he did was just i reckon he'll end up at 13. i do too uh but i think he'll start his career in the halves yeah okay okay and what do you do with maddie burton then seven or six? no idea can be yeah <laughs> Not paid enough. It's such a, that's yeah. what I mean. It's such a weird yeah. situation. Because because like the report was he left the Broncos because they said that we want you to play 13. And he was like, nah, not keen. So it's almost like. It's you, a weird situation that. It's hard to get a read on what's. Yeah, like because yeah. you can't put him at six. Because then Matty Burton, well, you put Matty Burton back out at centre maybe. Yeah. But then he's on, I'm sure he's on a decent wicket. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to work out that one. Okay. Anything else on the doggies transfer wise they could bring in? No. No. As I said, guys, I think for these specifically this Bulldogs um, squad, it's less about the band aid solution of just going in the market, big clean out, even though there's been, you know, a few losses. And it's more about the long game of let's build some foundation here and bring some people through. There was just one more thing. The preseason last year, there was two guys that everyone at Canterbury was raving around. The first one was Jacob Preston. The other one was Chris Patolo, and he got injured at the okay. very start of the season. He didn't get to play much footy last year. I know they're very keen on him again this year, so just keep an okay. eye on him too. Okay. Um, now, on to the Cowboys. Uh, Gaines Valia from the Warriors. So I hope I'm saying that right, Valia. Uh, Jake Clifford from Hull. Not much transfer um, chat around the Cowboys. And remember, guys, this is not a preview of a squad or a review of a squad or whatever. This is transfer chat. Um, I guess if you wanted to talk about transfers and how it can affect them, it'd be a guy like Dearden, who is currently off. Uh, a, a, he can uh, negotiate with, con uh, with other clubs. I'm trying to find his name here. Where the hell is he? Right. Oh, he's down there. So, yeah, so he comes off contract uh, 2024. He can negotiate with other clubs. I mean, it is absolute – it's almost club-defining that they re-sign this guy. If they don't re-sign Dearden, I am extremely worried about the, the Cowboys. Yeah, he's a uh, build-a-club around guys yeah. for a yeah. long time to come. Um, you know, you obviously mentioned Ezra Mam, potentially wearing that 5'8 jersey for Queensland soon. I think you'd have something to say about it, Tommy Dearden. I see Dearden as a seven. I really do. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I guess that. But I, I know that what you seven mean. jersey will become available. Well, Dearden's freaking played it and killed yeah. it. So it's like he's he's definitely ahead of him because mm. he's played it and killed it. So you're right. Yep, you're right. Yeah, I, I love. I think it's such a great story that he was unwanted at Brisbane when they were in their darkest hour. He's come up to the Cowboys and just absolutely killed it. Yeah, it's so impressive. And the, the once again, you talk about the influence of halfbacks and how important they are. How different would his career be if he didn't land next to Chad Townsend? Mate, it's. It's honestly shocking when you think about a guy as good as him that can go in his Orange and debut and do what he did. He uh, maybe not been lost to the game, but maybe he spent some time in Super League and comes back because I think he's too good to not come back. But, geez, there was a period there where you're going, mate, is he even going to kick on? Yeah. And if he didn't, you could completely understand. Yeah, because everything that he went through. Yeah. Like um, if you would have said two years ago that Jake Clifford and uh, Dearden are at the Cowboys, who's the... The main ball player. Mm. You would have bet Clifford. Yeah, for sure. All money in the world. So do you reckon the Clifford being brought back in is thinking Dearden may play a lot of first grade or it's is Townsend's going to retire or? Yeah, I, I reckon Chad's, I don't know, the, the more I, I look at Chad Townsend, like he's a great player and he'll, he'll fill a role there. He'll do well to his role. But I, I just think Chad's, I think you can see off field, I think he's starting to turn his attention elsewhere mm. as well and, and plan for after <coughs> footy. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if this is Chad's last year. How long has he signed on for? Mm. How many years? 20, ago? 3, 24. Yeah. I, I reckon this will be the swan song, Chaddy Townsend this year. Yeah, okay. Because, yeah, it was, he's off. Yeah. I, I don't think they'll re-sign him. I mean, there was chat mid-year, or not mid-year, but at some points in this year where they were talking about, well, some people were talking about that maybe they were looking for a swap, the Cowboys, for Townsend. Mm. Um, he's a balancing act, though, because, you know, Jake Clifford, is he a seven or is he a six, you know? It's, it's a tough... I don't think Jake Clifford knows yet. Yeah. With you. I think he can play both at a pretty high click, but I think for the good of Jake Clifford, he needs to 
settle on one of them, and maybe you just settle on the other one that Tom did and it's not. Yeah. It's it's tough though because they got to make a pretty substantial decision because how you sign did and kind of judges as to what you'll do elsewhere. So for example, let's say you go, all right, Dearden, we believe you are you can be a seven and you're going to lead the club for the next 10 years. You sign him on a fucking five-year deal and just lock him up. And and then you sign a, a six that, or you bring a rookie in that can just do what it needs to be done. Almost like what they did with Ezra Mann coming through with Reynolds, just yep. this young gun coming through, Dearden leads the boys around. But if you're going to say, no, no, Dearden is a six, well, A, that brings the contract down. Um, and B, you need to go out and sign a, a seven on fairly big wicket. So it's like it's a tough it's, market, to mate. It's it's yeah. honestly like it's club defining stuff. Yeah, club defining is. stuff. What do you reckon, Hammy? I was going to say uh, sh- shout out Jake Granville getting re-signed as well. 30, oh, the great Jake Granville! By, by the time the season rolls around, to be thirty-five years young, Jake right. Granville as well. Um, wonder what the one of the sort of role he sort of will play there next year. Probably um, I can't see him playing too much of a. I wouldn't have thought. Probably like off the bench as a, not even a utility, as a like a front rower sometimes. Played just everything this year. Yeah, he played everywhere. And in the front rower, he did really well. Yeah. Um, talk about earning a contract. Geez, he, he does not stop. Yeah. He works his ass off. And truly one of the real unsung heroes of the 2015 run for yeah. the Cowboys. Like real unsung hero. Yeah. There's a real argument that he was the best on the field that night mm. in that grand final. Yeah. He was tremendous in that game. One of the great mop tops in the comp as well. Oh, yeah. So good to see the mop going around again for another year. Mate, bring mops back. Yeah. Bring them back. Uh, but yeah, back with the Tommy Dearden situation. If you're, okay, because right now, and we'll get to Jerome Luai, but right now we've got Mam, Luai, and Dearden in the market. Is that, do you think that's putting pressure? Do you think that's making it? better for the Cowboys because there is a few sixes there. What, what do you reckon? How do you reckon that affects the Cowboys' ability to re-sign a guy like Dearden? I think it probably helps. Mm. I, I also just think that, you know, the, sim, similar to Ezra Mann with the Broncos, the Broncos have got such an advantage there that they've taken him in when he's young and helped mm. him to get to where he is. And the Broncos, they backed Tommy Dearden when no one else would. Mm. Like the Brisbane Broncos weren't backing Tommy Dearden. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard two so, like conflicting – I've heard – one side saying he just didn't want to be paid, like he didn't want to wait to mm-hmm. become the main person. But then obviously, outside looking in it, it genuinely looked like the Broncos just weren't interested. Week to week, it looked to me like they weren't interested. Yeah, yeah. So, but you're right. Like, from a Cowboys perspective, they're sitting there going, mate, the cl- like they didn't even want you. We gave you a shot. Yep. We stuck by you. You're playing Origin. So, there is a fair bit of loyalty, the loyalty card they could probably play to him, even though, you know, People like to say loyalty's dead. It's, it really isn't. These, it's used all the time in contract negotiations of like, look what we did for you and, you know, we built you up, gave you opportunity, look how good your life is right now. Um, and look, to be, to be fair, you could say there's an argument that they did stick with Deirdre. And I mean, even when he did arrive at the Cowboys, he struggled massively, massively. I personally, I can't see him leaving. It's just going to be a matter of, is he going to be re-signed as the seven for the next whatever years? or the six the next few years. And maybe that's where the negotiation... Because like, it's a bit surprising it hasn't been locked up already, mm. I'm being honest. That may be the... I, I might be shooting a blank here and I can't see him here, but it, um, Tom Duffy's the other one, the young fella. I think he played in the trials last year. I rate him very high. He's in the re-signed list, but I can't see him down the road. Re-signed until 2025. He's another ball player that I think um, could have a big impact over the next few years. So is he Was he a fullback? Did he play fullback in a trial? Uh, he might have, but I've seen him play halfback most like of the time. Number seven? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, you, you might be right. He might have played in that trial at the start of the year at fullback. Fullback. Yeah. Um, he's a very handy player. I really rate him. Very young, obviously, uh, but all these guys have got to start somewhere. And I think sometimes with some of these Cowboys juniors, you don't hear much out of the Cowboys. Yeah. So far away, you're mm. just a little bit out of sight, out of mind. But from what I've seen of him, I really, really like Tom Duffy. You know what's crazy is like, you know, we see these, like, a lot of, like, uh, rugby league fans, they just assume anyone that's playing first grade must be on a great wicket, killing it. Finny Fuaki is a development list player. Yeah. Tom Chester's who you're thinking about. Tom Chester, yep. okay. Yep. okay. Dudes, yep. But, um, yes, um, <laughs> to me, when he played, he looked unbelievable. Yeah. Fuyaki. Yeah. If I'm looking for an edge back rower, like, you could get him for – I'm sure there's some clubs offering three or four hundred thousand dollars for him because he's a freaking development list player right now. 
crazy. Well, mate, the other one I spoke about him in the pre-season, it's so sad to see in their losses um, released, is Taniela Sadrugu, which kind of looks like Sad Guru, which is how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, really? He was incredible in that trial against the Dolphins. I, I don't know what the story is. I don't know what's happened, but fuck, you could do much worse than to throw him a top 30. Contract oh, early, in man, opinion. surely another club's going to give him a training trial. Well, yeah, I, I think he normally plays for Fiji. He obviously didn't play in that game yesterday either, and they had a number of injuries, so I don't know if there's more to that. Uh, maybe Matty says if he can find anything, but um, I really like him. That's, um, I mean, it, it must be. Literally anywhere in the team. It must be, you know, training in that. Like, it's got to be an attitude thing. A guy with that much physical gift... Yeah, I don't know what it is, but like he could literally, like there'd be weeks in Q Cup where he'd play centre, then he'd play front row. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Super very talented surprising. guy. Definitely, definitely worth a crack. He's a little bit older, isn't he? Like, yeah. Yeah. Very super. Because, like, when I watch that trial, I was like, this guy is amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. All right, guys. Tommy Dearden. Does he stay how many years? Mate, I hate to be so boring, but I reckon all these 5'8s stay at their clubs. Okay, well, don't give the spoilers around. You really <laughs> just spoil the whole episode. We haven't got to the big fish yet. Um, Dearden, stay for how long? Uh, yeah, I think you'll stay for t- two to three years. I reckon stay five years. I reckon he's a gun. There's not that many out there. We've been speaking about it. And so many clubs need a good half. There's not that many out there. You've got to look after a bloke who's been so good. Stepped up when he's needed to step up. Played at Origin Decider. Filled in. Yep. Debut. Killed that game. Killed it. Um, yeah, and I reckon he's ready to make that switch to seven as well and just like run the show. Mm. Absolute gun. So I reckon he stays and on a significant long term. Yep, I'm with you. They'll build this club for the next five, six years around Drinkwater, yeah. Robson and Dearden. He'll stay yeah. for sure. I reckon five-year deal, uh, five-year extension, uh, and I think that he, he, they will eventually slot him into that seven role. Um, that'd be crazy. Insane. Yeah. Like... like well, you see how hard it is to find a half. Yep. Especially, let's let's say you're not fully on board the fact that he could play seven. Even the sniff that he could play seven, yep. it's like, fuck, just keep him. Just keep him. Cowboys and Fiji International, Taniela Sadrugu will reportedly end his rugby league experiment to return to rugby union with French D2 club. <laughs> that kills me. <laughs> Jeez. Filthy on that. Oh, well, he'd be living in France and enjoying his oh, life. Yeah, he'll be enjoying himself. Trade bien yeah. news for all the uh, French D2 fans out there. <laughs> <laughs> Stay patient, French D2 fans. <laughs> <laughs> this kid could be anything. Yeah, can we get could be anything play? in French? <laughs> <laughs> Bit of Genesee choir about him. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think he stays. I think Dieter stays. Okay, Dolphins. Fins up. Fins down. Fins down. They're a rival, mate. No. Nah. Fan of Dolphins. Good all for right. the game. Mate, the game doesn't need to be a winner all the time. Sometimes the Broncos <laughs> should be the winner. You know, a lot of people are saying the game was a winner from the grand final. No, the Broncos should have been a winner. <laughs> bigger picture, Dan. Bigger uh, picture. Um, Gaines, obviously we need to talk about it, but it's Herbie Farnworth and Thomas Flegler. Absolutely. If you wanted, I guess, even more evidence of a club that's in a good position, and I know that they fell off a little bit towards the end of the year, but, like, talk about shrewd signings at shrewd times. Mm-hmm. Both players... Go on. One plays Origin, makes the Australian squad. The other one wins Dallium Centre of the Year. They re-sign, they sign them before all that happens. Absolute masterstroke by the recruitment of the Dolphins. I cannot believe. Like, it's got to be some of the most shrewd signing we've seen in a very long time. Like the fact that they went out and got them, and these boys both went and had best years ever, and now they're internationals and all that kind of stuff. Well, obviously Herbie was before, but Dallium Centre of the Year, absolutely monumental signings in my opinion, and. We may look back at this and go, this is, these are the two signings that took them into that top eight kind of rhetoric and even propelled them into... I mean, we go back and look at when the Melbourne Storm started. What was a key signing for them? Lazarus. Root. Sorry, Matty completely distracted me. Send me a could be anything in French, which I've got no hope <laughs> of saying. <laughs> but yeah, Lazarus was the one that uh, the Melbourne Storm built their franchise off. Yeah, and so, you know, a guy like Flegler, obviously very different players, but a top, top, top tier uh, international and rep uh, front rower. And Herbie Farmworth, a Dallium Centre of the Year. Unbelievable. And is, is O'Sullivan the recruitment officer there now? Yep. yep. Peter's still there, yeah. And so he was formerly at Melbourne and then the Warriors? Yeah, he was originally at, he's been at the Storm during their period, he's been at the Roosters during their strong period, went to the Warriors, who are now doing okay too for those playing at home, now up at the Dolphins. So. <laughs> like, talk about a guy that could just 
nail it. This is a guy that has found Latrell, Roger, Israel Flower, Flatter Roll, and finding Billy Slater. Like, yeah, he's got a pretty good rap sheet, Pet O'Sullivan. Um, mate, I was talking the other day on my podcast about like which current players would fit into like team's best 17s ever. Mm. Someone asked me a question like, from which of the Dolphins players right now do you think in 30 years' time will be in their best team ever? And mate, I am willing to put everything I've got on Herbie and Flegler. Yeah, years still good being point. part of that side. Yeah, it's a really good point because you're getting them in a good age, hitting their straps, l- relatively injury free. Uh, Honestly, if you would have got them like a year earlier, you would have been like, "Are they developed enough?" You got mm. them a year later, you're paying heaps more. They yeah. nail both of them. Absolutely nail it. Like, and and almost as well if you get them a year earlier, like, let's say they had have arrived, you know, in the first year of the Dolphins, the kind of what's the word? Um, the presence that they bring wouldn't have been as strong as well. But because they went and had this incredible year, they're bringing international and origin presence and grand final presence. That, that means something in a dressing room. And not only grand final presence, they were both great in the grand final. Oh, like if I'm yeah. Herbie, like I'd just be sitting there going, the Panthers side just tried to kick me out of that grand final mm. and they still weren't able to handle yeah. me. And some of the tr- like this tackles he did one-on-one on the edge there, like mate, he was... And, and, and his ability to bounce back after that initial first error. Yeah. yeah. And Flegler also was outstanding. Like, we're talking about Leota and Fisharis, who had an amazing game, and obviously Yo. Flegler was outstanding as well. Uh, th- this is genuinely a masterstroke from the Dolphins. And also, it could be talking about ratcheting up the heat of the rivalry of Dolphins Broncos. Yeah. Fuck, that ratches it up a lot. First yeah. hit up Flegler back in the uh, at Suncorp there. Hurts my heart, it hurts my heart. And also, Herbie Farnworth in his parting speech said, Fins up! Fuck! <laughs> in enemy territory, he said, Fins up. Uh, I can't believe he wasn't taken out back and <laughs> assaulted. It's good. <laughs> it's good for the game, bit of Fins up. Yeah, oh, no, I, think, I think Broncos, Dolphins at Suncorp has to open the season next year. I can just know they don't like to waste those games, though. Because yeah. like, what they try to do is, is that, that what they go is they go, look, round one's going to be big anyway. Sorry, round one is going to be probably big, so we'll put arguably stinkers on there, and then what we'll do is in in um in weeks where it might be a bit more quiet, we put on the big rivalry games to sell them out. Do you know what I mean? Oh no, I I understand. Like South Sydney has got moved from round one to round five a few years ago. I get it, but for the narrative, that's oh, what it should I, be. I, I am still mad that they changed the like it used to be always Broncos Cowboys, and we used to froth it round one, and then they changed it, and I thought it's. Dumb decision. They've nailed it, though. I will watch anyone and anything round one. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> point. I just I the, the build up for round one Broncos Cowboys used to be so freaking good, yeah. Um, but yeah, from a business perspective, they've nailed it. I think uh, obviously Herbie and Flegler, they're going to get all the attention. But mate, I cannot wait to see what Wayne does with Jake Averillo. Yeah, yeah. I hate to say it, Canterbury fans, but I think he's going to absolutely kill it there. Where do you think they will put him? That was a question I had as well. Don't care. <laughs> I, I think so. I think it'll probably be Herbie and Avrilo in the centres. I'd say so. Yeah. Um, there's obviously a few handy centres in that side, but I just think Avrilo under Wayne. He, he got injured the back end of the season for Canterbury. Was that anything serious? And I, I don't think it was from memory. No, I don't hope not. So. Um, but yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if Av- Avrilo isn't in the starting thirteen round one. But I reckon as soon as they have an injury or suspension or anything, he'll come in. I reckon he'll do a tremendous job for them. See, I reckon that they're going to go to Fade. They're going to ch- change him into a forward. Mm-hmm. Back row? Front yeah, row. I think back row probably. Yep. And not an 80-minute back row, yeah, but yeah. like a guy that comes on and goes crazy. Yep. And then I look at these outside backs and I go, I think you and Aiken already is a – he's already a forward. I think they go Avrilo and Herbie yeah, Farmer. Yeah, probably right centers. now look at the squad actually. Yeah. Avrilo was an 8- to 10-week injury, so he's more than fine. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is like when when you look at that back line with Asako, um, Hammer, Hammer, Tessie New, Tessie News, Oof. you know, it's starting to look pretty good. It's yeah. starting to look pretty good. And then you've got Bostock, or who I thought, you know, the opportunities that he had was solid, very raw, but he's a good player. Uh, very yeah, very raw, very raw, but tough. Yeah, tough. So, mate, it's it's looking. Uh, the yeah. other guy on that list too, Oren Keely, they got from the Newcastle Knights. A uh, very, very good back rower. He'll be a little underrated signing. Well, look what they did with Lemuelu. Lemu- Lemu- yeah, and we know what Wayne Bennett does with forwards. <laughs> Keep an eye on him. Um, so, yeah, with the Dolphins, I just – yeah, this, these signings are absolute master strokes and 
Mate, if they're not a dominant, uh, not a dominant, but if they're not like a, a top tier side in five years, I'll be shocked. Mm. I'll be genuinely shocked. Uh, now, obviously, you know, Wayne Bennett, when he moves on and Christian Wolf comes up, I think Christian Wolf can do the job. But I just think that all the signs of a very good, strong club are there, financially super stable, like heaps of cash, huge junior base, like massive junior base, one of the best junior bases in the country, and making shrewd recruitments early on. So are we going into this season knowing this will be Wayne's last year of coaching? I think so, yeah. Fuck, there's going to be a lot of emotion around oh, that too mate. for this side. They'll be up for it. Yeah. They could sneak into the eight. I they think they'll sneak really into the eight. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Now, let's get to the Dragons. <laughs> Holy heckers, man. Holy heckers. Um, obviously, every, everything that happened, happened. <laughs> um, they are now without a 5-8, to my understanding. Uh, obviously, Ben Hunt has come out since we last spoke about Ben Hunt, and it looks like he's going to stay. Um, that's that's sounding healthy. Yeah, real <laughs> healthy. Um, look, I hate to put the boot in, but the fact that they allowed Sullivan to go, knowing that Amon had this situation upcoming, unsure as to what direction it would go in, is an absolutely, I just got to say, it's shocking management. Now, if there is more to it and Sullivan was demanding the release and was forcing the situation and, you know, he got just offered a mozza and they were trying to do something nice by Sullivan. But if they basically told Sullivan he's free to go somewhere else and he can start negotiating with other clubs and he wanted to stay, it's a disaster. It is a disaster transfer-wise and, and uh, squad-wise. A week ago, you would have looked at this situation, the Ben Hunt situation, and gone, well, it can't get worse. <laughs> <sighs> Hold my beer. Yeah, I, this is it's tough, isn't it? I assume now you start with Ben Hunt and Flano in the halves. But this, that's the thing. This is why I didn't I didn't feel like Flano was a good signing because think about the pressure now yeah. Yeah. on Ben Hunt and Flanagan, and you know it just it looks weird. You know, he brought Flano in and then Amon's gone, and then and then you know Flano gets that role, and you go, oh well, you know what I mean. It just all looks weird. It's added pressure that you don't need. I, it's. Mate, he look look at all the pressure he's dealt with, not even playing for his old man. Yeah, yeah. Imagine the extra pressure this poor bloke's going to be under, playing for his old man at the Dragons, who are already struggling. Now, you guys all know that we are massive optimists on bloke. We hope Flano and Ben Hunt kill it. We hope they do, but the headlines that are going to be around, like if they don't kill it, are going to be nightmare stuff. Like nightmare stuff. Yeah, and if it's not working out, mate, your next options, I'm looking at their squad, it's probably playing Jack Bird in the halves or Paul Turner. Like, it, 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 the, the depth just is not there. It is non-existent. And, you know, that's all assuming that Ben Hunt... I mean, what are the odds of Ben Hunt playing his best footy next year? Yeah. I mean, he'll rip and tear, but there's no... like. Obviously, there is a way he could play his best footy, but odds are a guy that has openly said he doesn't want to be there, he's, he's, happy, he's going to stay... That little extra percent that you need of being happy and you know on on board the cause, he's just not going to have it. Yeah, he's just not. And then like again, I look. I apologise if there is more to this Sullivan situation, but him being let go now, it is just unforgivable almost. Because you think about it, you go, okay, well, so they've gone with Amon, who is was their first choice six, but. Amon, unfortunately, he had this court case up. Like, no, mm. so it didn't surprise anyone. Like, if you were going to choose between either one, wouldn't you pick the safer option if you if you had to choose? I personally believe, like, let's let's take out the situation that Amon's dealing with. I person and let's say he didn't have that. I reckon they just needed to bite the bullet and go. You know what, Sullivan, Amon, our six and seven, Benny, let's get a trade for you. Bring someone else in. Um, but now they find themselves in a position where they've got Benny Hunt, who. You know, if he's being honest and he could get out of his contract, we all know he'd probably find somewhere else to go. They've got Kyle Flanagan, who was playing nine for the Bulldogs' reserve grade side, that it will most likely play six. It's a disaster. It's a disaster, and it's a reflection, unfortunately, that the club just hasn't been managed well over the last few years, and that this is where you end up. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> the one shining light for the last few years has been, hey, they've got these young guys here. <clears throat> You look at those three young guys, Bud's now playing at the Tigers. Amon's seemingly not going to be playing. And 
Mate, Sloan's not my fullback to start round one. Even Flanagan's come out and said that I think Lomax was going to get the crack. So all those juniors that were literally the next big thing. Like, this is an exaggeration. Guys, this isn't like, oh, they were just guns and we we're calling the next big thing. They dominated their era. Yeah. Like, they, they were going up against, like, the Panthers and that and beating them. Like, we're, <laughs> these guys were gun, gun. It's, uh, it's so disappointing to watch how it's played out. Okay, so let – okay, put all the negatives aside. What do you do if you're the Dragons heading into – do you head into the market now? Flanagan has come out and said he's not going to panic buy. Uh, now, obviously, I think that's a good thing. You shouldn't panic buy, for sure. But I also do think there's a, a lot of urgency that things need to turn around quickly because I don't think that he has that much – he doesn't have that much grace, unfortunately, Flanagan. It's not like it's Seraldo that's coming in and you're going, mate, this is a five-year rebuild. Like, he's got pretty much two or three years to do this. If this doesn't get sorted in this year, was is it all just going to come together next year? Like, And also, it's not just the halves they need to recruit. Like, they've got to recruit across the whole board. It's a very weak squad across the board, unfortunately. Uh <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I say it every single year with the Dragons, but you know, I can see them being a bottom three side, and then somehow they always seem to overperform that a little bit. They didn't really last year, but I just can't see how this season goes well for them. Mm. I really can't. Um, you know, even guys that I that I praised at the back end of last year, like I thought Billy Burns was really good. Uh, the other back rower that I liked towards the back end of last season, I'm shooting a blank. Uh, but like I look at those guys and I go, okay, how many other sides are they starting back rowers in? Not many other teams, mm. if any other teams, mm. realistically. Yeah, I, <laughs> without just sounding like a, a negative arsehole, I really struggle to find positives here, Kempi. And if you're outside looking in and you're a player, with the Ben Hunt situation, why would you want to go there? Mm. The captain of the club doesn't, yeah. like, doesn't want to be there. So whether you are in ben, Hen ben Hunt's camp or you're in the club's camp, at the end of the day, the environment has created where Ben Hunt doesn't want to be there. It's like... Who wants to walk into that environment? Yeah. Well, the good news is for um, blokes like myself, these guys are the big challenger to spoil the party for the three-peat of the spoon uh, for the Tigers. So they've been probably our main main rivalry there for the last couple of years. And I've got to say I'm enjoying hearing – because I know we haven't got to the Tigers yet, but um, this is a breath of fresh air for me. I think uh, hopefully they're going to stop us. Hopefully they're going to stop us from getting there. All right. You're the, you're the roster manager right now. You've got a blank check. What do you do? Uh, honestly, if I was in charge of the roster, I would be letting Ben Hunt go. Mm. I'd be making that blank check even blanker then to go into the market. <laughs> um, and I, I think similar to the Canterbury Bulldogs, mate, you've you got to go and find yourself halves. Mate, you know what I'll be doing? If he's, if he's up to it, up for it, and it sounds mental, I'll be going to the Penrith Panthers and saying, play a swap for Jerome Luai. I'll be offering Jerome Luai like one point fucking whatever. And Benny Hunt can go, like, obviously you'd, you'd work out, you know, how much money you paid or whatever. But that's, that's seriously what I'd be considering. Because I know Jerome Luai isn't on Ben Hunt's level, in my opinion, you know, individually. Uh, but at least he offers, you know, some kind of youth and zestfulness and future uh, at the Dragons. And then you just hope that Flanagan can play that seven role. I know we've tried it for a few years and it just hasn't seemed to work. But outside of that, like, or do you go Dearden? Do you try to swap Benny Hunt for Dearden? They probably wouldn't take that because he's a bit older and they need a key player. Thoughts? Man, I honestly don't know. Like, if the Dragons manage to sign Nath Cleary this week, I'm still not backing them to make the eight. Really? I'm really not. I mean, I have a look at that squad and once again... They always seem to overperform of where I have them, but I just, mate, like we, we speak about it every single year about these all the clubs that struggle. There's noise coming out of them constantly. Is there a louder club than the Dragons over the last four or five years? Do you aggressively go for Luai though, or do you think he's not the man to fix? I don't think Luai's the man. Personally. Okay, would, uh, would you? I don't know who is the man though. Yeah. This is my big problem. <laughs> yeah, okay, but I'm not sure if Luai's that guy just because of the rest of the squad. They've got no go forward. He'd be playing on the back foot the entire time. What about? Keep Benny Hunt, and you've got money in your cap. You can bring Luai for a million dollars. So you got Hunt and Luai in the house. Luai, sure, but man, I still think you've got a Ben Hunt that doesn't want to be there. Yeah. That, that's the biggest thing to me, that the one shining light in this club, the one thing that can keep their head above water, wants to be deep in the water. Yeah. Well, like, we've said this from the... As soon as this all happened, we were like, 
find a solution of Benny Hunt in a trade somewhere because once they go, I'm done. It's just crazy. But like you never them. see this in the NRL. I, I can't remember a situation like this is something that would happen like in the NFL. Yeah, like it's it's just such a bizarre situation. And once again, you know, I know a lot of people, you know, want to jump on ben, ben Hunt's backs about this, and that's completely fair, whatever. But for Ben Hunt, what I know of Ben Hunt, for him to be doing this, God, that says a lot to me. Look, look at all the other stuff happening at the club. Like, so what you're telling me is all this other stuff happening at the club isn't evidence that this it's the club's not being run that's the best the way stuff you hear yeah like, like so clearly something has happened with be- the way he's been treated where he's gone mate i cannot cop this anymore oh anyway um hammy blank check who are you yeah. going after? well I, was, I don't know about blank check but i'm just trying to think of like making it actually work like he wants to go to queensland would he go to the titans and then i know you speak a fair bit about trying they, they've got all these young players got to try and fit on the field like a Campbell, Brimson, mm. do you try to have a crack at get one of those guys in and going, you're going to play 80 minutes every week. I know they're not a seven, but mm. like, could you whack one of them in the halves and get going from there? Why would they want to go there though? I suppose is the, is the trade off. Mm. But um, I, I'm with Guru, I think you've just got to let him go. Um, the longer he stays, I feel like the as a prospective player looking to go there, the less you would want to go. Yeah. Just with his weird tension. I know he came out last week and said, now I want to stay, but it's chopped and changed so many times now. Like, mm. how could you... I just don't think it's good for anyone. It just comes to a point where you've just got to snip it off and, yeah. you know, and go from there. But it's tough because we've spoken about it, we're speaking about it with other teams as well. Like there's not a lot of great halfbacks available at the moment. So I don't know who you, who you go out with a, with a blank check. <laughs> yeah, and as you said, it's really tough because I'm the same. Let Ben Hunt go. It's not worth having him. But are you going to get a player that's anywhere near as good as Ben Hunt? Probably not. And mm. I understand that. That's what makes it so hard. But it just – That's why this Bud Sullivan thing though, like mm. he, he's, he's a decent young seven. Like in, I know he hasn't reached the heights we thought he would, but he could, he could. You know, it's just yeah. Anyway, I, the, the, I never understood how Bud Sullivan was. They let him go, but and you know what? Like, respectfully, Hammy, but like, it's not like Bud Sullivan left to go to Penrith. I know, I know. He went to go to a club lesser. Yeah, which says like if he. No, it's our year, boys. So. <laughs> <laughs> but like, think about that. Like, that's how unhappy that place must be. Yeah. And like, he's a dragon junior. He's come through there like, yeah, it's tough. And like, th- like those, a uh, few of those young blo- blokes two years ago were saying, I want out. Again, so you, you can try and put shit on Benny Hunt and fair enough, everyone gets to have their opinion. But how many players at that club have said, we don't want to be here anymore? Like, <laughs> if it, like they can't all be just, you know, shit blokes that don't want to have a dig. There has to be some responsibility on the club going, you know what? We probably haven't made this the best environment we can over the last few years. Doesn't it just make you look back at the Mary McGregor days when they were kind of in the top eight conversation? Yeah. And everyone bagged them then. Now you're just like, fuck. And also the way Mary McGregor was treated by the media and everything, like treated so aggressively, you know, are you going to stand down and all this kind of stuff. Now you look back on it. He had, he had, I think, equal most origin players in his side. Think of the players that he got to that club compared to what they're – who would they get at this, at this point? Like, who could they possibly sign? Well, I mean, good news for them, seriously, though. Like, that, at least they've got a new coach. Mm. And Flanagan has taken a team from the bottom to the top before. Mm. Um, let's look on the positive side. Like, you never know. Maybe it does work out with Kyle and he gets the best out of him. Like I hope so. Like Ivan did with Nathan. Yep. Um, a lot of ifs here, but, you know, at least there's a few th- – like, it's not like they're going into this season with the same coach. You yep. know, th- there's a few – there's a few kind of like new influences, a couple of breaths of fresh air that mm. might get them going. Unlikely and hopefully not so that we don't win the spoon again. Um, but maybe, maybe um, something might change. Um, yeah, and positive as well. Ravalawa, he re-signed 2026. He had an incredible year. Um, and I, I do believe Flano is a great get for him. He, you know, we, we're talking about transfers. One of the biggest transfers is Flanagan being coached. Yeah. Mm. When you talk about a ruthless winner willing to do whatever to get the job done, that's Flano. Yep. Yeah. I think Harm Salo is a really good get to. Yeah. I really like him as a forward. Um, the, the only thing is, uh, just the way I see, and it, this is before Flano got there, it looks like that they're like, instead of going, you know what, we just need a full reset, it's just these band aid solutions going, oh, we just, we want to try to make the eight, but not really. And look, we came 12th, we came 13th, instead of just going, you know what, this is not working. Yeah. And this is where, you know, I look through their squad once again. I really like Harm Sallow, but Maddie, like, you can talk more to, more about it with him. Like, the poor bloke, like, he seems to be injured every four or five weeks. I look at Jack Bird, I go, fuck, he's one of the big players here. 
known to be injured. Jacob Little's their starting hooker, known to have a bad injury run. Uh, even the guys that I really like that I think have got potential, like a Zach Lomax, like, you just don't know what you're going to get week to week from Lomax. Yeah. I mean, if he plays to his potential, he'll friggin' be on knocking his door on origin. Like, that's how good he is. Um, yeah, so look, Dragon, unfortunately, in the transfer market, probably, you could argue the biggest losers um, of 23 slash 24. Like, now unless there is a signing that comes over the next few days. Well, Flano is a big get. Flano is definitely a big get, but just it has been one disaster after the other for the Dragons, unfortunately. I hope they do turn it around, though, because I, feel, I do feel sorry for their fans. Um, yeah, on to the Eels. Not really much movement other than uh, Morgan Harper and uh, Tualangi. Look, Morgan Harper is a good, solid centre that can be inconsistent at times. Is he the solution to their problems? Right now, I would say no, but I have seen Morgan Harper play footy for a year, really high quality footy, and be one of the better centers, uh, well, not one of the better centers, but a, a, a more than competent center that can play finals footy. I mean, we go back to when they made the prelim. I know he struggled a little bit in the, in the finals footy game, but that season he was outstanding. But I, I, it's a bit surprising, especially when I was hearing yarns that Harley Smith Shields, it's Harley Shield Smith, Harley Smith Shield. Smith Shields, yeah. When he, they were talking about maybe him going there. And so it, I'm yet to be convinced that this is the right outside back that they need going forward. Yeah, and I, I you know, I don't think Parramatta are under any illusions that they've signed the guy that's going to solve the problems. Like I think it's pretty evident he is going to be a depth signing. Mm. And uh, I've seen a lot of fans online you know, jumping all over Morgan Harper like, I'm sorry, himself. but if he also, <laughs> if he didn't have that game against Siffa, half of you don't have an opinion on him. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to break it to you. Like, yeah, he had a shocker that night. There is no doubt about that whatsoever. But he has shown over a long period of time that he is a first-grade centre. Mm. He's not a superstar. He's not going to solve your problems. But I'll tell you what, I remember when Bryce Cartwright signed. Parramatta fans weren't stoked about that. Mm. Yeah, He's just re-signed again and is playing great footy. And I think you need to keep in mind that your coach has a tendency to sort of get guys out of nowhere and turn them into good footballers. Yeah, and, and we actually have seen Harper play good footy. We like, have seen him play good footy. Yeah, okay, he struggled a little bit last year and a half or so, but he was playing bloody good footy two years ago. I, I genuinely think that if that game against Talakai didn't happen, there's a lot of fans out there that have no opinion on him whatsoever. Mm, yeah. Um, Again, though, my concern is is it's been a few years now where the yep. Eels just – whether they – like, because they're a club that can recruit. They're in a good spot. I know they didn't make the finals, but they're in a good spot, a good squad that genuinely could push for a premiership if everything goes well for them. But it's another year without signing a, a good, strong outside back. A strike centre. Yeah, a yeah. strike centre that yeah. in games you can just go, boom, giving them the ball like a guy like Timoko or – I mean, that's what I'm – like – a guy like Timoko, who, yes, he's playing for the Kiwis, but, Kiwis, but when you're having conversations about Dalian Centre of the Year, I, I'm sure Timoko didn't come up in those conversations. So he's probably a little bit of a tier below the top tier. But he would be – a guy like him is perfect for the Eels. Now, I understand they're not going to be able to sign him with the Raiders, but what I'm saying is you don't even need to sign the next Dalian Centre. You just need to sign a destructive centre that can do something special that Timoko can do. And that's what I'm just – it just blows my mind that, again, we go into another year and the Eels just refuse to sign a strike centre. Yeah. I think that if you have a look at their development list there, they've got young Blaze Tongi, who's uh, been very good coming through the grades. I reckon they would be hoping mm. that he's the guy. Uh, do I think he's going to be the guy overnight, though? No, it's going to take time. Uh, but, yeah, I'm, I'm, mate, I'm like even like your, your Connor Tracy's of the world, they, like, I'm surprised they haven't just gone out and mate, got one perfect, of these guys. Perfect. Yeah. Look, he, he doesn't have to be the Dallium centre. He just... A high quality center that every few games he does something special. Yeah. Or, or not even a center, even like a winger. Like that, that would just bolster their outside backs because, I mean, Clint Gutherson can only do so much. And Sibo, I think he's 30 now. So he's getting a bit older. Is he really? I wow. think he is. Can yeah. you check his age, please? I'm pretty sure he's 30. Like, I just. Now, and again, I apologize to, to the Eels if they have a lot of young, absolute guns coming through, but. Even when players got injured last year, the young guys they not like the young guys they brought in, they didn't set the world alight. Like yep. which is, is surprising. Usually you know, they, they nailed it with Bensini. They nailed it with him and I think he's been really good and he's slowly developing. But outside of that, I, it's it's so strange how they just for some reason they struggle 
to create outside backs recently. Yeah, and like you would, like I would imagine you're going into the market with a gun forward pack, you've got great halves, you should be able to get centers. That's what I'm saying. Centers should be keen to play for Junior Paramount. Paulo, RCG. Um, then you've got Dylan Brown, Mitchell Moses, Clint Gutherson. Like, this is a good side to play with. A, a big club that was in a grand final only. Like, it is just, it blows my mind that they just somehow, some way, can't sign a, a strike outside back. Now, look, maybe Wonga Blake was on a big contract and that's what's hurt them and they've been unable to obviously offload mm-hmm. him or whatever. Now, he's obviously not at the club next year. But, yeah, it's... Um, I think Harper and Tualangi are good signings because they will be signed on probably minimum deals. Yep. But I think for 2023, 24, they haven't really... Like, we've still got the nine problem for them. Yeah, for sure. That <laughs> problem's not solved. I, mate, I think the one positive when I look at this sheet is their re-sign list. Guys like Dill Brown, Bryce Cartwright, <coughs> uh, Widemer Greg, uh, Jermaine Hopgood, Mitch Moses, Will Pensini, uh, Mike Sibbo. There's a number of very talented players that they've kept there. But they do just need to add something special. Yeah, I, I think they have <clears throat> they did a really good job to get where they are right now, as in last year where they made the grand final. But we've spoken about it for probably two years now where, okay, it's one thing to build the roster to get there, but now it's about making the right decisions to stay there. And I think that due to their inexperience at being here for a while, maybe that has hurt them a little bit because we have to give them raps. What they did with Mitchell Moses, Dylan Brown, Gutho, Junior Bowler, RCG, has been really, really good. You know, I, I, the Parry Eels, we've given them wraps so many times for the development. They've taken all these players and built into a grand final side. I know they didn't make the finals. But I think since they made the grand final, or so, since the year that they made the grand final, there have been a few decisions that have been incorrect. And and they haven't remedied them remedied, remedied? remedied them quick enough. What do you reckon, Amy? Yeah, they've, uh, well, the, the thing that stood out has been like the, as you've said, the centre problem for like ages. I wonder if maybe um, a guy like Jack Whiten, you know, he went he went to the bunnies, but like someone like that, like it would have been perfect, perfect for them. Um, can you imagine if I mean this is pretty pie in the sky, but if they had have signed Stephen Crichton up, you'd probably say like Ooh. like obviously dream dreamland with salary caps and stuff, but like you'd almost be like, well, they're almost like a top four sort of yeah. threat again. They beat they beat Penrith the week before the finals, like yeah. who was smashing everyone. Mm. They're a good team. They're pretty good, but they probably just probably two. You go back even when they're in the grand final. That was always the little spot that they kind of haven't been able to solve, and they've had two two off seasons now where they probably haven't been able to fill it. Probably. Well, I, I mean, I look at this Broncos squad like Delise Hoyter, Dean Mariner. I know he's signed to 2027. Like, look at all these young like go and raid the Broncos outside backs. We've got mm. a, a thousand of them. It's just strange to me. And also, I mean, you've been around the game for quite a while, Guru. Like, there are explosive outside backs. Like, they're everywhere. I think more so now than ever before. Yeah. Like, so it's, that's what blows my mind, that there isn't a young 18-year-old kid that is super quick, big and strong, and you just need to... There's one at Cronulla. <laughs> yeah, I know. That, Still waiting for someone to pick him up. But anyway. yeah. It's, yeah, that's surprising. Uh, so, yeah, look, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe they're, they're sticking to their... Because we've spoken about it all the time on the show, how they have this really stringent recruitment uh, and retention program and maybe they're sticking to it to a T because it got them there but I do think you once you get to the point they're at you do need to bend the rules a little bit and like you have a look around at other clubs like mate, every single week I ask for questions on my podcast first questions are what's going to be the Roosters back line someone has to miss out there there's a star player there waiting for another club to go we will have you here's a starting spot without a doubt yeah. could be Parramatta mate I look at South Sydney the amount of depth they've got in their outside backs like I know he's not a superstar but I'm looking at Isaiah Tasco and oh. the music's going to stop at South Sydney he's not going to have a chair round one next year mate grab him left centre thanks for coming Isaiah Tass we spoke about it last year he would be perfect and you'd probably only pay what 250 for him and he'd be stoked to be playing first grade. Parramatta is a good club. It, yeah, it, it's really, really surprising to me, this whole outside back situation. And also the nine situation. Like, they changed their mind three times in the space of 12 months. Yeah. It was Hodgson. It was Hands. Now it's Lussick. Who is it next year? I'm, I'm not sure. So, yeah, definitely need some work. Definitely need some work, the, the Parra Eels. Hopefully they can sort it out. Uh, now, the Newey Knights. Recruitments, Cartwright, Cogger, Pierce Paul, uh, Will Price. Ironically, Cogger fast became the mm. biggest signing for them in the off season. And this is coming from a person that when they signed him, I was like, 
this must have been done before Knights went on their run because why would you sign Cogger when you've got Gamble and Hastings? But then he plays like he does in the grand final and you go, oh, shit. Mm. Maybe he would put pressure on one of those players um, in the six or seven jersey. Um, the problem is I probably see him more as a seven than a six, but he did play six and win some game for the Panthers. So good signing, I guess. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, obviously, as you just said, can be like they obviously signed him before Newcastle went on their run. I think it needs to be kept in mind. Jack Hogger's obviously a Newcastle boy. Yep. I think that helped his cause. Um, and, you know, as you said, like – in that grand final, he played incredibly well. And I've got people saying to me, he has to be the 5'8". He has to be. And I'm like, fuck. Did you watch the role that he played in that game? He pushed Cleary to six. He pushed Cleary out to six. He he, he played the exact role that Jackson Hastings plays every single week for mm. Caleb Ponga. So, yes, it's a good signing. I also think that knowing that Adam Clune was leaving, they wanted that depth as yep. well. Why not bring a Newcastle boy home? In hindsight, three months later, he's a grand final hero. Mm. It's unbelievable how it's played out. I, probably, I don't think he will be in there starting 17 to start the year. People have spoken about playing him in the halves and maybe uh, playing Gamble in Jersey 13. And I, I, I wouldn't be moving Gamble. You can't, like, it's, it'd be, oh, look, it's a long off-season and it's a long pre-season and also the pre-season trial, sometimes you just get the jump. Yeah. Pre- if, if Gamble and Hastings come out and play solidly in the, the pre-season trials, be pretty rough go. And I don't, I'm just not sure about the message that would send mm. to the squad. Oh, boys, we went on this incredible run. These guys, you know, dragged us up from nothing. Or oh, by the way, the the fringe recruit has come in, he's taken the spot. I just don't know if that's you rather it if he is gonna take it, he's gonna take it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I think that having Jack Cogger in the squad, like, I, I think it's great. I mean, r- the reality is um, Hastings has had two seasons back here. Uh, you know, he, he's been injured in both of them mm. throughout the season. So to have an extra guy there like Cogger, similar to what Adam Clune did, you know, we said on this show here, when the moment um, Hastings got injured, we all said on the show, we know who Clune is. Mm. <clears throat> Jackson's role that he has in that Newcastle Knights side, like it isn't overly complicated. Mm. He, he just makes it look easy. Yeah. Uh, and you know that Cogger's going to be able to come in and do that role if so. <clears throat> um, I mm. like these two boys from England, Kai Pierce Paul. I don't know if he'll be a he, – honestly, mate, he could be a winger, second rower, or a centre. Well, I think boy. he'll be a centre, second rower. I think he'll come start in the centres. Uh, but how do you fit in that side in the centres, realistically? Yeah, really. It's going to be yeah. tough. Uh, but I think he's got a lot of ability – it's Will Price, man. He's the one that, you know, we're going to spend all preseason off the back of that grand final talking about Cogga. Will Price is the wild card in the halves. Obviously, English halves, it's mission impossible to work out how they're actually going to go. But, you know, Newcastle signed a young Dom Young a couple of years ago, an English outside back that we all went, oh, I don't know about. Uh, all of a sudden, he's one of the best outside backs in mm. rugby league. So he's the real wild card, Will Price. The more I watch of him over there, the more impressed I am. What I will say, the Newey Knights, geez, it's starting to shape up their roster. You know, uh, they've, they've recently uh, been some reports that one of the Saifidi brothers may get squeezed out. I think it's Daniel Saifidi. Um, Which is full credit to Leo Thompson, by the way. Yeah, it's crazy. But this is arguably the best position the Knights have been in in quite a while where you've got really good backup halves if you need them or if they hit their potential and we know how they can play, they turn into something great. Um, got good outside, like really good outside backs. Your forward pack's quite solid like I think that the good thing for the Knights is is that there's direction now they've got mm. really really clear direction where they want to head who they need to recruit uh, I actually think that we could into, head into next year and these could be guys that we go well it could, it could go either way I don't think there's going to be a middle ground I don't think there's going to be a ground of like oh yeah they were solid I think it's going to be either wow they went out and signed really shrewdly these people that aren't on big wicket, aren't on huge contracts, but they came out here and played the best they could play. Um, almost a bit like the Eels a few years ago when they went out and signed a few of these guys where you're like, oh, I don't, I'm not really sure how they're going to all fit in, and then, yeah. boom, exploded. I think there's a chance we could see that with with these recruitments. I really do. Just a quick one on uh, on the Cogo signing as well. Bit of chat about um, cashed up English clubs having a crack at Hastings again. I don't know if yeah, you saw this in the last week, and he's okay. come out and said no, but... Smoke, fire, you know the rest. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so maybe maybe <coughs> the Cogger signing all of a sudden goes like clockwork a little bit. Yeah, wow. Now, he's denied it for sure, but it's very strange that that report's coming out now yeah. of all, all timing. Yeah. He won't be going. He's just brought a house up in Newcastle. Uh, pretty confident he won't be going anyway. But the, I guess the concern is, is that if the 
if it's getting pushed to the media by not him. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's sometimes, sometimes certain parties can put things out and then there's pressure begins mm. and, and whatever. Like I, I agree with you that Hastings clearly wants to stay or, or whatever, but the fact that that's been pushed out, yeah, very strange. Very, very strange. Yeah. Anyway, we'll see. We'll see. Um, I'll tell you what, that'd be super unfair. <laughs> Fuck, that'd be unfair. Yeah, it'd be brutal. Like, yeah. Jesus. Uh, but, yeah, in regards to the Knights, I like their direction. I can't wait to see how the boys go. I can't see that. Like, the fact that a guy like Price and Cogger are going to be sitting in the squad, geez, that's good depth in your halves. Like, far out. Just having a look at uh, Will Price, like, you know, we just spoke about Parramatta. Like, he's a guy, if they'd sign him as a centre, I'd be like, okay, mm. maybe we've got some movement <clears throat> here. This could be something. Uh, you look over in the English Super League, He's played about 20 games at fullback, 5'8", and halfback. So good yeah. guy to have in your squad. Yeah, definitely good guy to have in your squad. Definitely good side. I think Dom Young, obviously, going to be a, a big loss. I really um, – mm. how crazy Lockie Miller's over in Leeds now. Insane. He's another guy with the Eels. He's another guy the Eels could have just plucked at centre. Like, just chuck him at centre. Be interesting all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> not okay. a Knights fan, but just – I'm actually sad seeing Dom Young not playing at the Knights I know. next year. Just steaming yeah. down that sideline. Yeah. Agreed. Get going. Agreed. I think Lockie Fitzgibbons won <clears throat> the entire time he was there. I thought if he was to leave, they wouldn't miss him. Now that he has left, I've gone, okay, he probably played his best footy last year. Yeah, I know. I know. Hopefully Dylan Lucas can fill that, that gap. Well, yeah, I think it'll be between Lucas, Cartwright, and this Kai Pierce paul for yep. that spot. Okay, Manly Seagulls. Um, Obviously, the big signing here mm. is Luke Brooks. I've got to say, I don't agree with the length of the contract, but for this year coming, I think it's great. I love it. I'm all for it. Yeah. I think it's great. He, I, um, yeah, you go, actually. You go. Well, yeah. I used it before. I think it was best for both parties that he left the Tigers mm. in the end. But when he wasn't injured this year, he absolutely killed it. And uh, just it's so flattening to see that it like, all, all fell apart now. Um, him and Appy going around like, you know, though we had to, a couple of good weeks there. We look like we're on, onto something. But I feel like taking a bit of the pressure off him, some of the, you know, the fifth tackle stuff and mm. just every now and again, when that all fell to him at the Tigers, it didn't go so well. He's got the best in the business just about looking after all that. Now, DC, I just reckon, I reckon he's going to go there and kill it. Yeah. Brooks, I reckon he'll play his best footy that he has played there. Um, and a great signing for them. Yeah. Maybe maybe some nervous Eagles for, uh, Seagulls fans when, when it happened, but... He had a really good year. Um, he's timed it well. And I think just what they need as well, they've lacked a six yeah. and a bit of stability there to support DCE. And <coughs> if they've got those two guys firing in the halves. And if they can get Tommy Turbo yep. at, at the back as well, like, wow. Like, that is just a terrifying kind of spine to come up against. Yeah, well, you go fit Tommy. Yep. Brooks, DCE, Croker, and then off the bench. Um, Chan uh, Kung Tong. Chan Kung Tong. Yep. Like, that is a great spine rotation. Yep. That's a yep. top eight spine rotation. Yep. Maybe even a top four spine rotation. If Tommy's fit, it's top four, I reckon. Yeah. 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 Plus then, you know, I assume this year you'll have Cola given a bit of a roaming role as well. Like, they're just going to be dangerous all over the park, the Seagulls. And I agree, mate. Luke Brooks, I love the signing. I. What, what are your thoughts on the four years of it? I, I, honestly, I'm fine with it. Just that. to get him there no, kind of thing? Cares. Yeah, I mean... It, it seems like they gave him four years to just get him there. Yeah. Because he probably was offered four years... Somewhere. Yeah. If they want to get out of a Luke Brooks deal in two years or if Luke Brooks wants to get out of it, they'll be able to do it. Yeah, okay. I don't, I, it doesn't worry me in the slightest. Um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, you talk about, you know, Luke Brooks playing good footy. Whenever he's playing good footy, he's running the football. Mm. And <laughs> with, with DCE, just, you know, one of the most ball-dominant sevens in the game, I think it just, it just leads to Brooks just playing his best footy. Mate, if he comes out and kills it, it'll be one of the best stories of the last decade of rugby league. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I'm reasonably confident he's going to do well. The only thing I worry about is that on that left edge, you're going to have Brooks and Schuster, I assume, defending next to each other. That's my only worry. <clears throat> Mate, the Schuster situation is very strange. Yeah. Very, very strange. But you go back 18 months ago when Schuster's playing in the back row, he was actually defending all right there. But then he took two steps to the right and it completely changed last season. But even times when he played there this year... Just oh for sure this year yeah. was a shit fight, but he has shown that he oh, can sure. do it he, there. Of course he can. Yeah, he can literally do anything. If you said if he put his mind to it, he could play front row. Like yeah. it, it, he can literally he can do anything in rugby league. But I just it's a very strange situation because if you took away salaries and names, he wouldn't be in your starting seventeen yeah. next year. Um, but because of who he is and his potential and his contract, 
he's going to get that first crack at that wide running forward position. Which maybe it may be the best thing for him. It yeah. really might be the best thing for him. It, it's almost what makes it more frustrating. Like if he was never this guy that got through the tough and hard stuff, you'd be like, oh, okay, he's just not that guy. But he's shown us he can be that dude. Yeah, that's what, that's what frustrates me so much. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I think Luke Brooks great signing. Uh, the other ones, look, as long as their uh, depth signings decent, as in, as, uh, for example, the Polo or Paolo and Tommy Talao, as long as they are signed on like minimum essentially. Or close to minimum so you know that 120 150 200 maybe i think they're good signings but if you're signing these guys on you know three or four hundred k i think that that's a bit of a worry uh but i'm assuming that they've been both signed uh tommy talao and jackson bolo on um you know close close to minimum yep. close to minimum i'd say so and if they can hit their potential that we all know they play they'll be they could turn out to be great great signings great yep. signings um in regards to re-signings, a really, really good re-signing of Olakawatu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Huge get. Uh, you know, we spoke earlier on the show about Tonga not utilising him. I love the way that Manly just go all in. Mm, yeah. It's fantastic. Like, he, he is the main strike weapon on that edge. And I think that – I think Kohler's going to take a lot of confidence in the back end of the season with those two on that same side. Mm. Like, it should be one of the best edges in rugby league. Yeah. Not to mention the fastest guy in the game outside them, Jason mm. Saab, yeah. with a great half DC on that edge. Mm. It should be one of, if not the best edge in rugby league. Well, when Tommy was firing, we saw, you know, what they could do. And also, yeah. Olakawatu, he's been playing this relatively, not relatively, but mostly really good footy for a couple of years now. So it's not just like a one-year big deal. Like, it's been, what, three three years now where we've seen Olakawatu yeah. as – Maybe not the best back row in the comp, but he's always been in the conversation as one of the best back rowers in the competition. And once again, as far as the other players in the competition are concerned, who would have a pretty good eye for who's good and who's not, he was voted as their second row. Yeah. Um, outside of that, with retention, the lodge situation is really interesting uh, as to where they go and what direction. Front row situation, I think that they just got to hope um, that they can stay injury free. That was a big detriment from last year at the end of the year. It was, yeah. And I thought towards the back end of the system uh, season, I thought, mate, tell us Sipley. Mm, he was a maniac. He was on fire. If he can I, find that form. If, if he can maintain that form, for sure. And the other one I thought didn't get anywhere near enough attention last year was Tane Alipaseka. That was his best season by far and away. And I think you only realised how good he was going once he wasn't there. Mm. And then there was a big hole there. I'm, I'm a bit surprised at the Kepi chat. Has he has he actually signed with the Rabbitohs? So I was just about to bring this up. Is Rumours floating around. There's no official word no, or anything. I didn't realise he was signed at Manly till 2026. Yeah. So, yeah, but no official word at the moment. Like, maybe he's on a big wicket. I just – I think Kepi's a bloody good player. Mm. I really do. I think he's got a lot of potential. He hasn't hit it yet. Oh, mate, I think there are plenty of clubs that could use a guy like Kepi if they aren't interested in keeping him. Very good squad guy to have. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Can play edge, can play middle. There was a period there he was playing 13. He was killing it. Yeah. He's killing it. Um so yeah, I'm I'm excited for if if everyone stays fit, I'm excited for Manly next year. But it's a matter of, you know, is everyone stays fit and also as long as Seabold, I guess, can find that consistency that he even regardless of club, whether it's a Broncos or Manly, he's yet to find consistency as a head coach. If he can find a bit of consistency and they can all stay fit, I'm excited. Wouldn't it just be great if, you know, they change their logo, their branding and everything the other day? Wouldn't it be great if it's just the start of Turbo? Yeah. Being turbo. Absolutely. And we look at that emblem, we look at their new jersey and go, fuck, that was the turbo That was a, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Penny Panthers, Gaines, Dane Laurie, Alamotti, Riley Price, Brad Schneider. I mean, when you talk about great recruitment mm. on the fringes and depths, far out. Like, Blake, uh, Dane Laurie came and killed towards the end of the year. Alamotti, one of the best young guns coming through the grade. Riley Price, I thought he did a good job when he played for the Cowboys. Schneider, I was super surprised that the Raiders let him go. I couldn't Same. believe it. I could not believe it. Um, the question, though, is Luai can negotiate with other clubs. Like, look, the one thing, okay, so this $800,000 keeps getting bandied about. I'm a bit suspect on that figure. Only because, mate, 800 grand to be playing at the Penrith Panthers? Fuck, you could be doing a lot worse. Mm. Like, I just, for me, if I'm Luai getting off at 800 grand, and that's why I think that I, I think that 800 grand figure might be quite inflated. I reckon it's a bit less because I just don't understand why you wouldn't take that 
a long-term deal, 800 grand a year to go and win a few more premierships in your career. In, instead, you might get paid maximum 1.2, 1.1 in another club. Is, it, is that extra 200 grand a year, is it worth just a shit fight for the rest of your career? No. Like, no. It's not. Do you get the sense Penrith are worried that he is going to go and hence why they've gone and got, you know, Laurie and a couple of guys to, to back up here? Um, otherwise, if Zane Laurie's watching, why did you go? Um, <laughs> I want you back. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you, do you get the sense that he, he will leave or do you reckon he'll stay? Well, I get the sense that the 800 figure, 800K figure is not true. Yep. Again, purely assumption, purely speculation. I think that they've lowballed him massively and... They're putting out the 800k so it looks reasonable like you know we're giving him a reasonable offer because i just for the life of me couldn't believe why lua wouldn't go 800k a season for a four or five year deal fucking where's the contract yeah, yeah. um to go to somewhere like where would he go where would he go where's going to be better yeah, yeah. like for, okay let's say what, what's the max you reckon he could get at a struggling club 1.2 1, yeah. 1. Yeah. 1. 1. 1. we'll yeah. say 1.2 yep so it's an extra 400 grand a year. It's a lot of money, but when you're earning 800K, it's all relative. Like if you can't save enough, like the, and also all the third party stuff you're gonna get at Panthers and <laughs> yeah. the, the profile stuff, it's not even, anyway, let's just say it's 400K a year. Mate, let's say you was gonna go to the Dragons. Is it worth getting, like put it this way, Ben Hunt was willing to pay to leave the Dragons and he's on $1 million a year. So he was willing to essentially take a huge pay cut and go and play 500 grand or somewhere else so I just it, that that eight hundred k figure is just not making sense to me. Yeah, and it is really interesting. You know, off the back of their negotiations they had with um, Critter, sort of at the start of the season before he signed with Canary, there was a lot of mixed reports coming out of there. A lot of misinformation. A lot of misinformation. Yeah. So, yeah. and you know what? This is you know the Penrith Panthers. They this is what the best the reason do. why they're successful. Yeah. They're fucking ruthless. Look, at the end of the day, as a Panthers fan, you love your players, and you should always love your players. But you want your club to always put the club first. Yeah. If, if you, because that's, you know, players come and go, the club wins premierships, which sucks as a formal player because the club sit there and use this loyalty and like, oh, mate, just just sign less for the next year, but then we've got more space in the salary cap the year after, and then they fucking brush you a year later. Like, so it, yeah. it And it's, it's very quickly forgotten, you know, after their 2020 grand final loss, all the talk was, geez, they're letting go of their captain, James Tamu, their most experienced player, Josh Mansell. Mm. When was the last time you heard someone talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... I personally think, I think he stays. I think he stays. I think he'll stay too. I just don't think the headache is worth, because he's not going to go to a top tier club on a big coin. Yep. It's going to have to be one of the bottom tier clubs that are struggling. But also because, because he's a six and he's not really a seven at the moment, it's just a weird fit. Mm. Like if you're a club struggling, is he the guy that can get you into finals footy right now? It's a, it's a very strange fit. I'm not confident in saying he is mm. right now, especially if you're one of these bottom teams, which are the, which like, I think the other thing as well is that like he's so connected to that area. Mm. And I, I don't know if you can put a value on that. And he's perfect for what the Panthers need. Yeah. Like he's perfect. You know what, Jerome, he, like I love Jerome and I, I, I've always, you know, defended stuff, but like you're a polarizing character. Mm. There's no hiding away from that. And you know well, what? He's stepped into it now. He stepped into it for sure. But you know yeah. what? He also knows that he's at a club that's going to put their arm around him and they're going to embrace it. You don't know if other clubs are going to do that. Oh. Other clubs will tell you they will. But then when the when the heat comes, I reckon most would go to war. I think, I think at the start of his career, he was just being himself and he became polarizing. And it got to a point where he's like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going all the way in here because they're going to treat me like that anyway. And you're absolutely right, Guru. He goes to another club. It'll be all hunky-dory in the first 12 months. But once they start getting all those headlines that he generates, it won't be hunky dory. No, it won't. It'll be fucking put the boombox away, mate. Fucking blah blah blah. <laughs> yeah, mate, and there will be. It will be. You know, <laughs> once the heat starts to come, there will be the suits upstairs that won't want to take responsibility for it. And they've got the perfect scapegoat in their club. You'll be the perfect scapegoat. Yeah, he's the reason we're not winning. Even though, hey, we weren't winning before he came, so it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, and he's won everything he's ever stepped into. I mean, look at Samoa. Like, they would kill for him right now. So, it, it, But it is just this very strange... The question of can he lead a team into the eight, it's just... Maybe, maybe. Because, like, he did leave Samoa to a grand final in the World Cup. So, yeah. But then you go, oh, because he's not an out-and-out out seven, just like, oh, I just don't know. 
Mate, he's in a very unique spot. He is 26 years old with three premierships under his belt. Like, mm. if he stays at this club with Nate Cleary, like, I don't know what, what you know, sum of money you want to put next to <laughs> legacy. And, like, it, mate, if he finishes his career with four or five premierships, which could be unders, realistically. Seriously Imagine good. where he will sit in the history of rugby league. Oh. Hate him. What, I don't in that know. area. Yeah, in in, that in Penrith. Area. But mate, even outside of that oh, no, area. What I'm saying is, is like, yeah, 100%. In, in rugby league... But imagine what he could do post career in Penrith, yeah, with six premierships or five premierships under his belt. He'd be a fucking lord among men. Well, mate, like off the top of my head, like what he he's, <laughs> you know, like he he's a premiership away from having more premierships than Joey and Freddie combined. That is actually fucking wild. And you know what's frustrating is how many people are like, oh yeah, it's easy to do that in a good side. They weren't a good side four years ago. <laughs> they weren't. They 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 were all non Origin players, non Rep players. They built into this, and they've yeah. all done it together. Like it hasn't been like, yeah. Look, if no you need a- to remind you all about how stupid it was to let go of Burton to keep Luai, oh, mate. I'm sure Ivan Cleary is very upset. With yeah, this. yeah. <laughs> Damn, kicking himself every night. I really missed one there. I just, if the 800k figure is correct, mate, snap that up. I'm taking that every day of the week, and I really think that if he's managed, let's say it's true, and his management. Is saying no. I think they're doing him a disservice. I really eight hundred grand a year to win comps. Mm. <laughs> oh fuck! Yeah, Crazy. I, I hope he stays. I hope just for the legacy of the Penrith Panthers and for the sake of the NRL, I hope he stays. Okay, we all hope he stays. If he does leave, what club do you think could use a guy like Luai? Uh, I mean, well, I'll, I'll obviously mentioned the Dragons before, which I think would be a good get. Him and Hunt, like, let's say you could somehow mend everything, and he, I like him and Hunt. Yeah, I think it'd be a good combo. Just if, if Hunt wants to be there, you know, or yeah, yeah, we're just going over old ground there. But um, you know, I think there's a number of clubs that they could do with him. The Canberra Raiders need a ball player. <laughs> Which I'm the I fit the culture down in the Canberra Raiders. Oh, I'm not too sure. But yeah, once again, heads, I can you slip right in? <laughs> <laughs> once again, I mate, I, I'm not sure how many other cultures Jerome Luai would fit like he does the Penrith Panthers right now. You know. I'm going to go a bit crazy here. I wouldn't. I think Knights could be somewhere that he could go all right. Because they got Cogger. They mm-hmm. got, um, obviously got heaps of halves. So it wouldn't, be a, it wouldn't be a signing for a couple of years. But that is a side that could use a, a six like him and take them to that kind of next level. Potentially, yeah. yeah. What about you? Not about you. Well, I know I default to this a lot, but the Tigers probably. Mm. Um, you know, I know we've got one coming in already, but yeah. I'm, I've probably got the same reservations as Gurus. Like, you know, when we're kind of struggling to kind of um, set some standards and all that sort of stuff, is he the guy that you want to go and get in there to, to do that basically and turn mm. the team around? Maybe not. Um, I just, yeah, for those reasons you mentioned, headlines, all that sort of stuff. Who's who's going to oh, tolerate that? You need to be because he, he can he can set standards. Yep. But the distraction of headlines yep. if he was at the Tigers, oh, yeah, fuck. Yeah, I just think, like, the best fit for him, and it's probably just to say the Panthers, because you need a good team that um, he can just kind of – he's a perfect support act to a guy like a Cleary. Mm. So I don't know he's, he's, if he's your all-in guy that you can build your whole team around, but, yeah, um, it'd, be, it'd be one of those – yeah, that's the thing. If he was to go somewhere, it'd be one of those teams down the bottom, and would you want to go there? Probably not. What about if you if you are going to go Dearden at seven, what about – a guy like Luai at the Cowboys at six. Yeah, I was also just thinking um, the Sharks potentially too. Yeah, that was mine, Sharks. Yeah. I reckon Sharks would be perfect. Yeah, I don't for, mind for that. For both parties. Mm. I don't mind that. Because like, there is spots for him, but th- this is what's not making sense to me. The 800,000 figure is yeah. not making any sense because mm. the Sharks would probably pay 800 grand. The Cowboys would probably pay it. You know what I mean? Like Those clubs aren't going to pay a million dollars for a six. You know, the other team, and I, I know that they, they've just signed Luke Brooks and I like that signing, but geez, when Manly's been at their best, it's been a, yeah, you hate us or we hate you. Oh, we mate, don't care. him and yeah. Manly. Him and DCE, could you yeah. imagine? It'd be a nice little combo. Um, and that's, that, that's what's throwing me off. Like, I keep coming back to this 800K thing because that's all he would get at the top tier clubs. Mm. So it doesn't make sense that the top, top, top tier club is offering him what he would get at a top eight site. Yep. That makes no sense. Yeah. Like, how can the Penrith Panthers afford to offer him 800K when the Sharks wouldn't offer him more than 800K? Mm. It's all not making sense, Guru. All not making sense. <laughs> what about the Roosters? You've obviously got Luke Keery getting older. I don't mind it. I don't mind it. Is Sam Walker too similar? Potentially. 
Yeah. What about South issue. Matty? If you were yeah. to take salary cap out of it, could he be a halfback? I tell you what, when you're talking about like off the cuff sixes, Cody Walker, I know they clash all the time, but they, they're kind of similar. Mm. As in the way they can be off the cuff, running, try assists, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't think it would benefit South so much to, to bring in Jerome Lowe. You might as well just put Jack White in the halves. Really? Uh, well, I mean... Mate, what, what? I would 100% have Luai over White at six. You reckon? Or seven. Mate, any day of the week. Took some older World Cup, won three premierships. And also wins when Cleary isn't in the side. I guess so. But then if... I'm just saying if, if you add in Luai... Of course, if you've taken one on one, you definitely like, take, take Luai, 100%. We're talking, we're talking that Walker's retired. Cody Walker's retired. Oh, if Walker's retired, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Sorry, I, I thought you meant in, into the current team now. No, no, no. We're talking about because he'll be off contract, not this year, but next year. Mm, yeah. So Walker will be pretty much, I assume, retiring. Mm. Be getting close to it, if not. Yeah. Oh, that'd be comp- 100% perfect. And then, you, and then let's say Lockie Ilias hits his straps. I, I don't mind that. I don't <laughs> like, mind. I'll tell you what, my biggest problem with Cronulla is I can't win big games. <laughs> Bring your own Luai in there. Yeah, I reckon Luai to Sharks, that would be perfect. Yeah, I don't mind that, eh? I don't mind that. Cause, and again, like that's the thing. There are sides that would take him. Yeah. It's just about the cost. You know, I, I don't think any of the sides we just mentioned would pay a million dollars for him. Like Cody Walker's not on a million dollars, is he? What about like, obviously the Canterbury Bulldogs, they've got a lot of former Panthers there. Mm. Yeah, they're going to have Stephen Crichton at 5'8". Like you've got Cam Serrato there. I don't know how they could possibly do it with their salary cap, but it'd be an interesting side as well. It's just like... Then what, Burton, Oluwapu, where do you put them? Do you put Burton to the centres? Jeez, how, how well, no, it could, yeah, but like Jerome Luai could play halfback. He's oh, done yeah, it for seven, some while. Yeah, I, I don't, I just, I see him as an out and out six. Six? Yeah. And I don't see him playing seven for any club. Unless they're I, desperate. I, I could see teams getting desperate and playing. Yeah, seven. yeah, fair, fair. Look, I think he stays, um, but I just want to caution people believing that 800k, I just... Yeah. Really struggle to believe that he's been offered that by the Penrith Panthers. Um, just before we move off the Panthers, uh, the name that I love there, to see the Penrith Panthers uh, sign the son of Stephen Price, that scares the living shit out of me. You know what scares the living shit out of me? When you're in a bloody convenience store after the grand final and this frigging giant of a man is standing behind you and it's Steve Price. <laughs> I was like, holy shit, Price, what's it doing, bro? <laughs> standing behind me like the Hulk. <laughs> um, but yeah, he told me that his son is uh, obviously going from Cowboys to Panthers. So yeah, exciting. We, uh, me and Timmy went to a Bulldogs game during the year, and we're in like the upstairs section, and they and it was actually the night that Riley Price made his debut, and they got Steve Price on stage, and um, I said, "I oh, had you go presenting the jersey." Was there tears? And he went, "No, nah, no, it was all good. I actually held it together, and then it hit him, and he lost it on stage." Oh, Steve he lost Price. on stage. Yeah. Oh, that's he, he, he was he was kind of bragging about how he held it together, and he didn't think he'd be able to. Yeah, and then all the emotion just oh, hit him, and the whole yeah, room good. just stood up and applauded. It was yeah, unreal. Good. Yeah, yeah, good. I just have one very quickly for the Panthers yeah. there. Uh, the Schneider man um, coming yeah. back from the Super League. I thought he was really good at the Raiders. A couple of clutch moments a few years ago. Won a few games off his own boot. Um, I reckon he's just got that. He'll kind of do that cogger roll where mm. he'll just jump in. And O'Sullivan did the year before when yeah. clear is away. I reckon him doing an apprenticeship for a year or two at Penrith. We're talking a lot about these teams who need a gun seven in a couple of years. I reckon he'll be one that teams will go for in a few years' time. Yeah, After I like that shout. Pan- yeah, you'll Panthers. be cheering him on very soon, Hammy. Yep. Oh, you reckon? I reckon there's every chance, yeah. Oh, I reckon Brad Schneider in that Panther side playing 5'8 here and there or whatever, I think he's going to look unreal. I think there'll be a lot of teams that will go yeah, for okay. him. Okay. The other one, Paul Alamotti, we've spoken about a lot, but hearing there's a very good chance that they could use him as like a jersey 17. Yeah, wow. Well, and I love reckon that. he's going to explode there. Yep. Take the the defensive reads and stuff out of his game and just get out there and yeah. rip and tear. And, and get him in that pack with those other guys, they'll yeah. elevate him. Fucking out there. He almost can play a similar role maybe to Spencer Lino. Obviously not at I that level. I think that's the exact plan. Yeah, yeah. okay. Jeez, that's, that's, if that does work out, could be it's one of the smartest fucking recruits all time. Sure is. <laughs> to yeah. take one of the best outside back centres coming through the grades and go, you know what, we're going to turn you into Spencer Lino? It's fucking hectic. <laughs> um, okay, on to the Raiders. Only signing is Sasangi from the Knights. Uh, but the biggest concern for the Raiders is just their real want to sign forwards. I just, for the life of me, I can't understand why they just keep, I guess, it all, they're always connected to forwards. Fafida, Keon. Now apparently they're connected to a, 
um, a forward over in the Super League. Sasangi, he is a forward? No, outside back. Outside back? Yeah. I mean, and then you look at the outside backs and you're like, okay, they've got Tomoko, Harley Smith Shields, um, Sebastian Chris, Rapana, Kotrick. Um, yeah. I just, I just surprised they aren't hyper aggressive in the spine. Mm. They have been hyper aggressive in the spine in their juniors, mm. which hopefully that can transition into first grade. Uh, but I agree, mate. Like the like. Jamal Fogarty, they, they got a few years ago, but outside of that, just no big signings. I think you'll see round one next year. I think young um, Chevy Stewart will start at fullback, yep. who I really like, got big potential. Um, I'll be honest, though, in the New South Wales under-19s, I thought he was pretty underwhelming mm. based on what I was expecting. Um, Ethan Strange is another one that can play 5'8 or centre. Uh, whether he starts the season at 5'8, I'm not too sure. Mm. Um, the other one, and it's, you know, it's, it's all been rumoured, but geez, like the whispers are strong about KO Weeks going there. There's another one that, fuck, a year ago, I thought KOH was going to be a star. Yeah. He was underwhelming as well, mm. realistically. Uh, so, yeah, they're in an interesting spot, the Canberra Raiders. Well, I'll tell you, the one on the losses that surprised me, mate, is Matt Frawley. Yeah. I know he's not a superstar, but Christ, when Jack leaves, <laughs> just Surely a good guy signing. to have. Yeah. yeah. And he'd be on minimum, pretty much. Um, he would be on minimum, yeah. Yeah. Like, look, what I'm not, I guess, understanding is they're going into the year not knowing who their fullback's going to be, their six going to be, or their nine. Yeah. That's surprising to me. Like all three of those positions where you would go, now look, I'm sure Ricky Stewart has a plan and I'm sure they've got, but outside looking in, you're like, no one no one in those three positions is playing so well that you go, yeah, lock, lock them in. Mm. That's, that's, that's what 75% of the spine. And you know, for me, I look a little bit further down the track that if we get to the end of this season and there's every chance that the Canberraers haven't actually sorted those positions out mm. just yet, um, I believe Ricky said the other day it was going to be Elliot Whitehead's last season, uh, Jordan Rappin's oh, last yep, season. Yep. And Josh Papali, I think he's got a player option for 2025. Yep. So, like, all of a sudden, the Canberra Raiders and who they are and who their DNA has been built on the last few years, those guys could go and they're still trying to work out who's in their spine. I hope it doesn't, but this could get ugly for the Canberra Raiders very quickly. This mm. is a big year for them. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it absolutely could because, again, you, you know – like you've got three players in your spine, three spots up for grab heading into a new year. Great forward pack, really overachievers last year, but that's that's 75% of your spine. Not only have they not played much together, they barely know each other. Mm. <laughs> like, like it's, it's, it's a lot. And then you've got Fogarty, who is a, a, solid, a solid seven that, you know, you know, has his moments, but he's not, hasn't really proven that he's a, a top eight, seven yet um, and he is a little bit older now so it's like it's not like you're rolling in with you know a top tier top four seven and then you just feel around him basically the whole spine is you know not even top eight yet it's not a top eight spine and that's and that's what's so amazing what they did last year the fact that they made the top eight is incredible and the fact that they took the knights to the death is incredible but it is it is alarming that not only now they didn't didn't they get someone from the Parrot Eels as well? Uh, they were meant to get a young bloke. I don't think that's been confirmed. Uh, yeah, so Ethan Sanders? Yeah. So it was basically all but confirmed according to reports. And then radio silence since then. So not really sure what's happened well, I there. I think it was meant to be a player swap for Harley Smith. But I think it still went through. I think it's gone through. Mm. And so if they have landed him, Chevy and Chevy uh, Stewart, Stewart yep. then maybe they are taking the, I guess... And then you listen to Ricky Stewart's words and you go, okay, all these players retiring. Now, he's probably not going to say rebuild because he's not about you know, that kind of language. But maybe in his head, he's going, you know what? It is a reset. So we're going to build our own fullback. We're going to build our own six. I'm not sure about the nine, if there's any good nines coming through. And that's how they're going to... Because one thing I said, um, you know, heading into even, I think, last year, I said, I think the Raiders, because it is so hard to recruit there, they need to be aggressive in the level under. And look, getting a guy from the Eels like uh, the player they got who killed it. Didn't he kill it for New South Wales? Yep. That's aggressive in the lower lower grades. I just uh, I can't read the article, but just saw a headline from the Canberra Times from August. It says, the Canberra Raiders play that almost landed them a Parramatta Eels half. So I'm not sure if that is done. Surely it got done. Surely it got done. Yeah, it's the loan deal that almost bolstered the Canberra Raiders half stocks for 2024. So I, I don't think it is done. <sighs> They need to get that done. Yeah. Like, 
maybe they're playing chicken at the moment and they're trying to get him for a little bit less. But seriously, I think they're in a position where they've got to pay him a little bit more than what they probably were hoping to. I know I've said it before, but I find it so bizarre that Ricky Stewart, you know, one of the greatest Canberra players we've ever seen who came from one of the most entertaining sides we have ever seen, one of the best halves himself, he just never has any spine players. Mm. Instead, he just chooses to do everything off just fucking grit all the time. <laughs> it's just so un-Ricky Stewart. Yeah. From everything I've known about him throughout his career, it's bizarre. Mm. Uh, positives, though, that guy like Ethan Strange, who went really well in the uh, New South Wales thing. Yep. Uh, New South Wales Queensland game. Hammy, what do you reckon with the, uh, the Raiders? Well, the Raiders, I don't know. I just think they, they didn't really put any teams away this year. They ground, you said they ground out a lot of wins. They didn't win a single game by 13 plus, like, you know, and then to not have a big signing in the spine or like anyone really coming in is it is it back or or and losing like, jackie whiten too yeah exactly i just i you know i grew up in Canberra, i got a bit of a connection to that area but i wonder whether they uh i can see them sliding a little bit next year to be honest with you great pack as you mentioned um a couple of guys getting a little bit older a uh, bit of a worry i reckon that uh yeah they haven't been able to get anyone in and um yeah i don't know i, I just think uh they probably they, they did well to get where they got this year yeah yeah and you know Timmy was talking about the other day how they've got this DNA of we make the finals, we make the top eight. And that, that's fantastic. It's, you know, it's much better than a lot of sides out there. But, I don't know, it just feels like the Raiders, they do make the eight, but then they get there and they're out of fucking gas. Because mm. they've had to play 30 weeks of finals footy to get there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yes, you're always making the eight, and that's unreal. It could be much worse. But are you ever legitimately winning, close to winning a comp? You know, f- for me, the last few years, it hasn't been that way. Mm. To that point, Guru, I just had a look at the sports bet odds. So it only has um, the futures uh, to win the comp, nothing else. The Raiders are actually the equal third, like, uh, worst team to win the comp, according to Sportsbet. So they've got Dragons and Tigers and then Dolphins and Canberra equal. Wow. For a team that made the finals last year. Interesting. Can you get up? Where do they sit to make the eight? That, that's the only market there is. So like, I, I reckon that they wouldn't line up. Mm. Like they, I bet you they're not, you know, odds yeah. to come fucking 14th. Yeah. But... Such yeah, an interesting. That is, it's almost like, yeah, we get you gritty, but you're never going to win a comp. You're not going to win the comp. Yeah, not yeah. never. And I don't mean never as in, in the future. I'm just saying, you know, currently. Uh, okay. So, look, we've spoken about it quite a lot, but I think they've – look, if they do land the Parramatta Eels guy, the Strange, the Chevy Stewart um, – I keep going to say Chevy Chase. The, the, Parramatta, yeah. the Parramatta Eels guys is Ethan Saunders. Saunders, yeah. Uh, the cam- the yeah, the young gun is strange. They've already got. There's so many Ethan's yeah, flying that. around. What I'm saying is Ethan Strange really good because he's going to be brought into the top squad. And so, oh yeah, you got a strike outside back that can also play six. Then you've got Stray um, Saunders, Sa- Saunders Sanders, yeah, who killed it at seven for the Blues. Yep. And then you've got the New South Wales under 19 fullback. That's exciting. That's exciting. It's yep. just hope they can get it all together. If that is the plan from Ricky, it's a great plan. It's a great plan because you're building from within, within essentially. Like if you get them before they play first grade, um, then I can totally see the direction uh, Ricky's heading in. Yeah, and you, and you can see, like, obviously Joe Tarpano signed to 2027. Um, Corey Horsburgh's taking his game to a new level. He's there to 2027. I think Ata Mariota and Trey Mooney are going to be very important to this club over the next three or four years. Oh, massive, massive. Yeah. The, the only thing with, with Saunders is I think <clears throat> if the deal isn't done yet, they've I know Ricky's such a tough, hard man and he's got these standards that he refuses to budge on, but I just think sometimes you just got to go, you know what? Because, like, if they don't land Saunders, like, what are they going to do f- for the next... <laughs> yeah, Seb Chris could be playing halfback before he he's, knows. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, who, who plays in that role going forward? I don't, I don't know. You know, Fogarty's only got a couple of years left, I'd assume. Um, and that's all. I think eventually the Raiders, they have to make a decision here. Okay, do we want to be... There and thereabouts, or do we want to genuinely have a crack at yeah. the premiership here? And the, from what I've seen with Strange, I think he's more of a centre than a 5'8 at NRL level. I just don't know if he has the ball playing for, for NRL. Yeah, he, coming through, he's a 5'8. Um, when he was at the Roosters, he was a 5'8. He was very handy. He, I think he lost their SG ball grand final. But ever since arriving down there, I think he has played centre. And, and he played centre for New South Wales as well. Yeah, yeah so <clears throat> interesting one. Yeah. Okay, now on to the Roosters. Uh, big recruit, Spencer Lenu and Dom Young. Uh, now, I, I love the recruitment of Spencer, but the question remains is, like, how will he be used? And also, how much was he signed for? If he was signed for uh, a, a decent price, you go, fuck, what a great signing. If he was signed for a starting front rower's price, you go, might be good, 
But we just don't know yet. We just don't know. Even on the weekend for Samoa, I only played 41 minutes. Um, and so if he is signed on the main front rower, for, like him and Lindsay Collins, if they're the guys going forward, would you assume he'd, you hope to get 50, 60 minutes out of him each week? Yeah, I think so. But I, I also – it wouldn't surprise me if next year he is still a bench guy, same role at Penrith. But, mate, I reckon – the once JWH retires, I reckon it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if they have a plan for him to be the spearhead asshole in this pack. Mm. You saw what he did for Samara on the weekend. <clears throat> I, I reckon there's a very good chance he becomes that guy. Because I, I think that Lindsay Collins is a very good front rower, but I, I don't think he's got that JWH about him. Well, he, he's, he's got the toughness. He's got the toughness. Doesn't have the... Doesn't have the shit in his game. The shit. Which you need. Which you need in rugby yes. league. And I reckon Spencer Lee knew they would have in their plans for him to be that dude. And... You know, I look at their side for next year, they, when they're all fit, you're going to have JWH and Lindsay Collins that'll play for the first 25 minutes. Then comes Spencer Lenu and Terrell May. Well, there's not many sides in this competition that you go, fuck, I think I'd rather get beaten up by their starting front row forwards and their bench guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. yeah if, if they can keep those four guys fit, I know we've said it every year, but there is absolutely no excuse for the Roosters not to play finals footy next he'll, year. He'll have a good chance to uh, show what he's got there for the first six weeks because JWH is out still. Oh, uh, yeah. They're, um, going nuts against the Tigers there. so That's a good um, point. Yeah, he's going to have to probably probably start yeah. the first part of the year. Because like the concern I have is if you have signed him and he's going to play bench and he's on 700K, like, fuck, that smashes your cap. Yep. Smashes your cap. But maybe they're, they're looking ahead and going, okay, we take a bit of a hit the first year, but if we want him to replace Hargreaves, then that's a, a solid rate for a, a, a top-tier front rower. Because um, I do think Spencer has it in him. We just haven't seen him play seen week him, in, yeah. week out, 50 to 60 minutes a game, being the main front rower. Yeah, but he also hasn't needed to. Yeah. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if the, the Roosters will make it work. Yeah, bloody oath, they good there. Uh, quickly, just a quick potential answer on the Sand Ethan Saunders Sanders thing. Um, apparently, he's agreed to terms for twenty twenty five, and it's the whole twenty twenty four thing that's caused the hold up. Oh, so, okay, yeah, very so, messy. So, to give the Raiders credit, there's clearly a plan there. Then they yeah. clearly have gone aggressive in the direction we thought they would, which is the a rookie. Yeah. Um, so it might be a, a bit of a tough growing year for them next year if they, they can't get him across early enough. Um, and once again, like full credit to the Canberra, as we've said for a number of years, it's very hard for them to recruit guys. To be able to recruit that many 18, 19 year olds to go good. down to Canberra, well done. Bloody good. Oh, mate, I'm such a fan of the Raiders um, set up. Like, I, I think they overachieve so much. And, and that's not it. I'm not saying they overachieve because they're not good. Their forward pack and their outside backs are great. It's just so hard to recruit there in key yep. positions. And for the last five years, they've had a centre playing six and they've managed to do what they did. Like, I just don't think a lot of other clubs have that kind of grid in them the way the Raiders have it in them. Yeah. Um, okay, with the Roosters, <clears throat> yeah, so Spencer Lino, I, I can't wait to see him. It, like, think about the kind of player he is and think about the kind of player Trent Robinson loves. Like, the firebrand, warriors, in your face kind of stuff. I can't wait to see him in a Roosters jersey. Uh, Dom Young, Dom Young. Very interesting to see what they do with that back line now. Because you got Suali'i, who'll be on one wing, but then you got Tupu. Will Suali'i be on one wing? Well, he's not going to be centre, surely. Or do you reckon they, they can? I don't know. If he's, if he's not centre, are you not going to play Dom Young? That's what, that's what I'm, the question. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. I Suali'i on one wing, then you've got Tupu, club legend. Surely he doesn't lose his spot. I don't think. Yeah, but uh, I mean, if you're the Roosters and you're looking at the future, and Suali'i's about to pack his bags to go to Union. Rezzy's or centre? Well, I, you know, I, I didn't think he did all that well at left centre. And I, and I was the one all pre-season calling for it. But like, I don't think you can leave Dom Young out of this side. I know. That's, that's that could be the best winger in the game for the next 10 years. That's, mm. that's the question I'm asking is, like, how do you fit these three fucking man mountains into this side? Yeah, it's, it's almost like if they get to, you know, trials and they happen to have an injury, I think they'll go... Okay. Yeah, thank you. One God. less decision we have to make. Yeah, yeah, and one less beloved player we have to piss off. Because, like, you've got guys like Sandon Smith, you've got guys like Connor Watson. Like, it's not like you can carry an extra outside back on the bench just mm. to get him in the side either. Like, they've, they're going to, if they're all fit, they're going to have to make tough decisions. Yeah. And if you're an outside back at the Roosters that get injured or suspended, not named Joey Marnie, you're going to be shitting yourself. Oh, mate. You miss one game, you could yeah. be gone. You could be gone. Uh, do they. Does Suali'i spend a whole preseason at centre and maybe that helps him his game? Maybe. He's still so young. 
He's so young. He's like yeah. 21 or something. But, but, but once again, if I'm the Roosters, am I going, okay, I've just spent five or six years getting the very best out of Billy Smith I can. I finally got him fit. Am I going to move him out of this side to let Suley play for a year and then go yeah. to Union? Fuck. That's where, like, I'm not I, I'm not overly confident that Suley is going to be in that starting side. If he wasn't going to Union, it's a completely different conversation. Yeah. Do you think they release him early then? Do you think potentially? Do you think Suli wants to leave earlier at the oh, moment? I, I, that's the other thing. I don't know if Suli even wants to go to Union anymore. I'd be, I'd if be I'm Suli, I would not be going. <laughs> yeah. I would not be going. And I don't. I'm not saying that as an insult. I'm saying that purely looking at the two situations that are going on right now, I would not be going. Yeah, and that's where you know, I like. I, I don't know what the Roosters' plans are with um, Billy Smith, but like, he's another one that Parramatta could potentially reach out to. Because there's other young guys there as well that are very, very talented that are coming through. Well, like, look at Ponga that come in at the end of the year. He was fucking yep. great. Robert Toy is another one that's been injured last few years. He's signed for three years. So, man, they've got so many options. And there's only one guy that isn't going to be there the year after, and it's Suli. Mate, you know what's – it just – apologies, Eels fans, for going back to it. But it just makes it even more bizarre that they can't go and raid the Roosters outside backs. Like, New South Wales Cup team and just get a good, good centre or good winger. Yep. Like a uh, anyway. Could you uh, see him having a crack at Suli and getting him? As, sorry? To go into the Eels. I think that the Roosters won't let him play for any other club. Yep. I think it's either, mate, you go to the Wallabies or you Okay. You, I just the Roosters are very like that, yep. where they go, mate, you either like for example when Sonny when Sonny Bill left, they yep. said if you come back it has to be with us. And he obviously came back. Um I just the Roosters are way too ruthless. To allow him to go and kill it at another club. Yep. Could you imagine him in a Parrot Eels jersey killing it? <laughs> you know, Parrot Eels would be like, nah, we don't like outside backs. <laughs> <laughs> no, Not interested, Suli. No, thank you, sir. <laughs> um, yeah, so this 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 back conundrum is a they should none of these backs should be playing reserve grade. Yeah, and we are going to be sitting on the plane to Vegas having the exact same conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look. Hasn't been confirmed yet. Uh, get back to you. I'll be sitting on the plane calling you. <laughs> <out there. laughs> um, yeah. Anyway. Got to keep trying. <laughs> keep plugging away. Plug away. <laughs> keep plugging away. There's a few extra seats on the bloke <laughs> private jet. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm going to take the bloke copter. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, in regards to recruitment, I mean, Bruce has done it again. Gone out and recruited fucking top tier in key positions like you know, in, in important positions. It's almost and like the salary cap's not a factor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you have got to give full credit to the Roosters that we're looking at them now going, geez, how do they get Dom Young in this squad too? When they signed Dom Young, he was the guy that, oh, I don't know, is he first grade standard? Isn't he? Like, they didn't yeah. sign him at his peak. They signed him when a lot of people were questioning defence, you know, <laughs> if he, you know, it just, just oh, concentration for the game. in yeah. general. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, crazy to think that you look at this side – is it better than last year's side on paper? <laughs> yep. Which is insane. Yep. And yep. you have a look at their losses. Honestly, I reckon the average fan, if you were to ask them at the end of next season, who did the Roosters lose this year? I don't know how many of them they'd be able to name. No. Yeah. All, you know, fringies or, you know, off the bench or, uh, yeah. So, yeah. They came home with a wet sail and they've added some, some good, good options there. Like, they're going to be good next year. Far Honestly, out. last year couldn't have gone much worse for them. Seriously. They went to, what, finals week two. It's crazy. Yep. It's crazy. Uh, but, yeah, I cannot wait to see how they use Spencer Leno and uh, Dom Young. Really good recruitment, as usual, from the Roosters. I think the, the Roosters' recruitment has never been a concern. They are, they're the best in the business, essentially, at recruitment. The question will be now is finding a style of footy that they all play well at. That's the question heading into next year. JWH only signed at the end of 2024. These last year, you reckon? I think so. I think so. Surely his body is being held on by a thread. Mate, he's played 300 games in the middle as a front rower. It's incredible, isn't it? It's actually a joke. Actually a joke. And it's not like he fucking played... He was a battler that just ground through work. Like, he is the tough guy. Will he knock up 300 games for the Roosters? He'd have to go close, wouldn't he? He obviously started with the Seagulls. I don't know how long he played there, though. Yeah. Easy, easy. He's yeah. on 292 for Roosters. Wow. What an achievement to play 300 games for one club as a front row forward. Actually insane. Being that guy. Crazy. Yeah. At the Roosters everyone too. Everyone wants to belt every week. The Roosters, the ruthless Roosters that will flick you in a sec. And also, like, in fairness, missing a lot of games too. Yeah, because yeah, of suspension. Stuff, like. 
Could have been 400. Mate. <laughs> yeah, it could have been Smithy soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to the Sharkies. Uh, they have no gains. Um, you know, looking at key positions, relatively locked in. A oh, Hines, long re-signing. Uh, Kennedy is there. Uh, you got guys like um, Talakai there for a long time. Katoa, Mulatalo. Like, squad health in signing is, is quite good. Uh, the, the, the key one, though, is... The fact that they're losing Wade Graham in that edge back row position was a concern and did change when he was playing there. That left side defense, concern all year. Boys, I want to throw a schmokey up, and we might already spoke about this a while ago, oh, sorry, last week. I reckon they go after Curran, put him on that edge. Mm. Yeah, I am shocked that that's a name that hasn't come up already today. Mm. Yeah, I think it'd be a really good signing. Uh, I also think there is something in potentially moving Talakai to the second row and playing Ido. Yeah, okay. So, um, and just getting Talakai to work on his D and communication all fucking off season. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Because uh, it's going to be a huge problem because as soon as they move Wade Graham to that edge, it all seemed to be okay. Uh, but I think that, like you can't replace experience like mm. Wade Graham, so it is definitely going to be a hole that they haven't filled. Uh, need to find a way to. I like your shout though. I, I, think, I honestly, I think you could say that for about eight different clubs. Yeah, I mean, Curran would go well, yeah. but I think Curran is perfect for the Sharks because he's a defensive machine. He loves it. Yeah, put him on an edge. He's not playing in the middle at thirteen, so he doesn't get to through. Get doesn't need to get through a mountain of work. Offers enough in attack, but you've got Talakai and Mulatalo. He, like, he offers a lot more in attack than what we've seen for sure. Sure, But like, so that's great. It's a great part of his game. If you can use it, awesome. But you've got Talakai. Mulatalo, Katoa, Jesse Ramian as the outside backs. Strike is not an issue for the Sharks. They had the most points scored for most of the season last year. So there's no issue with strike. So what do you do? You go out and get a guy who you know is a bloody good defender. You know he talks a lot. He's quite vocal. I think Curran would be the perfect signing. You probably wouldn't have to sign him for too much as well. I think he'd fit in absolutely exactly what they need. Get a very good value signing there. Oh, mate, it'd be perfect. He's already he, he's got uh, roots in Sydney. He was with the Roosters. And also, like a guy like Curran, if you're at the Roosters, you're doing something right. You've got a lot to your game. that, And he, he proved it at the Warriors, but I, I think that the Sharkies... If the Sharkies don't go after Curran, I do believe that left edge position is a key, key recruitment that they need to sort out in the uh, off-season. Yeah, and it was a problem all year. Mm. All year until they moved Wade there, so I completely agree, mate. What do you reckon, Amy? Uh, yeah, I agree, Curran. I reckon he's a great get. Would be a great get for a, a stack of teams, but could fit that gap really nicely. You say no gains, but as uh, broken exclusively on the Bloke podcast earlier, watch this space, uh, Jerome Luai. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jerome Luai gains. We'll watch Immediate that with, release, you reckon? We'll watch that with great interest. Okay. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> yeah. Breaking news with Hammy. Yeah. There you go. Back to you guys in the studio. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and, guys, just a reminder, this is just transfer chat. We will do the full breakdown of, like, rosters, strengths, weaknesses, everything later uh, towards next year. Um, Jackie Whiten. Uh, this is another club that we won't talk about that much because – uh, haven't been that active in the tr- transfer market, but obviously huge signing, Jackie Wyden. I don't think there's a question on how good he can play, what he can do. The question is, mm. where do you play him? I think you put him on an edge as a forward. I disagree. I think you play him at left centre. I think that uh, assuming that Keon Komatangi is going to play right edge for South Sydney, I think putting Jack at left edge back row is a waste. I think that spot is... Based on how they've played the last few years, it's you know the number one decoy in rugby league. Never mm. gets any ball. I just think Jack would be a waste there personally. I'd be playing him at centre. But like, if he's the number one decoy, he's the scariest motherfucking decoy ever. And also, maybe you give him the ball. Yeah, maybe. But I think <laughs> Cody Walker's shown his hand over the last few years. That's not how he likes to play. But like, I think that Jackie White and Cody Walker have such a connection that he probably would play to him. But I, I understand what you're saying. Mm. With all the information that we have, like why would you put such a gun on the edge there? I just think he would find a way to put himself in the game and whether that's fucking tough as anything hit-ups. Um, and I just – I think Tass, Tass and Campbell in the centres, I like it. Mm. Yeah. I like it. So would you put Tass to a wing then or Tyron Munro? Uh, Tass, yeah, I'd either have him on right wing, depending on how Ty Munro um, develops. I'm, you know, I'm obviously the biggest Ty Munro fan in the world, but he is still very raw. Mm. You might find to start the season, uh, you might be better off having Isaiah Tass there. You, mm. just, you know what you're going to get every week. He's consistent. I think eventually it'll be Ty Munro for sure. Uh, but, yeah, unfortunately Isaiah Tass would be the unlucky one for me. I would definitely be playing wide at left centre. So who would your wingers be? Johnston? 
Johnson and Ty, or if 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 Ty is not looking as raw as what he was last year, I'd go with him. If not, <coughs> Isaiah Tass will do a job there. You've yeah. also got Isaac Thompson. You've got so many options. Oh man, because okay, so would you continue to put Jai Arrow on that edge there, Jacob Host? Who would you put there? Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't mind which of them. What I you, prefer Jai Arrow as a middle, but it sounds like he wants to play edge, Matty. I think you'd rather play middle. Rather play middle? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What I would do is I would have White at left back row so I could keep Tass at left centre. And then on the right wing, you've got the option of Munro or Thompson. I think with, like, obviously the troll does his best work not coming out of his own half. We want him to, you know, do all his damage when they're on the attack kind of thing. And Alex Johnson, as safe as he is, he isn't like a meter eater. So having someone like Thompson back there would be good. Or if they want to unleash... Ty Munro, I reckon those two can kind of fight for that position. But yeah, I, I like Tass at left, uh, Jackie White at left back row. But do I think that's what they'll do? No, I think they'll put Jack White at centre. I will say you, you bring up a good point of the Rabbitohs do really lack go forward out of their own end in the modern era. Mm. Because what have we seen? Panthers essentially change the game where you go, oi forwards, take a rest. Our boys have got it. We, we're basically front rowers on the edge. Whereas you look at the, the Rabbitohs and, and Latrell, although he could do that if he wants to, he's, not, he's more of a, he's a Ferrari rather than a guy that is going to get through you know, 40, 30 runs and all the tough hit-ups. Um, and you don't want him doing that because he's so silky in, in attack, so you don't want him tired. But then you look at the wingers, Johnson, not the biggest winger. Then if you put Tass on the winger, he would get through the work, but he's not breaking tackles. You've got Thompson that could do that. But then the argument for that would be maybe you do put Jackie White in at centre so that he can take those tough carries coming out of his end, which he would be some of the best in the comp. Yeah, then you got Campbell Graham and you got Jack taking that second and third hit up, which, which is I really like. Fucking unbelievable. Mm, yeah. Probably Campbell Graham and Whiten taking that third, second and third hit up is probably the best one two punch for centres in the comp. Yeah, I also I, I think that if things don't turn around at South Sydney, like uh, you know, I, I love this squad, I'm so excited by it. But there's no doubt there was issues there at the back end of the season. Um, you know, they have got a young half back there who, who I think it wouldn't surprise me if at some point this year we get a halves combination of White and Walker. That wouldn't surprise okay. me. Okay. Oh man, I don't like that. I, I don't love it either, but it wouldn't surprise me if that occurs. I just. I hope, and it's just my opinion, it, I'm happy to be wrong. I hope Demetrio doesn't even have an inkling of him being a half in his head. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm with you. And he's, he's played his best footy, Jack, in the last couple of years at centre, I reckon. Mm. Origin games, mm. blown him apart, been really good. Um, I, I'm with you. I think didn't didn't look like he was offering a great deal there for the Raiders at six last year. I think great opportunity to get out of there, go and just play some footy um, yep. with a bit of space. Just watching him play for Australia in that World Cup. Far out. Yeah. It was so good. And he just simplified his game. Even when he got moved to centre to in the finals matches, I thought it just helped simplify his game and just do what he does best and just fucking... Mm -hmm. Completely agree. Wouldn't no, shock no, me no. if it occurs. Oh, though. mate, I agree with you. I, I think Cody Walker is, as the older he gets, I think he's more and more showing, in my opinion, that he could, could be play seven. seven and do well there. Because he's almost been forced to because of yep. form and that. Yeah. Look, the, the, the problem, I, not the problem, but the concern with it is it's the easy option. It's the safe option of... All right, I'm going to put Jackie White in at six. six. I'm going to put Cody Walker. It's almost like a band aid solution. Mm. When you've got Lockie Ellis, we know Lockie Ellis is good enough to get you a prelim at the very least. On top of that, you've got Hawkins, who is the New South Wales Cup and State Cup winning seven. So you've got young guys that can play that position. And that's where I'd be like, yeah, I get it that Jackie White and Walker are experienced six and seven. It's a very easy, safe option. But You've got such guns in that position. Like, I just, yeah, I, I want to see him. I want to see him at either centre or back row. I would probably put him back row, but if he's at centre, I do not mind whatsoever. The spot I don't want to see him is at fullback. Oh, which man. there's been a bit of talk about. I and what uh, the trail at centre? Centre, I guess. I don't know. There's been a bit of talk about it. I personally can't see a world where it happens. No, surely not. I reckon, I reckon he's South's third string fullback. I'm putting Munro there before one. Seriously. Yeah. I'm putting AJ there before him, I, too, yeah. so he's probably fourth. Yeah. <laughs> I um, I will get it, get into it in the season preview, squad preview, but, I mean, really, everything hinges on Trell coming back, fit, healthy, keen. That really, it really does change everything for him. Yeah. That's yeah. how good he is. I think that, yeah, that on top of whatever the hell is going on off-field there. But I think I think that he has so much sway and, like, I don't want to say power because Trell's just a player, guys. He, he doesn't walk around telling people what to do. Power's the wrong word. Influence, though, mm. 
If he comes back, boys, this is the fucking year. And I said it's the year. Everyone follows him. Mm. And it almost doesn't matter what's happening upstairs because they've got leaders like Cody Walker in the side. They've got an incredible roster. And he, he's one of the most influential players in the competition. Like He rolled into Origin Camp and said, boys, this is the fucking year. And I know Tommy Trojevic got the you know player of the series, but he was infectious in that group. You could see him saying, this is my redemption. This is our redemption. They won by a record margin. Mm. Yeah. And people don't like to admit it because he's a polarizing character. Mate, go back and watch that series and tell me he wasn't a key reason why you won by a record margin in that series. He was unbelievable. Not unbelievable. Totally uh, but yeah, Jackie Whiten, I reckon, I reckon you stick him on an edge. It's... Uh, What's bizarre, it's it's almost like he just extended um, Demetrio. But like this is almost a – this almost adds pressure to Demetrio's role because it's going, mate, you had a premiership potential winning side this year. You added Jack Whiten to it. If you struggle more, it's like holy shit. Yeah, and that's where, you know, if they don't turn it around, jeez, the media is just going to oh beat God. up. Sam Burge is returning. There's oh. going to be a lot of mm. – that's that's my worry with South Sydney, that they don't start well. And, you know, if they're not starting well and they're going to have to fly to fucking Vegas and then, like, it disrupts their preseason yeah. a little bit. Um, I, you know, they, they've got the talent that they should be able to overcome all those things, but I do think there is the potential for this to yeah. really go belly well, the key The key for them, it's not, it's not on the field. It's not in the preseason training. It is sorting out everything off the field. Yeah, that's if they don't sort that out, everything else doesn't matter. Um, okay, now Melbourne Storm, no gains. Uh, oh, we feel like a broken record, guys. Feel like a broken record in regards to Storm. We've been saying it for a couple of years now. They need forwards. Now there has been reports that Sean Bloor may be uh, considered to come to the club. There were even reports that Pappenhausen was getting shopped. Uh, now that has been essentially denied by the storm. Um, but then the article was like, it was a third party. I hope not. I hope not. Um, because yes, there's no one more excited about Fa along or in this whole community than I am. I cannot wait to see him play. But at the end of the day, Ryan Pappenhausen has done it in a grand final. Mm. He's been there and done that. I hope it isn't the case that they're shopping him around. I hope they give him a fair opportunity to come back next year. I understand he's been injured for the season, but I hope he's given a fair opportunity to prove what he can do. I read in the article that Frank Panisi scoffed at the suggestion. So the, the thing is, is like, is it another party? You know what I mean? Like, so that, that's what I'm saying. Storm have denied it. Well, they've scoffed at it. So it sounds like they're like no chance, but it's always like when there's a bit of smoke, sometimes you get a yeah. bit worried. And also with the injury concern, but I hope that that's not the case. Um, I really do hope that he gets a fair opportunity to cement that fullback spot next year. Yeah, uh, obviously smoke, fire, that sort of stuff. But I'm not buying it myself. Yeah. I think it'll be as you said, mate. Like I think people forget he is a Clive Churchill medalist on the biggest stage. You're putting like, pressure on Teddy. Yeah, mm. Origin. Yeah, um, and he, you know, in six months' time, he could be putting pressure on Teddy again. Mm. If he comes out and absolutely lights it up at the start of this season, he'll be right in those conversations again. Um, so yeah, I I think he will be there long term. The gains, just no forwards there. I think Bloor would be a really good get. Bloor is a great get because they need an edge back rower. And, and him in the Storm system, are yeah. you kidding me? We'll talk about it soon, but like, I reckon it'd work out well for both clubs. Maybe just no lemon is just time for a change. Yeah. Because that's oh, out for outside backs. Apologies, listeners. Yeah, you just mentioned it. But the trade apparently was going to be Olam yeah. for Bloor. Apologies. Yeah. Which would be, I think that'd work well for both clubs. But I do think Melbourne would probably be the biggest winner. I'd love to see Bellamy get his hands on Bloor. Mate. Bloor could be one of the better back rows in the competition. Yeah. Like, and he goes down to Storm system. He's been incredibly unlucky how it's played out that as soon as he came into first grade, he got injured. Mm -hmm. And then whilst he was injured, the Tigers had the opportunity to get their hands on some of those back rowers, Isaiah Papali, Johnny Bateman, which I think you've got the opportunity to sign those guys. I don't care who your young back rowers are. You've got to take that opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so Bloor could be an edge guy. I think he could play as a middle as well, be a nice little 13. He actually could be the 13 that maybe they've never had. Mm. They've always sort of had that. Just third front row forward. Um, so and I then mean, you push King into the front row rotation? Yeah. So you, you'd you start with either Kamakamitha and King and Bloor? Yeah, and then what, bring Nass off the bench? Well, maybe. Um, yeah. Or you start I, you with know, Nass? I, I really like the Bloor signing, but I, I'm i also not sure if he's that momentum guy. Oh, he's not the momentum guy, about. no, for sure. So I think he, he'd be a good addition, but I don't think he solves problems. 
No, I, I think that um, he's not the. You need a top tier front rower. That's what yeah. they like. They need a an origin level Mick Crocker kind of stuff. Yeah. Crocker, 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 Jared Crocker. <laughs> Got mixed up. <laughs> Mick Crocker kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Um, I forgot his fucking name because he head hide me in the semi final. <laughs> Try to kill me. I was lucky the There's boys. Not many guys I'd want to get head hide by, but Mick Crocker not really at the top of my list. <laughs> yeah, well, he's lucky the boys are holding me back. That's for sure. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> fucking LA. Fucking nearly unleashed hell on the poor bloke. <laughs> he would have been a uh, Matty the Waterboy hero <laughs> as a kid, right? Got yeah. Oh yeah, he was. He was one of those like on the tw- on the wall. 20, 2014 Premiership heroes that didn't that wasn't actually at the club that year. Like him, Roy Asatasi was another one. Um, yeah, I love Crocker. Actually, sorry, yeah, you got Christian Welsh, so you'd probably be starting Welsh. Oh, fuck, of course, yeah. King. Yeah. Anyway. I do think they need to, like, and look, Christian Welsh may find his form again, um, his origin form again. He, how old is he now, though? Is he, what, 26, 27? Um, had a few ACLs. Yeah. But I do think they just need a, they need to go on the market for a... Is that for Welsh? Yeah. 29. Yeah. 29. 29. 29. So he's a little bit older. Yeah. It is interesting, like, they're in such a unique position where they've got the best nine, seven, six, potentially one combination <clears throat> in the league. And they just haven't been able to go out and just find that one guy from another club that's struggling to just go, hey, you come here and make an impact, you can win a comp here. Yeah. It's yeah. such an interesting situation. Like, for example, Tino changes everything for him. Yeah. Like, you just put one Tino in that pack and it goes from, oh, they win a comp, they can win a comp. Um, so I just think they need to be super aggressive. I need – look, it's, it's shocking, you're right. It, it is quite shocking because we know they've got money – we know they've got salary cap because they, they tried to get Tino to the club. And we also know that um, Jesse was on a decent wicket. So it is surprising they haven't been able to – not only – they don't even need to take someone on unders. They can pay someone market value and they haven't been able to get them down to Melbourne. Yeah, the one that I think would have been really interesting here, and I think he's going to do very well at the Roosters, but Spencer Lenya. Mm. I reckon he could Momentum. have been the perfect guy for them. I reckon a guy that would be great for his career, and sorry, Hammy, Stefano. Mm. I disagree. <laughs> I think he's fine where he is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another shout. You're actually like you're actually right. <laughs> <laughs> another shout, and it could be very real. Daniel Saifidi. Yep, that's a great shout. Yeah, I stole it from the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, shout out to the comment section. <laughs> shout out to the comment uh-huh. section. I really like the shout because he's not a young forward anymore. He's 25, 26 or so. He's played Origin. He's been solid, but you put him in the storm system, got all the makings of a fucking gun big boy front rower. Imagine him, Nelson, coming at you. Oh, my God. Yeah, be one hell of a combo. Jesus. So I, re- I, I reckon the storm should go quite aggressively at him because think about it. Knights can't afford him, getting squeezed out. The storm were looking to pay substantial money for Tino. They're not going to pay the same for Daniel. That does in they're not going to have to. So he'd be able to essentially get his market value down at the storm. Yeah. It's a fucking win for everyone. Did they have a crack at um, Tommy Flogler? I'm not sure, but I, 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 my, I'd heard whispers they tried for Ter- uh, May, for Terrell May, but Flegler would have been fucking... Interesting that, like, that, that connection Billy Slater has to all these Maroons that he hasn't been able to mm. maybe lure one down there. Yeah, well, I think Flegler would have signed probably before Origin with the Dolphins, maybe. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah early, wasn't he? Um, but yeah, that, that slate of connection in the camp, that's going to be interesting too. To, to well, maybe they thought it. that he'd be able to get I Tino think, down there. I honestly think they thought that the Tino deal, they offered him such a massive wicket and long-term deal. I think they, they thought they were going to get him. Honestly, when I look at their spine, I I don't know what price tag it would have taken for them to sign Tino for me to go. That's ridiculous. Mm, yeah, like with the side with the side they've got right now and with that spine to just add a Tino in, I like honestly if they paid him huge overs like one point two, I'd be like, yeah, okay, but that's what they need. Yeah, it's the last thing they need. It's the last and piece you can of win a comp in the next two years. Yeah, agreed. And also, he's still only twenty three years old. Yeah. <laughs> like, so yeah, I think that they went really hard for Tino, and they thought that they were going to blow everyone out of the water. They've maybe underestimated how much Tino wanted to make the journey work, that choice to go to Gold Coast and make it all work. Um, and it, you know, it's why, you know, one week it was Tino may sign a five-year deal to Tino just sign a freaking a thousand-year-long deal with the Gold Coast Titans. 
I know it's a big if and whatnot, but geez, it'd be interesting if like Buller hadn't just popped up at the West Tigers. Mm. If you could offer like a swap deal for uh, um, Sua for a year mm. and try and get S- Stefano down there. Mate, I, I think he'd be great down there. Big bopper in the middle, get him fit. I'm trying to think. Like, I, I, I think that when you got Ryan Pappenhaus, these sort of guys, like, like Far Longo is probably the one that you could loan to someone to try and maybe get that get forward Stefano. back. Oh, yeah, the, uh, maybe a, oh, but Bullers come through, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what makes yeah. it hard. The Tigers wouldn't be your option there. But they're, yeah. Would you like, oh, yeah, yeah, Tigers wouldn't work. We'll yeah. find a spot for him. <laughs> come on down. Um, so, yeah, as we've always said, guys, really, really. Uh, Even at the Raiders, if you were to maybe do like a swap deal there yeah. and try and get one of their boys, like a Horsburgh, a Tarpanay. For like a a, we probably couldn't get a Tarpanay, yeah. to be fair. That's probably a little bit overs. But like a Trey Mooney or a Marialta, I don't know, one of those guys. Papaliti, a bit old. What you're after there? Probably a little bit too yeah. old for me. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, but yeah. Oh, that's, that's where we think that's going. Now, on to the Tigers. Um, look, I know it's been a tough couple of years. <laughs> couple more 15. than... Yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> and look, the club, it's absolute Kevin Nangamas. But... Next year's our year. Just, you know. When you look at the recruitment over the last 24 months, they've done a pretty bloody good job. Best in class. Mate, they might be. Jokes aside, for situation it's in, it's not far from best in class. It's unbelievable that they've managed to get this many. Well, look at the dragons right now. <laughs> yeah, they can't recruit a fucking soul. Yeah, like whereas the tigers, it's a you know, it's a out and out bas- basket case. They've recruited gun forwards. They got a gun um, buller uh, fullback. They managed to get Bud's Jaden Sullivan, who yeah, yeah didn't work at the dragons, but he's one of the better halves coming through. They're bringing Caesar back from Leeds. He'll get the job done. They got Latu Fanu and uh, Samuela Fan- Fanu as well coming through. Like their recruitment is, it's almost a miracle that they've managed to get all these people to the club. It's very impressive. And, you know, obviously on field's been a shit fight, but like, just if I was a player, just watching all the other stuff that goes on at the Tigers, I would just go, nah, not for me. Not for me. But they've managed to overcome that. Like even Aiden Caesar, mate, like a lot of people have bagged Caesar and said that they don't think it's going to lead to anything. Like, all we say about the Cam Raiders is that they don't have enough in their spine. He got them to a grand final. Three, oh, mate, I ago. used to argue with Raiders fans all the time when they would bag the shit out of Caesar. I'm like, oi, he got you to a grand final. Yeah, okay, is he Joey Johns? No, he's not. But he got you to a grand final and you, and you, you stoked he's leaving. What's happened since? What's happened since? I'll tell you what, Campy, if I would have had Guru about 10 years ago, Caesar would have been at the top of my list <laughs> when he was coming through. <laughs> Oh, mate, I used to argue all the time. He, he does this, he takes poor options. Like, yeah, but you're in a grand final. And he's just a good solid seven and he doesn't break the bank. They'd kill for Caesar over the last few years. Um, anyway, like, look, is he going to come back and kill it? No, but at the, for, what the, for the position the Tigers are in right now, they just lost Luke Brooks and they didn't think they were going to lose, lose Luke, Luke Brooks. They got Jaden Sullivan. They got Latu Fainu. They look at their forward pack. Happy chorus out. If you take away all the off-field stuff, everything going on there, this is good recruitment. This is really good recruitment. I agree. And even, you know, the losses. Luke Brooks, it was time. Dane Laurie was doing, you know, well, but, like, I still think you were playing him out of position realistically. Ken Mamala, you weren't using. Joe Fangawa, you weren't really using anything. Tommy Talao wasn't, you know, setting the world a lot there. So even their losses, I don't think it's any... I don't think there's any huge losses in there. Mm-hmm. Dane Laurie was very handy to have, but you were playing him out of position and, you know, you've now got... You can't tell me Sullivan can't... You've you got know, genuine play, ball yeah, players there, yeah. which is what you want. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I personally think that Dane Laurie playing 5'8", he was very good there, but he's not a 5'8". Mm-hmm. You became reliant on, fuck, let's see what Dane can do. Yeah, yeah. And he you just know? had a dig. And you've got a good enough squad to actually be building through sets and whatnot, instead of just relying on what Dane Laurie might be able to pull out of his ass here and there. So oh, I think the Tigers are in a better spot. Well, quick one for you, Guru, the, the fine news. How excited should I be about them as a Tigers fan? <laughs> I am very, very excited. Yep. Um, Maybe a year or two away from... I would say yeah. so. Yeah, I'd say so. I, I think they'll run with Caesar and Bud Sullivan as their halves, mm-hmm. uh, but I do think you'll see Latu, you know, Jersey 14 maybe throughout the year and whatnot. Yep. Uh, but I think he has got proper potential. It's just about... Straight and narrow. Mm. And, and that's that's the thing, you know, with Latu Fanu and Sullivan, if it works, it could be a masterstroke. Yeah. 
for the yeah, next 10 at, years. Yeah. You're looking at two young gun superstars coached by Benji Marshall. Yeah, so like I like the recruitment for the Tigers. I think it's a miracle they've managed to do what they've done. Now it is just about sorting out all of the off-field, off-field bullshit. It really is. That's the only question for yeah. them. They got the squad. They got the squad to make the eight. Like we've spoken about it. Michael Maguire is the coach of this squad. They make the eight. I actually think we've built a squad good enough to break into the top 16 this year. So <laughs> bring on 20. I like, I like your optimism. Yep. I do. I do. Um, <laughs> Titans, not much to talk about here with Titans uh, in regards to transfers and recruitment. The only kind of transfer and recruitment chat, though, would be, um, I mean, not much to talk about. Keenan Palacia. He's yeah. a fucking massive get. What a pack. But, like, we've spoken about that so many times on this show, like yeah. Keenan Palacia being there. Great signing for them. I think their pack is sorted, like mm-hmm. genuinely sorted. The big question, though, and because like we know what Palacy is going to offer, high quality front row performance. But the biggest question is, is balancing this um, Campbell Rimo situation. And yeah. it's now a three way problem with Keanu Keeney as well. Yeah. So that's going to be, if they make the wrong call here, it could unbalance their roster for a very long time. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah, it's going to be so interesting to watch how it all plays out because I, I think on paper this is arguably one of the best packs in the competition. Mm. Pino, that. Fafita, Mofoda, Waker. It doesn't get much better than that. I'll pay it. Both for more, you know. Like Palacea, grand final. I was sitting here in the pre going, he might play Origin this year. Yeah. Both for mm. more. So, uh, and, you know, even the, then, then the guys that are just outside of that, like I love Arlek, all these sort of guys. So the pack's all sorted. The pack's there, um, which is not usual for Gold Coast sides yeah. to have that real grit and toughness sorted. Um, it's almost like now you've got all this icing, you've got to work out where's the right yeah, spot. Yeah, balance it. More. Just to circle back on that from earlier, like imagine if you had Ben Hunt in there in that squad as well. Ooh. Yes, you've got to get rid of one of Campbell or Brimson, but imagine him on top of that pack and all those other ingredients you got there. Oh, not mate. Bad. You know, that was looking like it was going to happen yeah. for a while. Um, yeah, look, I, I love their recruitment. I think they've been super smart. Their retention of, of Fafida on a reduced contract compared to what he was before. Um, what what uh, Foran has brought off the field, and I think Keenan Palacia is a really shrewd recruitment, like smart, going into a club on the up, signing him before they went on their good run and, um, you know, obviously made the grand final, you know, because he'd be worth substantially more than what he is now. Yeah. Like When they signed him, he was struggling to even make the bench for the Broncos. Then he locked in a bench spot in a grand final side and he came on and he was fantastic in the grand final, Keenan Palacia. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day who I regard their rugby league opinion very highly and he, he pointed out that, you know, you have a look at the impact that Kieran Foran had this season. He said, you know, a lot of that would have been done in the preseason, you know, the messages that Foz was sending and all that stuff. And then it would have been, okay, we know Foz knows what he's talking about and this all should work. Mm. Now coming into the second year with Foz, it does work. Mm. And there's a whole new level of belief going through that club at the moment. And the biggest signing of the lot, Desi Hasler. Mm. For sure. Desi Hasler with this roster. That's fucking exciting to me. And this is the other thing with Des as well. You know, he's a bit of an unusual cat. He's a little bit different. A lot of these guys would have never experienced someone like Des Hasler before, except Kieran Foran. Yeah. So he'll, he'll know be how the to... perfect messenger between coach and player there. And then you look at the outside backs guy like Tony Francis, killed it in the Q Cup grand final. Yep. Um, it is exciting times with the Titans. I, I think they're Smokies to make the eight. And I'm, I think they're Smokies not to go deep in the finals, but I think that. They may be similarish to the Warriors last year. I really am excited for what they're going to do next year under Desi Hasler. Up the Tars. Mate. <laughs> Up the Tars. <laughs> um, I, I love this roster. I think Desi Hasler, a great coach. I mean, Philip Sammy was outstanding yep. last year. Um, Sam Verrills, if he stays injury free, like there is a lot to like about this roster. A lot to like. The other thing about Desi Hasler as well, like whoever plays fullback, Jaden Campbell, Brimson, like, mate, we have seen some of the greatest individual seasons by fullbacks ever. Barber, Turbo, they've been under Desi yeah, Hasler as well. great point. Great point. Gets his hands on Brimo or, or Campbell. Jeez. Either one, my God. Yeah. And like you look at their backs, like you've got Philip Sammy, then you've got uh, Tony Francis, who I think he just re-signed, Jojo Fafita, then you've got Cam Pereira. Like this is an exciting roster underneath, you know, at one point was considered a super coach. Took, it went to Manly, from, took him from 15th all the way to a prelim. You know, I'd argue, okay, obviously the Tom Trevojevic factor in DC is a big deal, but the the rest of the players in the roster, I think the Titans have a better roster. Yeah. Sam Verrills, 
<laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Like, as I said, you take – I understand DC and Tommy Trevojevic lift that roster up, but when you look at this forward pack of, like, Tino, Fafita, Maui, like, these are all current origin players. Then you bring in Keenan. Yeah, I'm excited. I really am excited for the, the Gold Coast Titans. Uh, anything else? This guy? Nope. No, looks like a good year for the Gold Coast, though. On to the Warriors recruitments. Chanel, Chanel Harris-Tavita signed to 2025, and Roger Shek. I mean – when you talk about big signings, RTS is right up there. Still only, I think, 30 years old or 29. So still got plenty of years left in him, at least three or four, I'd say. Also, the fact that he's going to be playing centre, he really is <clears> – he's <throat> kind of – all the signings have been like culture signings and tough and they're going to do a job. And But when you get a guy like RTS in that current squad, he might be able to win you that game that you – you know, he might be able to go up to Suncorp and let's say that forward pass doesn't happen. He could score two tries in 10 minutes and all of a sudden you've upset the Broncos and you're in a grand final. That's the kind of caliber RTS is. Being the rugby league nerd I am, Kempi, I remember as a kid always loving the preseason. You'd get the first league week magazine mm. and they'd have the new recruits on the front. I'd always be keen to see who was the number one at the front. For me, it's Roger. Oh, this year. Has to be. Um, I'm so excited to see him return. I'm iffy on the centre thing if I'm honest uh, if I had Roger in my side he'd be playing fullback and I wouldn't think about it twice uh, but the Warriors coach has shown that uh, he knows a thing or two yeah I love him at like Joey Manu for example playing for the Kiwis mm. similar similar kind of player I love him at um, centre I think that he's going to build a. I think uh, Andrew Webster is a smart enough coach to build a game plan to give him enough ball so he's involved a lot yeah. but I understand what you're saying when you've got a Dally M winner bloody fullback yeah and let it. me add on top of that, this is word for word what I said about Val Holmes playing centre as well. Now I love him there. Yeah, yeah, so true. it could change very quickly and I'll be happy to swallow my <clears> words <throat> if so. Uh, but geez, I just... What Roger did at fullback a couple of years ago was just off the charts. Craziness. Absolute craziness. What do you reckon, mate? We have a um, couple of big acronym signings there. CHV, RTS, SJ Extends <laughs> as well. Plenty doing. And where are they going to play <laughs> Chanel harris Tavita? Yeah, um, that's, that's a good question. Because um, he's... Probably not going to start, surely. You'd, you'd have to say Tomato Martin and Sean Johnson will be the starting six and seven. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell you what, it's going to be one hell of a reserve grade half sparing. Between Volkman. Um, Metcalf. Metcalf, Shell Harris, Tavita. Yeah, Metcalf probably ends up playing fullback, I guess, in reserve grade. Like. What I can't wait to see, though, is Chanel Harris, Tavita under, and not to say the other coaches weren't good, but they weren't Andrew Webster, yeah. Dally M Coach of the Year. Yeah. This Chanel always had something about him There's where I was gun. like, there's a gun here. Yeah. I just, it's just not coming together. He's a little bit older. He's probably like 25, 26 now. Comes back under Andrew Webster. I pray that we see this guy reach his potential because I think he's a gun. And if we do, I'll tell you where else he's going to be really important. He will be the halves pairing for Jerome Luai for Samoa. Oh, yeah. Uh, fuck, yeah. he will make a splash. Yeah, fuck, that's a great pairing. Great pairing. Um, and, and who knows, like, if he plays really well, Maybe he is the guy to take over from Sean Johnson going forward at, at seven if he can find that form that we know he can play. I genuinely think he could be. Yeah. I rate him so highly. Super exciting. Super exciting. Um, I love the recruits for the Warriors. I think that they wouldn't have broken the bank. They've kept in line with, like, a culture signings. They haven't gone aggressively into the market of, like, you know, oh, we need this specifically. And almost sometimes coaches can get to that top four position not make the finals, grand final, and get quite desperate of like, okay, I don't have that top tier of player I need to go out and recruit. Now, look, they got a bit lucky with the situation RTS was in and probably not enjoying Union as much as it seemed like he probably would. Uh, but outside of that, they haven't been really aggressive in the market at all. To square that up, though, they got unlucky with Reese Walsh. True. In his situation. True. So I guess you sort of break even there. Um, yeah, mate, it's a strong squad this side as well. Oh, obviously up the high of last year oh, – this year, sorry – I think, though, that this year, you know, it was great, it was fantastic, but they need to learn some lessons from that mm. about the next level that they need to get mm. to. And I think that's where the coach is going to be so important. Mm. I think he re-signed today. Yeah, He's extended. Now, so Another, you know, exciting. talk about transfers and retention. Andrew Webster resigns till 26? To 28. 28. Wow. I tell you what, if you always want to look at shows of strength and shows of, like, this is the direction we're heading – I know it's, we've had some false starts at the Warriors. And look, there is a chance that they fall out of the eight next year and we're all sitting here going, whatever. But 
I just have a strong belief that whether it's next year, the year after, or the year after, that Webster is we're about to see the birth of a, a quite a strong warrior side. I think in three or four years, with Webster having his full control, recruitment, and of the players, this is the most excited I've been about the Warriors since forever. Yeah, been a long time. Probably since like Stacey Jones days, I think. When was the last time they had a coach at the club that they could sign on five year deal and be like, he's the fucking guy we're going after? Honestly, like when was the last time they had a coach you were confident was going to be there in two years time? Yeah. Mm. Yep. Like most of the coaches that have been there for the last decade or whatever, it's like they're half a bad season away from getting the sack. Yeah. Whereas with Webster, they go, oh, mate, we're all in. This is this is Andrew Webster's club now, pretty much. Yeah. Which is what sure. you need to do. And I know it's easy to say because he just won the Dallium Coach of the Year. So they've made the right decision. It's the obvious decision. But we talk about players changing clubs and, you know, finding this diamond in the rough. And I understand Webster was at the Panthers, so it's not necessarily a diamond in the rough. But it could be one of the greatest recruitments of all time because they could take a team that should be a powerhouse for the last 20 years into a powerhouse and it could all fall on the shoulders. Obviously, the players do it, but Webster's been the guy that's brought it all together. Yeah. I think just when you have a look through this squad as well, and you know, you got to remember that Webster, this isn't his squad that he's built. He's been given this squad. He's starting to build it out now, but Lee, you can see direction in just about every position where they're going to be in two, three years. Yeah. <clears throat> Even when you look at the lengths of contract, all pretty balanced. You know, you got two of us, check to 26, Nikode to 26. But outside of that, you know, you could make the argument that they're all, a lot of players are coming off at the same time. But I, the, th the, the beauty of the Warriors right now is that they're, they're really good together, but they're not superstars individually. Yeah. So I don't know if you're going to be fighting clubs with these huge, ma like massive offers immediately. So next year, I think you'll probably, Andrew Webster will have a better eye of who he's going to re-sign early and who he's not going to re-sign early. Yeah. I, I just think they're in such a such a good position right now. And, you know, if the rumours are true about, you know, Josh Curran leaving already, that's an ease in your salary cap. And I did, I sort of read into Sean Johnson's Instagram post the other day that 2024 will be his last season. I'd assume so. I'd assume so. Like there's some coin there as yeah. well. So I, I think they'll be able to keep the vast majority of this squad together. And if they can keep on this trajectory... While. Going out and signing someone will be su not super easy, but way easier than what it would be normally because it's an exciting time to be part of the Warriors. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, without knowing him personally, I mean, but I'd say Roger Dulvasa Shek isn't going in there asking for every fucking penny he can get his paws on either. No way, no way. I think he wants to be a part of it, to be yep. honest. so do I. Uh, Hammy, anything on the Warriors, mate? No, good to see him going well, yeah. and I think maybe that's where Chanel harris Tavita will be so important for them if SJ is finishing up next year, if yeah. he can just get back into his work, do a bit of work from 14 or whatever it might be, um, they will set themselves up pretty well because, again, very hard to find good halfbacks. So that's it. That's it. There you've got it from the man himself. <laughs> Mic drop. You'd be pretty happy with that, Warriors fans, getting the <laughs> stamp of approval from me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that is us done and dusted. Uh, as, I, as I said during the show, guys, don't worry. We'll be going over squads again closer to the season, reviewing each position, reviewing strengths, weaknesses, all that kind of stuff. This was just more broad chat about transfers. As usual, we'll go and fuck ourselves. Thank you. Imagine what you could be buying instead. For free and confidential support, call the number on the screen or visit the website.